now here's Act One of The Old Ones Are Hard to Kill. It begins with a stethoscope, a blood pressure reading, an electrocardiogram, and an altogether satisfying report on the health of Mrs. Ada Canby. Hmm. Well, can't see a thing to complain about, Ada. That little congestion you had last time is all cleared up. All in all, I'd say you're doing fine. For a woman my age, you mean. (laughs) (laughs) The older the chicken, the tougher it is to kill. (laughs) That's what my grandmother used to tell me, and she lived to be 98. Mm -hmm. Uh, Speaking of relatives, you uh, see much of Walter. My grandson? Oh, the usual once-a-year visit. And he always comes up with the same complaint. What's that? That I shouldn't be living all alone. Oh, that big house of yours must get pretty lonely sometimes. Well, the truth is, Dr. George, I'm not alone there. Mm-hmm. You're not? I decided to take in the border last month. Really? I haven't written Walter about it. Uh, I'm sure he'd object to my taking in a stranger, but there's really nothing wrong with Mr. Paulson, except his health, maybe. His uh, health? What's wrong with him? Oh, the poor man's had a terrible cold for the past two weeks. Well, let me do a thing for him, though. Well, now, where did you meet this Mr. Paulson? He answered the ad I ran. He's just back from South America. Been living in Brazil for years. He's a very nice gentleman, really. He keeps himself and tends his birds. He has the loveliest blue parakeets. You can hear them chirping all over the house. <laughs> it's the friendliest song. Well, I, uh, I don't see anything wrong with what you're doing, Ada. Just make sure you don't go and catch the man's cold. Well, there's not much chance of that. Poor man hardly ever leaves his room. Well, how much do I owe you? I'll send you the bill. I'm sure you'll forget all about it. <laughs> <laughs> Promise me you'll send it. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Canby. Thanks very much. I'm going to try to get some sleep. Well, all right, if you say so. I guess it's time I was in bed myself. (laughs) Oh, my, listen to that poor man. I wonder if he keeps his birds awake, too. Mrs. Canby, please. Oh, dear God, I, I think he's gone. Listen to those poor little 
Bertie. I suppose they miss poor Mr. Paulson. I'll lay them in his room. Well, let's see about this letter now. Dear Walter, I hope you don't mind my turning to you for advice. But I really don't know what to do. It's been three days since my boarder, Mr. Paulson, passed away, and I still haven't told the police what the man said to me. I just can't bring myself to get mixed up in anything like this. Uh, dear, what's the use of writing, Walter? He'll probably think I've dreamed it all up. No, I'll just forget it. Only how do you forget such a thing? Those names, I keep hearing them. Richardson, Lindell. Lindell is innocent. Oh, dear God, what if it's all true? If Mr. Paulson actually murdered this Richardson and Lindell is innocent, only, well, who are they? I wonder if the telephone book, well, well, why not? Let's see, Richardson, Richard, all right, let's see there, J.R. Yes, yes, here it is. Oh, Lord, this doesn't help them. Well, I'll try Lindell. That wouldn't be as common, I don't suppose. Yes, yes, here it is. There's only about half a dozen. Then D L D. Oh, oh my heavens! Lindell and Richardson, both names together. Lindell and Richardson Investments, Nine Concourse, Four One Five Three One Three Two. I wonder if. Well, maybe, maybe it's the only way to be sure. I did business with him once a, a long time ago. Well, it's ten years, madam, just about. But uh, if you're interested in investment advice... Well, I'll think about it. Thank you very much. Ten years. Well, it could be a coincidence. I guess it all depends on how he died. <laughs> Thank you. Well, now, how can we be of help to you? Well, I didn't come here to get help, Mr. Shelton. I came to help you, as a matter of fact. Or rather, somebody you know. Who would that be? Uh, Mr. John Lindell, the man who was supposed to have murdered Mr. Richardson. I'm afraid I'm not following you. Well, it took me all week to find out what happened to those two men. And finally, I found the story in the old newspaper room down at the library. About Mr. Lindell being indicted for killing his partner. But I'm, I'm sure you know the whole story a lot better than I do. Well, of course I know the story, but <laughs> that was quite a long time ago, Mrs. Canby. Ten years doesn't seem so long when you're my age. Anyway, the point is that I can help your Mr. Lindell, only I can't do it alone. Did you know John Lindell? No, no, I didn't. No, Mr. Richardson, for that matter. The man I knew was named Paulson. Who? I rented a room to Mr. Paulson, and he died about eight days ago of pneumonia. I was there when it happened. Well, that's unfortunate, but... Uh... Before he died, Mr. Paulson told me something about Mr. Richardson's murder. He said Mr. Lindell hadn't been responsible. That he, Mr. Paulson, had committed it. For money. Oh, Mrs. Canby, listen to me. It was this man, Lindell, that bothered him. The fact that he was in prison for something he didn't do. I thought I should tell you this, Mr. Shelton, because you knew both of these gentlemen. It said so in the newspaper. Mrs. Canby, my, my dear woman. What? 
I don't know what silly story you heard, but it's completely wrong. There wasn't any question about what happened. This boarder of yours, whatever his name is, merely had an obsession. Well, just the same, I thought you could follow through on this business. Yeah. Tell the police. Because if it is true, Mr. Lindell should be freed. On evidence like that? But I don't know anything about evidence. I'm just telling you what I heard. <sighs> well, never mind. I suppose I should have told the police myself. Wait, wait, Mrs. Candy. Uh, let me put your mind at rest. John Lindell is no longer in prison. He isn't? He's dead, Mrs. Canby. He's been dead for the last three years. Oh. He wasn't a young man when all this happened, when he accused his partner, Fred Richardson, of defrauding him and shot him dead. He died? In prison? Even if all you say is true, that this man was Richardson's murderer, you can't help John Lindell any longer. He's beyond that. But his name, don't you want to clear his name? Have you any proof? Any living witness? They're just myself. Forget it, Mrs. Canby. That's my advice to you. The old wound is healed. Don't reopen it. Oh, well, it troubles me so. I haven't thought of anything else since it happened. Perhaps if I saw a minister, if I had some advice from a man of God... I mean... Mrs. Canby, now you've said something. Now you've shown me the way... That's where our answer lies, dear woman, in prayer. Mm -hmm. In the forgiveness of our dear Lord. Will you pray with me, Mrs. Canby? Pray? Here? Why not? God is everywhere. Please, join me. <sighs> dear Lord, tell us what to do. Give us your divine guidance. Show us the path to righteousness. Mr. Stelton, I... Help us, O oh Lord. Help us to understand... Teach us to forgive the sins of others and to forget them. To forget. <sighs> I feel much better now, Mrs. Canby. Do you? No, I'm not sure. Let us turn this matter over to God, Mrs. Canby. Not to the police, but to the Lord. It's in his hands now. Don't you agree? Well, in a way, that's true. Since they're dead now... All of them. Yes? Uh, Mrs. Candy? Yes? My name's Stuart Winfield, Mrs. Candy. I understand you have a room for rent? Yes, 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 I do. Well, I'm new in town. I just arrived from Philadelphia. I've been staying at a hotel, but I'd like something homier. Well, the room I have is $35 a week. I can't offer you any meals, but you can use the kitchen all you want. Well, that sounds good to me. Would uh, Would you like to see the room? Yes, ma'am, I sure would. Well, uh, come on in, then. Thank you. By the way, how did you know I had a room for rent? Hmm? I was going to place an ad this weekend. Oh, I, uh, I, I guess someone at the hotel mentioned it. Uh, I forget just who... Say, this is a real fine old house, Mrs. Candy. Mm -hmm. I can see that I'm going to like this place. Just fine. And so Mrs. Candy has a new boarder. He's a very personable young man. With a great deal more charm than old Mr. Paulson had. Perhaps in a little while, Mrs. Canby will be able to forget her former boarder and the shocking confession he made on his deathbed. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Stu Winfield took no time at all to make himself at home in Ada Canby's big old house. He loved everything about his room. The fine old four-poster bed. The crazy quilt that Ada herself had sewn up 40 years ago. The lace curtains on the window. He even loved Mr. Paulson's blue parakeets. But what he really seemed to like best was Mrs. Canby herself. Just take me two minutes to get these 
clean sheets on the bed. Mr. Here, Mr. let me give you a hand. No, 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 I can manage. I've been making this bed for almost 50 years. 50? You've lived in this house that long? Moved in here when I got married back in 1919. My husband David bought it for us. Our only son, Ralph, was born in it. And you've lost them both? Yes, they're both dead, but I haven't lost them. Oh, yes, yes, I understand, Mrs. Canby. I guess I feel that way about my mom. Your mother's dead? Yes, she died when I was two. Oh. Listen, Mr. Winfield, are you sure you want these birds in your room? Hmm? I could take them to the parlor if you want. No, no, I think they're great. I, I think everything's great about this house. Uh, but there is something you can do for me. What's that? Would you mind not calling me Mr. Winfield? Oh? Uh, that's what they call my father. My name's Stuart. Well, well, all right. Stuart? Dear Walter, I think it's about time I told you that I have a boarder in the house. Mr. Winfield is the nicest young man you could want to meet. He's a great deal friendlier than my first gentleman, Mr. Paulson, and he seems to like nothing better than to sit around evenings and talk. We talk about his home and his parents and his plans for the future. I think the poor boy misses his home and family, and I'm sort of a substitute for all that. Mm. You know, it isn't really fair, Mrs. Candy. You said I had kitchen privileges, but that doesn't mean you have to cook for me. Well, it's a pleasure, Stuart. I haven't had anyone to cook for in years. You're kidding. You mean to say you cook this good without practice? Oh, you're just being nice. I'm sure that stew is just plain ordinary. It's terrific, no kidding. It, it tastes like, well, it it tastes like home, if you know what I mean. But it depends on whose home you mean. <laughs> well, my mom cooks stews like this. That's what I meant. Your mom? Mm. Well, but she died when you were only two. Oh, well, I, I guess I, I didn't mean my mom exactly. I, I was thinking of my Aunt Martha. Uh, I mean, she's the one who sort of took over the cooking and stuff after my mother died. And my father's sister, you know? I see. Well, that was lucky that you had someone to take her place. Yeah, that's right. It's... Oh, Excuse me. My, Stuart, yeah. you're not coming down with anything, are you? <laughs> no, no, I'm fine. Just a little case of the sniffles. Listen, if your room isn't warm enough, I have an extra book. No, yet. no, the room's just fine. Don't worry about it. Oh, you be sure now. I know I felt a little guilty about poor Mr. Paulson when he got sick. Uh, maybe I didn't take good enough care of him. Uh, Paulson? Mm -hmm. Was that your former boarder, the uh, the bird lover? Yes, yes, that was his name, the poor man. Well, tell me about him. Well, I don't really know that much about him. He lived here less than two months. Well, what sort of a guy was he? Well, very quiet. He kept to himself. Did you say he was from South America? I don't remember if I did or not. Well, you must have said it. Yeah, yes, of course. He was American, but he'd been living in Brazil. I don't know why exactly. Although, come to think of it, maybe I do. What do you mean? Well, it, it just occurred to me that Brazil might be just the place for someone who came into a lot of money and, and wanted to leave the country. I don't understand. Is that a... Oh, my. Uh, I really think you I... are getting a cold, Stuart. I'm getting that blanket out this minute. Now, wait, Mrs. Candy. I'd rather hear well, about... Never mind. I don't want to take any chances. I'll be right back. Yes, Mrs. Candy... Don't take any chance. Stuart? Yes? Come in. I brought your tray, Stuart. Oh. No, you shouldn't have. <laughs> you shouldn't have gone to all that trouble, Mrs. Candy. Wasn't the least bit of trouble. Besides, you've got to have some supper. Feed a cold and starve a fever. That's what I mean, I, I was going to come out to the kitchen and, and get myself a sandwich or something. You didn't have to bring it to me. Oh, look at that. Is that roast chicken? Well, that's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> uh, I hope it tastes all right. Noodle soup with dumplings. Mrs. Candy, you're spoiling me rotten. Do you know that? <laughs> well, I just thought it would be a good idea if you stayed in bed and took it easy. You weren't planning to go out tonight, were you? No, no, I was just going to stay in and read for a while. <coughs> Maybe watch television. Oh, that's good. 
Just here, I'll just set this tray down. <laughs> oh, the service here is just too good. Oh, we <laughs> we never uh, never finished our talk the other day about that border of yours, uh, Mr. Paulson. Well, there's not much to say about him, really. Well, you said something about his living in South America. <laughs> you said you thought you understood why he was living there. Sounded real interesting. Well, the truth is, Stuart, there is something to tell about Mr. Paulson. <laughs> maybe, maybe you can help me feel better about it all. About what? Now, I'm not going to tell you if you don't eat. <laughs> all right, Mrs. Canby, I'll, I'll eat. Well, it happened just about three weeks ago. I'm something, Mrs. Candy. That's about the best roast chicken I've had in years. I'm sure I spoiled your appetite with all my chatter. <laughs> no, no. That was a really interesting story. But what do you think of it all, Stuart? Mm -hmm. No, the killer is the man who hired Mr. Paulson. Don't you see? Is it right that he should get away with it? Now, wait a minute. <laughs> You're jumping to conclusions. No, I'm not. Mr. Paulson told me that he was hired to do this thing. Well, maybe he was hired by Lindell. Maybe Lindell hired him, and then Paulson got cold feet, and Lindell did the shooting himself. No, I'm sure that isn't true. You see, I read the newspaper article all about it. Well, you, you really were thorough about this, weren't you, Mrs. Candy? <laughs> you poor man. That cold's gone to your chest now, hasn't it? No, I'm all, I'm all right. Stop, stop worrying about me. Let's talk about this, this other problem of yours. Well, maybe I'm making it more of a problem than it should be. Maybe if I just told the police everything, I could forget it once and for all. No, I... Uh... I, I really couldn't advise that, Mrs. Candy. Well, it said in the newspaper story that the two men were partners in that investment firm. Uh, Mr. Lindell thought that his partner, Richardson, was cheating, taking money out of the firm, and that's why he's supposed to have shot him. Wasn't there a witness to the shooting? Why, yes, I think there was. Come to think of it, it was Mr. Shelton. That's right, that's right. Well, doesn't that, doesn't that wrap it up for you? Well, it would if it wasn't for Mr. Paulson. Listen, Mrs. Candy, you know how much I like you. Well, in just a few days, you're more like family to me than my Aunt Martha ever was. Well, it's nice of you to say, Stuart. And that's why I want you to listen to me about this. That's why I want you to forget about this whole foolish thing. And <laughs> Listen to you. You sound awful, Stuart. Just tell me. No, man, I'm all right. No, you're not all right. I'm going to get you some cough medicine right this minute. Stick around for a few more days, Mr. Chelton. The old lady's beginning to get fidgety, if, if you know what I mean. <laughs> well, something tells me that Stuart Winfield isn't such a nice young man after all. Could it be that he wasn't telling Mrs. Canby the truth about his dear mother and his Aunt Martha? Could he have not told her the truth about his plans for the future? Of course, the real issue is, what sort of plan does he have for Ada Canby's future? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Poor Mrs. Canby. She isn't sleeping well tonight. But of course, Mrs. Canby has good reasons for insomnia. Her thoughts are whirling. Her boarder Stewart was right. 
she doesn't want the bother of going to the police. And she firmly believes in the old adage, if you don't trouble trouble, trouble won't trouble you. But still... Oh, my. I'm just never going to get to sleep tonight. Poor Stuart. He's still coughing. I'm sure that room is just too drafty. I never should have let any boarders in until I got the windows fixed. Oh, dear. That poor boy. I'll never forget the terrible night Mr. Paulson was coughing so badly. Huh? And the way he looked, all gray and shrunken. If only I knew he was so sick. No. If only he'd never even come to this house. Mrs. Canby, I killed Richardson. I did it. Do I ever forget the sound of that man's voice? Lindell is innocent. Lindell is innocent. That poor man. All the years he spent in jail for something he didn't do. Let sleeping dogs lie, Mrs. Canby. talking about Paulson again. <laughs> no, I'm talking about the man who hired Mr. Paulson. He didn't just have that man Richardson shot. He let an innocent person go to jail and die there. Now, that's like committing two murders, if you ask me. I have to tell you something that occurred to me last night. Sure, go ahead. Well, it's about Mr. Chelton. Mr. Arnold Chelton. Yeah? Go on. I, I'm listening. Stuart, I wonder if maybe the reason Mr. Chelton was so upset with me, the reason he didn't want me to go to the police, was because he was afraid. Explain what you mean. Well, what I mean is maybe Mr. Chelton had good reason besides the one he told me. He was working for both Mr. Richardson and Mr. Lundell at the time of the murder. Well, so what? Well, he was also the chief witness at the trial. A witness for the prosecution. But he saw the shooting, didn't he? But that's just the point. He saw 
saw Mr. Lindell shoot Mr. Richardson. Well, that's not what you told me last time. I mean, that he was an eyewitness. No, that's right. He didn't actually see the shooting. He was miles away when it happened. I don't quite remember the details. Is there was something about a phone call, maybe? Yes, yes, that's what it was. He claimed that Mr. Richardson was talking to him on the phone when Mr. Lindell showed up at his apartment. He said that Richardson cried out something about Lindell having a gun. And then he heard the shot. But how could that have happened if the gun was fired by Mr. Paulson? If, Mrs. Canby... That's the big little word, isn't it? If. <laughs> but don't you see what I'm saying, Stuart? Arnold Shelton had the most to gain. Gain? From what? From both these men leaving the firm. That'll leave the whole thing to him. All those customers, all the investments he handled, all the commissions, or whatever they call it. Are you accusing this guy Shelton of being the killer? Yes. It's it's the only answer, Stuart. Well, look, if that was the case, the, <gasps> the police would have figured it out. But they didn't. There was nothing in the stories I read that pointed any suspicion at Mr. Chelton. I don't suppose it's even occurred to them. And now the company is all his. You don't you don't call that evidence, do you? <laughs> well, then why didn't he let me go to the police? Why did he try so hard to talk me out of it? That man was praying to it. He was taking the name of the Lord. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Stuart. I'm so sorry. I won't bother you anymore. I know what I have to do anyway. <laughs> Candy. I won't wait. be gone long, Stuart. No, no, wait. But the minute I get back, I'm going to call Dr. George and ask him to come over. You're sick. Never mind You're... the doctor. Are you calling the police? No, no, I won't call them. You're right. I don't want them tracking my in my parlor. I'm going down to the station house and talk to them. I'll get dressed now and go straight there. Please, please think about what you're doing. I'll tell them what I know and they can do the rest. Now, you try to eat something, Stuart. Please. Mrs. Candy. Sheldon. What is this, Winfield? I told you not to call me in the office. It's an emergency. <laughs> you sound terrible. What's the matter with you? I'm sick. Only you're going to be a lot sicker. What are you talking about? The old lady. I can't stop her. She's decided to talk. What? She figured it out. Figured out exactly what you did, Sheldon, and how you did it. You fool. <laughs> You've got to stop her. Do you hear me? That wasn't part of the deal, Sheldon. It's all of the deal now. The price didn't include anything like that. The price just yeah. doubled. Yeah. Old ladies yeah. are always having accidents. Yeah. Make her have one. Make her have one now, Winfield. Oh, yeah. All right. All right. She's going to... She's going to have a fall down the cellar steps. Right now. i got to get my robe on and my slippers. I've got to hurry. <laughs> Is that you? Open up, Mrs. Candy. Do it, Wednesday. What are you doing out of bed? Now, you go right back there this second. I got, I got to talk to you, Mrs. Candy, before you go to the police. Just listen to you. You're all winded. You can hardly talk, Stuart. Now, go back to bed before you catch pneumonia, too. Now, don't go, Mrs. Candy. It would be better if you never went to the police. Better for you. Better for me. For you? I don't understand. Well, then I... I wouldn't have to hurt you, Mrs. Candy. <laughs> That's what I mean. I wouldn't have to do anything bad to you. Stuart, what in the world are you talking about? Come on, old lady. You're, not... You're smart, all right. You really think things through. So now, think a little harder. You knew? 
sure you know about Mr. Paul. That's right. That's how you knew my room was so red, because uh, Mr. Shelton told you. Now you're getting there, Mrs. Candy. And that's why you rented it. That's uh, why you were sent here. Just to watch you, Mrs. Candy. Just to see oh, that you yes. stayed sensible. <laughs> Mr. Shelton did. I was hoping you'd never change your mind about calling the police. No, the I didn't want this part of it. This isn't the part I like. Oh, let me go. Please. Just relax, oh, Mrs. Candy. Just take it easy. Oh, you let me. Please, please, don't. Oh, you're as light as a feather, Mrs. Candy. Just like my Aunt Martha would have been if I, if I had an Aunt Martha. Please, don't. Please, let me go. Please. We've got a date now, Mrs. Oh, Candy. Let me go. Don't let me go. Don't put up such a fight, Mrs. I'm sick, remember? Shut, shut your eyes. Please, shut your eyes and don't look down. Shut your eyes, old lady. Shut the old lady. That you at the bottom of those stairs. Well, will he be all right, Dr. George? Now, what do you want to worry about that man for? Uh, Truth is, his uh, injuries don't amount to very much. A couple of broken ribs seem to be the worst of it. But he'll be a patient for some time before they can put him in prison where he belongs. Him and his uh, friend. What was that man's name again? You mean Mr. Chatham? Have they arrested him? Yeah, yeah. That's what the police detective said. I understand. Stuart's injuries aren't safe. It's not the fall and Nate Winfield's are sick. His case was diagnosed as simple pneumonia at first. And then I remembered about your first border. Nelson, was it? Nelson. Yes, Nelson. But he had pneumonia, too. He died of it. Oh, is, is pneumonia contagious? Yes, yes, it is, but this disease was even more contagious. It's a pneumonia caused by a disease called psittacosis, better known as parrot fever. Uh-huh. You get it from sick birds, like the parakeets in your spare room. Oh, no. Mr. Pulses, bird. Sorry, Ada, but... They had to be taken out and destroyed. Oh, what a shame. Yeah, there's one reason I, I feel sorry for them. They saved your life. Made Mr. Winfield too weak even to throw a little old lady down a flight of steps. Uh, those poor little creatures. Yeah, but you can be grateful they didn't make you sick, too. Mm. Parrot fever is so contagious that... No more than one person in a thousand could be exposed to it and escape infection. It was pretty darn close to a miracle, Ada. They're hard to kill, Doctor. Remember? The old ones are hard to kill. They say that people are living longer than ever before. And when we look at Ada Canby... We can understand why. She's a tough old lady. So tough she could withstand the threats of man, beasts, and birds. So let that be a warning to all those who think that our senior citizens are easy prey for crime. Watch out. They may turn the tables on you. Or the stairs. I'll be back shortly. have one final comment for you on behalf of Ada Canby and old people everywhere. There's a saying, there's no fool like an old fool, but it's also true that there's no wisdom and strength like old wisdom and strength. There. Does that make you feel better about your next birthday? Our cast included Agnes Moorhead, Leon Janney, and Roger DeCoven. 
The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Welcome to the sound of suspense, the fear you can hear. For the next 52 minutes, we're going to take you into the world of mystery, into the world of terrifying imagination. The story you are going to hear concerns a question which has been asked since the first men on earth were born and died. Is there a life after death? Is there a way to return from the grave? And if there is, can we come back in the body of a living creature? Even one that has claws instead of fingernails? Here is one chilling answer. Dr. Singh, you have to tell me. Could my wife have come back as a bird, a sparrow, something like that? Well, your wife was a rather big woman, Mr. Morrisby, in a physical sense. How about a snake? A seagull? How about a cat? A great, big, fat cat? A cat. Our mystery drama, The Return of the Moresby's, was written especially for the Radio Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Patrick O'Neill. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Now here is Act One. Like all murder stories, sooner or later, it reaches the office of a daily newspaper. You wanted to see me, Chief? You bet I want to see you, Prouty. Come in and shut that door. I bet I know what it's about. That story I filed on Richard Morsby, right? I got a flash for you, Prouty. This is a newspaper office, not a fiction magazine. You take this story of yours and see if you can sell it to a weirdo digest or something. But get it off my desk. Now, wait a while, Max. I know it's offbeat, but I thought I handled it with a with a kind of a light touch. Stories about murder can't be handled with a light touch. Not on this paper. But it's accurate. I mean, this is exactly what the guy Moresby told me just before he died. Well, he must have been out of his head. He asked for somebody to hear his story. That's how I got to meet him. I was at the hospital covering that subway accident. Now, that story made sense to me. Nothing but nice, clear facts. But this nonsense... Please, let me tell you about this guy. Maybe you'll change your mind. All right, what about him? Well, for one thing, he was a real distinguished-looking guy. The only thing peculiar about him was his eyes. His eyes? Yeah. They were the palest blue eyes I ever saw on a man. They weren't really blue at all. They, they were... They're like silver. Big deal. So he had silver eyes. And when he started to tell me about himself... Well, I just had to hear the whole story, Chief. Yes, I was born in London, but my family moved to the States when I was young. They didn't improve much on the climate when they did. We lived in Vermont. I don't think I was ever warm enough until the age of 24 when I moved to Southern California. I lived on beaches. A superb swimmer, a superior surfboarder, and a terrible bum. It was on the beach at Malibu that I met the woman who was to become my wife. Her name was Una. She was as pale as a gardenia. Gardenia with bones. Una had more bones than any other woman I've ever met. Lovely day, isn't it? I beg your pardon? 
I said it's a beautiful day. I don't think I've ever seen the ocean look prettier. Frankly, the Pacific always looked a little muddy to me. <laughs> I wonder if that's what Balboa said when he first saw it. Well, he probably said, what a great place for surfing. Ah, I see you have a surfboard. Yes, uh, as a matter of fact, I think I see a wave that I like. Uh, will you excuse me? Well, I wish I had the nerve to try it. Yeah, you really should. Well, bye now. Maybe I'll ask my chauffeur to teach me. I'm sorry. What did you say? Charles, my chauffeur. He's very good at sports. Show. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, come to think of it, that wave doesn't look so good after all. Uh, uh, by the way, my name is Richard. Richard Morrison. How do you do? My name is Una. Una Vandermeyer. That was her name. As soon as I realized that she was from the Vandermeyer family, she didn't seem half as bony as she did before. In fact, not only did I become accustomed to Una's appearance, I was even able to tolerate her inane conversation. Can't you just feel the mystery of the stars, Richard? Sometimes I feel their vibrations as if they're trying to communicate with me. Do you ever feel that? Well, sometimes, I suppose. I really think we must be one with the universe, don't you? I really believe there's just one great universal soul, and we're all part of it. Don't you think so, too? Yes, of course. <laughs> right on, as they say. You see what I mean? She talked that way all the time, from the first day of our honeymoon. Well, it was a, a fine honeymoon just the same. It lasted a whole year on the beaches of the Caribbean... The French Riviera, I got browner and browner. Una got freckles. Finally, we returned to our home in Los Angeles and settled down to a quiet, comfortable marriage. What on earth is that you're playing? It's sitar music, darling. Oh, it's just so spiritual. What? What made you buy the record? Hmm? Oh, Dr. Singh recommended it. Who? Dr. Singh. At the Temple of Metapsychosis, you know. The Temple of what? Metapsychosis. I told you about joining the temple last week. Oh, Richard, sometimes I think you don't listen to me. Now, as you may know, Southern California abounds in quasi-religious organizations. And she'd gone through a number of them without discovering the universal soul at any of their altars. Darling, please come to one of Dr. Singh's lectures. He's such a magnificent speaker. He emits such vibrations. And I went. You see what an obliging husband I was? And actually, it turned out to be more interesting than I thought. The temple itself was unpretentious. And Dr. Singh was an impressive man. And when he spoke, I realized why his message had such appeal for Una. Because he preached a doctrine that combined eternal life with the love of small animals. The soul is immortal. The soul cannot die. The soul, upon leaving the body, must make its passage elsewhere. There is a science called eschatology which deals with the last four things. Death, judgment, heaven, and hell. It is the most ancient of all sciences. And from its wisdom has come the inescapable certainty of the transmigration of souls. Yeah, yeah, I know it's a bit weird, but stay with it. And where does the soul go? According to the wise men of all generations past, the soul departs from the mouth of the dying. It is, consequently, a small thing. A bird, a snake... A mouse, a dove, or a hawk, a dog, a cat, an insect. For these small creations of God are empty vessels placed upon earth for only one purpose. To house the departing souls of humanity so that they need not wander forever in a trackless eternity. Yeah, yeah, it's pure rot, of course. But that's what the man said. And Una sat there and believed every single word. Oh, wasn't he marvelous, Richard? 
Isn't it wonderful that the soul never dies? That we can all come back as little animals? I'm not sure I want to come back as an animal. But you'd still be you, Richard. Oh, don't you see? Mm -hmm. Well, by the way, what, uh, what was that envelope you handed Dr. Singh after the meeting? The envelope? Oh, that was my donation, of course. Your donation to the temple? Yes, to support the work of Dr. Singh, to open other temples around the world. Uh -huh. Well, um, how, how, how much money was in the envelope? Now, what does it matter, Richard? I'm just curious. Two thousand dollars. Two thousand dollars. Una, Una, you go to that temple once a week. Do you always give that kind of donation? Oh, it's all in a very good cause, Richard. <laughs> Well, in an equally good cause, that of finding out exactly how much of my wife's money was supporting this nonsense, I sneaked a look at Una's checkbook. The answer astonished me. Not only had my wife put more than $30,000 into Dr. Singh's collection plate, she had also donated some 20000 more to various institutions for the care and feeding of cats, dogs, and birds. It was so kind of you to honor us with a visit, Dr. Singh. I know how terribly busy you are. On the contrary. You were kind to invite me to your lovely home. Oh. Now tell me, Dr. Singh, what determines the kind of animal one becomes when the soul escapes after death? Ah, uh, Mrs. Morsby, that is a question which has baffled wise men for countless generations. But isn't it possible to do, well, research? Yes, Mrs. Morrisby. I don't doubt that we could find the answer to such great questions if only we had the proper resources. But, unfortunately, that would require money. A great deal more money than the movement has at present. Well, it seems to me you don't do badly. <laughs> There you are. Hello, Richard. Where have you been all morning? Right here, in my little sewing room. <laughs> don't tell me you were sewing. Oh, don't be silly. Actually, I've been composing something. A letter? Oh, something more important than that. Richard, do you realize that I have no last will and testament? <laughs> well, why should you? Healthy young chicken like you. I can't call myself young anymore, Richard. You'll always be young to me, darling. Oh, that's very sweet. But just the same, it's only practical to have a will. Would you read it over, Richard, and see if it... Well, if it sounds legal enough? Certainly. Well, let's see now. I, Una Vandermeyer Morsby, a resident of the city of Los Angeles, state of California, residing at 8 Sheridan Drive, being over the age of 21 and of sound and disposing mind and memory. Darling, this is superb. Where on earth did you get the language? Well, to tell you the truth, I copied it out of Daddy's will. <laughs> the one that left you ten million? Yes. Yeah. Well, I don't see how you could go wrong. Let's see now. Not acting under duress, menace, fraud, or undue influence of any person whomsoever. And... Uh, uh, Good Lord. Una. What's it? What is it? What? You're, you're not serious about this. Oh, about making a will? Well, of course I, I am. I, I mean, I... this this bequest to the temple of uh, 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 mumbo-jumbo. What's wrong with it? Now, listen, darling. I told you how important Dr. Singh's work is, but it requires money to carry it on. Tons of money. So the least I can do is to help the poor man as much as I can. But you're giving him 90% of your entire fortune. Ah, you'll still have a million dollars if I go first, Richard. Isn't that enough? No, it isn't. I, I, no, I mean, the whole thing is ridiculous. Don't you realize that man is a fraud? A charlatan? What? Oh, for heaven's what? sake, open your eyes. Don't you realize the simple truth? Your money won't build any temples. It's just going to line the pockets of that turban phony. Richard, what a terrible thing to say. Well, you told me you liked Dr. Singh, that you were very impressed by his theory of transmigration. Darling, I was only saying all that to please you. But now I'm telling you that the only thing Dr. Singh is planning to transmigrate is your money into his savings account. <gasps> and frankly, I'm not going to let him do it. Richard! What are you doing? You're tearing up my will. That's right. How dare you do such a thing? It's my money, and I'll do whatever I please with it. Oh, no. Uh, Darling, I just want you to have a chance to come to your senses. Oh, there's nothing wrong with my senses. 
I can see very clearly what the real trouble is. If I didn't leave a will, all my money would go to you, wouldn't it? Well, naturally, I'm your husband. You don't have any other elements. That's why you're acting this way. It's just plain and simple greed. Una, listen to me. No, it's all right. It's all right. I'm glad you tore up that will, Richard, because I realize now that I was quite wrong. Do you? Yes. It's a mistake to leave only nine million of my money to the temple. I'm going to leave all of it to Dr. Singh. When Una actually drafted that incredible document and called our attorney for a Monday morning appointment, I realized that I had to do something very drastic before the weekend was over. I had to kill my poor misguided wife. I had to make her one with the universe. It's obvious that Mr. Moresby is going to be a very reluctant murderer. The question is, will his reluctance get in the way of his efficiency? We'll get the details when we return shortly with Act Two. Now let's return to Richard Moresby. In order to find him... We'll have to search the highway, for Richard has taken his white jaguar out for a spin. But there he is now. On Saturday morning, I took a little spin in my XKL and did some thinking on the open road. I didn't want to kill poor Una, of course. The whole idea was repellent. But on the other hand, the thought of Dr. Singh spending the fortune that was rightfully mine was even more abhorrent. However... I decided I would make one more stab at a reconciliation. Darling, may I come in? It's your living room, too. <laughs> it doesn't feel like it. Matter of fact, I've felt like a stranger in this house for the past two days. I suppose that's my fault. Well, you haven't been exactly cordial, have you? I've hardly been home, Richard. I spent all day yesterday at the temple and... All morning at the Pet Breast Kennels. And how are all the little souls doing? (laughs) You just won't stop being irreverent, will you? It's been my money all along, hasn't it, Richard? From the very beginning, you were attracted to my money. Now, darling, if you thought that, you would never have married me. I didn't want to believe it. I don't want to believe it now. Well, now, how, how can I prove to you that you're mistaken? Richard, do you really want to prove it? Of course, I'll do anything you say. All right. Now, I know exactly what you can do. (laughs) You can let me leave my money to Dr. Singh and the temple. The whole ten million? Yes, because that's the only way I'll know that it's me you love. Well, you can't say I didn't try. But Una's decision now left me with absolutely no alternative. I was still deeply unhappy about the necessity of taking her life. However, fate was was kind to me that very afternoon. Now you're sure that you want me to continue reading, Richard? Of course, darling. Well, I'm sort of embarrassed about this part. It's 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 a paper that I wrote myself. Uh, oh, something you wrote? Yeah, I wrote it this morning. I was going to show it to Doctor Singh. It's a um, well, it's a sort of a poem. It's called Yes. Snappy title. Hope I can read my own handwriting. <clears throat> Death has become nothing to me. Death holds no fear for me. Come, death, I welcome you. Lead me to the woods, the waters, the air above the earth. Come, take me, death. Your touch is kind. Oh, Richard. Oh, Richard, why do you look like that? Is it really that terrible? Oh, terrible. Oh, no, 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 my darling, it's it's beautiful. You mean it? You must give it to me, Una. I I must have it. You like it that much? Yes, I certainly do. Well, 
I'll type it up for you, Richard. No, no, no. I, 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 I must have the original. No, just, just the way you wrote it. Oh, darling, I'm so flattered. What will you do with it? Oh, I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to put it in a frame, of course. And I know just where I'm going to hang it. Yes, I could hardly believe my ears. Una had written her own suicide note and her own handwriting. It was truly karma at work. Now there was no question of failure and no longer any need for delay. Oh, what a lovely idea it was, Richard. Candlelight dinner for two. Yes, yes, I, I, I thought you'd enjoy it. It's so sweet of you to handle the whole menu with Cook. You spoil me shamefully. <laughs> night, I spoiled her just a bit more by bringing hot cocoa to her in bed. Oh, oh Richard, you shouldn't have bothered. Well, I know how you you like your hot cocoa before retiring. Well, you can't get to sleep without it. No, but Parker could have brought it to me. Oh, no, this is something I had to do myself. Oh. Oh. Well, yeah, drink it down now. Yes. I'm drinking it. Does it taste all right? Oh, it tastes just fine. Now that was very good news Because I'd prepared the hot cocoa myself And I had no idea whether 25 melted sleeping pills Would seriously affect the flavor Finally, Una was all tucked in for the night I went into my study Picked up the poem she had written for Dr. Singh And brought it to the bedroom I placed it carefully on the night table beside it then I bent over my sleeping darling to see if she was getting along all right. She was very, very quiet. And then a dreadful thing happened. Una opened her eyes. Oh, Red, Red, Richard. Oh, Richard. Hush, hush, darling. Now go, go back to sleep. Richard, I'm, I'm sick. No, 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 I'm my love. No, 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 you're only sleepy. Coco tasted so... Strange. I didn't want to upset you, Richard, but oh, I'm sick. No, you, you'll feel much better in the morning, Ona. I, I promise you, tomorrow morning you'll, you'll be oh. one with the universe. Richard, that paper. What paper, darling? My, it's my poem. My, my poem. Dr. Singh, what's it doing? I, 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 well, I was just, just reading it over, darling, that's all. And I... Um, uh, bottle my... Sleeping pills. Oh, it's, it's empty. The bottle is empty. Oh, Richard. Oh, Richard. What have you done? Nothing, darling. Nothing. Now, go, just go to no. sleep. Coco, you put sleeping pills in it. All of them. Uh, don't try to get up. Oh, no, please. You're, now, don't. Don't. You're don't. Trying to kill me. Trying to do no. murder. No, for heaven, heaven's oh. sake, Una, now stop saying things like that. Do you oh. want the servants to hear? Help somebody. Help. Now, come on, lie down. Lie down, Una, for heaven's sake. Come on, now, lie, lie down. Lie down. Oh. There, now. That's, that's better. You won't get away with it. You won't get away with it. Richard, I promise you. Anything you say, darling. I'll come back. Richard, you know I'll be back. Yes. Yes, of course. Just, just welcome death, Una. The way you wrote in your little poem. I'll be back. I swear it. Oh, oh, oh. The funeral was held two days later. It was a magnificent occasion, of course. I gave Ona a farewell that was consistent with her vast fortune. Everything was the best. Coffin, flowers, painter, everything. Her burial place was one of the choicest bits of real estate at Forest Lawn. The only discordant note was the fact that Dr. Singh insisted on saying a few words at the service. They were familiar words, but... Frankly, they gave me a 
slight bit of a chill. The body of Una Morsby is dead, but her soul lives on. The soul cannot die. The soul is immortal. It has left the earthly remains of this woman and has sought the body of a small living thing. There it will abide until the Almighty is ready to choose its next home. Mourn not the end of Una Morsby, for there is no end. I couldn't help congratulating myself on how well everything had gone. When I called for medical attention the night of Una's death, the physician was only too ready to declare her a suicide. The police had to be informed, naturally, and they too agreed with the doctor's verdict. Una had died by her own hand, and she had died without a will. There was simply no question that the matter would be probated in my favor. Suddenly I realized I was not only rich, but a rich widower. What vistas open for me? The devil, look out, you stupid mongrel! Oh, I'm trying to get run over. I admit I was shaken up by it. Uh, I mean, it was sort of a coincidence, you know? Right after the funeral and, and all that. I was very glad to be home again. You can be sure. Excuse me, Mr. Morsby. Yes, Parker. Cook is worried about the raccoon, sir. The what? There's been a raccoon at the kitchen door all morning, and Cook is badly alarmed, I'm afraid. I've tried to scare it away, but it keeps returning. A raccoon, for heaven's sake? Why don't you just shoot it and make a coat out of it? I was wondering if you wished me to call the game warden, sir. Uh, please, Parker, do whatever you please about it. I'm going to take a nap. Yes, sir. Very good, sir. upstairs at once, undressed, and got into bed. It was a warm day, and yet, yet I found myself cold. I got out the electric blanket and soon felt very cozy indeed. In fact, I felt so much better that I made a phone call. Hello, may I speak to Rachel? Thank you very much. Hello, Rachel? Yes, who is this? Rachel, you you probably don't even know my name, but it's it's Morsby, Richard Morsby. Oh? Uh, you met me at the club numerous times. I I'm the rather distinguished looking gentleman who sits at the table on the far right corner. Oh yeah, well that's not my station. Yeah, I know, I know it isn't, and I've always regretted it. Frankly, I would have enjoyed my lunches at the club even more if you had served them. Listen, I'm Right now. Well, what I wanted to find out was if you're busy this evening. Oh, what'd you have in mind? Oh, a little, uh, quiet dinner, perhaps. Is that all you had in mind? Why don't we just wait and see? I can pick you up outside the club whenever you're free. Yeah, how I know it's you. I mean, I'm, I'm still not sure which gentleman you are. I'll uh, be sitting in an XKL Jaguar. Do you think you'll recognize it? A Jag? I get off at 6.30. <laughs> see you then. Yes, I was feeling very good now. Very good indeed. I would have drifted off into a pleasant sleep except for one thing. The moment I thought a bomb had gone off in the room, then I realized it was nothing more than a bird. A foolish sparrow had dived in headfirst into the plate glass window of the bedroom and now lay stunned on the carpet. I looked at the thing's fluttering little heart and suddenly I was struck by a terrifying palpitation of my own. The dog, the raccoon, the bird. Good Lord. Could one of them have been Una? Has Una Moresby returned from the grave? Nonsense. Such things don't really happen. But, uh, Perhaps we should reserve judgment until I return shortly with Act Three. Now let's see if common sense has returned to our hero. 
He's doing a sensible thing right now. He's taking a good, refreshing shower. By the time evening came, I was feeling better. All my peculiar notions about Una's animal reincarnation seemed ludicrous as I stood in front of the shaving mirror. I thought about the delicious young woman that was waiting for me at the club. I'd admired Rachel's way with a tray for months, but ever faithful to my wife, I hadn't done more than gaze from afar. But now, things were going to be different. Yes, who is it? It's Parker, sir. Yes, come in, Parker. It's all right. Excuse me, sir. A bit of emergency in the kitchen. Well, what is it? A snake, sir. A what? Cook insists that there's a snake curled up in the telephone wire. Oh, that's ridiculous, Parker. Cook says it's there, Mr. Mordby. They do get into the house sometimes. Well, tell Cook she's seeing things. Tell her to stop nipping at the cooking sherry and she'll soon stop seeing snakes. Yes, sir. What was that? I would guess it was Cook, sir. Oh, for heaven's sake, go down and see to it, Parker. I'll try, sir. But I'm not very good with snakes, sir. Well, what do you think I am, an expert? But that wasn't the end of it. Ten minutes later, Parker was back upstairs saying that the snake had left the kitchen and run into the living room. No, I, I suppose snakes don't run, they slither. It slithered into the living room and was now embracing still another telephone wire obviously mistaking it for a long-lost love. But then, another, another unsettling thought came into my mind. What if the, what if the snake... No, no, that, that was ridiculous. Hello? Hi, is this Mr. Mosby? Yes, who's this? Rachel, from the club. Oh, oh, yes, Rachel, what is it? Listen, could you make it six instead of six thirty? I'll try to sneak out a little early. Yes, fine. I'll be there as soon as I can. In the Jaguar, right? Yes, yes, in the Jaguar. Listen, the reason I want to leave earlier is because my husband always picks me up at 6.30. What was that? So I asked one of the girls I work with to tell him I, I got another job someplace. He, he won't care. He likes me to earn extra money. Yes, I, I see. So, just to make the story look good, I guess you'll have to lend me a few dollars after our day. Yes, of okay. course. As it happens, I have a very full head of hair. But distressing as Rachel's telephone call was, an even more disturbing thought intruded. The snake was in the telephone wire. What if the snake had been trying to listen in on the extension phone? I, I, I knew the idea was absurd, but I, I couldn't help a superstitious shiver of dread. In fact, I was so troubled that I... I decided to forego my date with Rachel, the waitress. It, 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 it wouldn't matter anyway. She, she'd be angry at some man at the club with a cute, bald head. The next day, I, I did the only thing that really relaxed me. I went to the beach. It proved to be an excellent idea. I stretched out on the golden sand and let the sun warm me. I listened to the waves beating against the shore. I listened to the haunting cries of seagulls circling overhead. Suddenly I was aware that the gulls which had been hovering over the water were now hovering over me. Now, instead of their cries being sad and plaintive, now they, now they seemed menacing. I, I stood up hastily, but the gulls seemed to be increasing in number. I saw their sharp, pointed beaks, their raking claws. They were predators, of course. How many times had I seen them swoop into a dive and snatch up some poor fish out of the sea? And there was one seagull in particular. Its beady eyes seemed to be staring at me. No, it, it, it was my imagination, of course. I, I, I wasn't a fish, I was a man. But just the same, I, I, I found myself I was up running down the beach. Running, running for dear life. And that's, that's where, where I knew it was time to see a doctor. <laughs> Thank you.
Yes, Mr. Mosby. I'm very pleased that you honored the temple with your presence. I'm grateful that you're willing to see me, Dr. Singh. I realize that, well, you... You've had a disappointment. A disappointment? I'm afraid I don't understand. I know my wife made certain promises to you concerning her will. I believe she mentioned some modest donation. She wasn't in her right mind, of course. I mean, when she took those sleeping pills. Yes, it was very sad. I trust that she has found the peace and happiness that she sought. Frankly, that's that's what I wanted to talk to you about. I, I mean, about... About whether you really believe that my wife is... Well, that that she's some kind of animal right now. But of course I believe it, Mr. Morsby. I don't merely believe. I'm positive. When your wife passed from this world into the next, her soul made its escape. Yes, yes, I I know how it goes. But but what I'd really like your opinion about is... what, What sort of animal do you think she might be now? I told you, Mr. Morsby, we have no way of knowing. But can't you take a guess? I I mean, you said it it might be influenced by a person's karma. Am I I quoting you right? Yes. The kind of person she was in life may well determine the kind of animal she is now. Your wife was soft. Your wife was gentle. Your wife was independent of spirit. Now, what animal does that remind you of? I don't know. I, 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 I can't think. Then go home and think about it, Mr. Morsby. Go home and try to be one with the universe. I went home. And I tried to be one with the universe. And when that didn't work, I tried being one with a bottle of scotch. I was still in the library, asleep in the big leather chair, when I heard the noise in the cellar. I simply had to investigate. I looked into the cellar and found that one bare bulb wasn't enough for a thorough search. I found a flashlight and went down the cellar steps. At first, first there was nothing I could see. But then, there was an empty oil can. Swiftly, my, my flashlight picked out the culprit. At first, I... I I thought it would turn out to be a mouse, but instead... Instead, it was a large, white cat. I don't like cats. I never have. Skulking, cynical creatures. When the beam of my flashlight hit it, the cat froze. I saw it was an alley cat. Its its fur shaggy, its, its eyes baleful in the light. It was fat, and yet it was bony, too. I I said scat, but it didn't scat. Instead, it started to walk toward me. And I knew for certain what Dr. Singh had meant. I knew for certain I was looking at the reincarnation of my wife. As soon as that hideous apparition howled at me, I, I made a cowardly dash for the cellar door. Once, once I was on the other side... I remembered the hunting rifle that Una had given me for Christmas. It, it stood unused in an upstairs closet. I, I, I found it. I loaded it and brought it back to the cellar. I hadn't fired a rifle since boyhood. I, I stood on the top of the stairs with my flashlight picked out the ghostly white form of the cat. I put down the light, raised the weapon, and squeezed the trigger. The report was deafening, but the recoil was worse. My precarious balance on the top step was lost. I fell to the bottom. I tried to get up again, but the the pain in my right leg was agonizing. I found out later that it was broken. But the cat, the cat was still alive. And it was regarding me at at eye level now. Its fur matted with plaster dust. Its its eyes filled with hatred. I tried to crawl toward my fallen rifle. Just as I saw the creature advancing toward me, I I screamed, Una! My hand was on the rifle now, grasping it 
Too quickly in my panic, my fingers touched the trigger, the rifle went off again. Well, that's how Moresby ended up in the hospital, Chief. With a broken leg and a bullet in his hip. And then he died. But I think he was telling the truth. You could see it in his eyes. His silver eyes, right? Yeah, his silver eyes. And you really believe that the guy's wife came back as a cat to get her revenge? What does it matter? It's still a good story. Sorry, Prouty, I can't okay it. Well, what if I got more details? What, what, what if I talked to this Dr. Singh? If I went to the Moresby cellar and found that cat? And what would you do then? Ask her if she's Mrs. Moresby? I still think it's worth a try, Chief. Ah, I'll tell you what, Prouty. What are you doing for lunch? I hadn't thought about it. Well, think about buying my lunch. You? There's a pretty good restaurant right around the corner where the Moresby's live. Now we can get a bite there and then check out that cellar. So, uh, this is where it happened, huh? Eh? Moresby fell from these steps when he fired that rifle. Hey, you can still see the plaster dust where the bullet hit. Yeah, I see it. But I don't see any white cat. It might be hiding someplace. Or it might be a figment of his imagination. Maybe so. Hold it. Did you hear something? No. Listen. There it is. Look. Hmm. It's a cat, all right. And it looks like it just found its supper. Oh, that mouse is still alive. Yeah, but not for long. Look at it squirm. He's eating it. Yep. And there goes your mouse. Oh, my God. What's the matter, Prouty? Never see a cat eat a mouse before? Chief, did you see that mouse? Sure, I saw it. But didn't you notice something? Like what? Its eyes. Chief, did you ever see a mouse with eyes like that? They were so pale blue, they were almost silver. And so the cat and mouse game comes to an end. But according to Dr. Singh, there is no end. Perhaps Richard Moresby will have his turn next in another afterlife. I'll be back in a few moments. Do you believe in reincarnation? Do you believe the dead return? We have to believe it. Because here we are. The reincarnation of radio drama. We hope you'll keep us alive by listening again to the Radio Mystery Theater. Our cast included Patrick O'Neill, Marion Seldes, Nick Pryor, and Dan Ocko. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. The Bullet was written especially for the CBS Radio Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Larry Haynes. I shall be back shortly with Act One. It's a quiet little bar, Patty Noonan's, and Jerry Price stops there every evening on his way home from work. He's not looking for anything special in the way of atmosphere, adventure, companionship. And he has no intention of getting drunk. Just a couple of beers, perhaps, to bridge a busy day, to ease the fatigue, the strain on his nerves. In the comfortable half-light of Patty Noonan's, the world outside becomes vague, distant. Especially when old man O'Rourke is holding forth. And he lay there, his head against the barricades, and the blood from him falling soft upon the pavement. I looked in his face, and I could see his death was upon him. Tis a bitter thing, I said, to die at seventeen. And for a moment his darkening eyes held mine. And with his last strength, he said... Tis a sweet thing to die for Ireland. Sweet indeed, Mr. O'Rourke. And it calls for one on the house. I thank you, Paddy Noonan. Ah, I see, uh, Jerry Price. Excuse me. 
Good evening, Jerry. Hi. I didn't notice you come in. Well, when old man O'Rourke's in form, you don't see anybody, Patty. The old man there, he carries his war. I know I carry mine. You ever think of yours, Jerry? No, no, never. Never? No. The day I came home from Vietnam, I put away the uniform. I also put away everything that went with it. The army, the war, like a snake sheds his skin. Oh, the past is gone, Patty. It's dead, so you forget it. You go on to other things. Hey! What's everybody drinking? This round's on me. Set him up, Patty. Mr. Edward Clark himself. <laughs> and what's the occasion? Hey, I got a little announcement. Guess what the old lady tells me this morning. <laughs> Number 10 is on its way. Oh, is that event? The round must be on the house, Mr. Clark. Oh, just a quick one, Patty. Hey, I got the truck outside. What are you hoping for this time, Ed, boy or girl? Let's see. What do I got now? Hey, four boys and five... No. No, no, I, I got five boys and four... Ah, who can keep them straight? All I know is I'm always tripping over somebody. Yeah. Ten kids in twelve years. Well, you can't tell me it isn't exciting to hear there's going to be a new baby. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know it's going to be a kid who'll wet its pants and keep me up half the night. It's another mouth I got to feed. Yeah, well, guys, I, I got to ride. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> you know, Betty, it's funny. People who don't want kids, can't stand kids, can't afford them, can't raise them, they can help get any kids. Whereas, oh well, <clears throat> guess there just isn't any justice in this world. Now, there may be no justice, Jerry, but there's always hope. How long have you been married? Hmm? Right after I got out of the army, it'll be uh, nine years. A fellow used to come in here, and they were married 15 years before they had their first. <laughs> Am I really out of the army nine years? Tell me, Patty, you're an old philosopher. Where does it go, huh? Down the hatch and try another. Yeah. Don't mind if I do. Oh. Wait on a paying customer first. Where? The fellow standing at the end of the bar. What are you saying, Jerry? There's nobody standing at the end in, of the... In the brown hat and a raincoat. Now, Jerry, what are you saying? I know. That's... That's Paul. Tell me, what's the matter, Jerry? Paul. Jerry, listen to me. There's no Paul. money. Paul. He was just standing here. Where, where'd he go? Where is he? Jerry, where is who? Are you all right, Jerry? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. But I, I saw him. Who? Oh, uh, the guy I was in the army with. Uh, the two of you. Were you close? He was my buddy. Well, when was the last time you saw him in, in person? The night he was killed. Have you... Have you ever seen him again? Like you thought you did just now? No. No, this is the first time. Well, maybe you need a rest, Jerry. Hattie, why now? Why tonight after all these years? Well, you say you saw him last the night he died in battle. Well, the sight of him dead must have stayed with you always. But that's not how I just saw him, Patty. He wasn't in uniform. He was in civilian clothes. You might have pictured him as he looked at a happier time. I never saw him in civilian clothes. We met in the army. And Patty, I... I didn't see him as he was then. We were both kids, about 20. I saw him the way he'd look today, about 30. His face was more mature. Jerry... Are you sure he's dead? He is dead, Patty. I just saw him. I know I saw him. Jerry, it's after midnight. Oh, I'm uh, not finished, honey. I uh, got to clean up these reports, Marge. Honey, a new rule has just been passed in this house. All paperwork shall be done in the daytime. Marge, I have to call on customers. Be reasonable, huh? Am I the kind of wife who makes idle criticism? No, indeed. Constructive suggestions, that's my motto. Northeast distributors can solve all your paperwork problems by hiring a girl. Honey, I'm lucky to have the job. No, Jerry. You're not lucky. They're lucky. Well, everybody knows you're a terrific salesman. Wait, you could get another job tomorrow. More money, less headache. Honey, I couldn't walk out on Joe Keller. Why not? Well, I'll never forget what that man did for me. I came home from the army, a kid with no experience. I needed a job. He took a chance with me. Now he needs me. Oh. Well, I'm, I'm just worried about you, Jerry. You look so tired all the time. No, I'm in great shape. Will you go see Doc Steiner? 
I did, today. Oh, well, it's about time. You needed a checkup. Well, I, uh... I didn't just go for the checkup, honey. I, uh... I went for the, uh, for the other thing. Oh, Jerry. Well, he said some people, men, well, they're okay in every way, but it just doesn't work out for them. Jerry, it's all right. No, 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 honey. It's all my fault. Oh, honey. It's... Well, it's just unlikely there can ever be any kids. He said unlikely. What he meant was impossible. We've got each other? Yeah. If only you didn't want a child so badly. Now we'll definitely think about adopting, okay? Yeah, okay. Sometimes that works out even better. Come on, honey, let, let me see you smile. <laughs> Marge, 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 I don't know what I'd do without you. <laughs> oh, that makes us even. I don't know what I'd do without you. Come on, get to bed. Yeah, I'll uh, just have a cigarette, huh? Well, honey, why'd you turn on the music? To make sure you don't try to sneak in some work. I know you can't concentrate with the music going. I'll just be a couple of minutes, honey. Let's hear that password. Paul, is that you? Jerry. Hey, climb down the hole. Make yourself at home. Man, I'm so beat I can't even remember the password. That's all right. I don't even know what it is. Yeah, got a cigarette? What do they want back at the CP, Jerry? A patrol. You going? Yep. But you went out yesterday. Well, maybe I better write to my congressman, huh? I don't have any more cigarettes. Here, finish this one. Paul... Oh. Well, I don't know if I can go out again. We're being relieved tomorrow. We were promised a rest. I just don't know if I can go out again. But you ain't going out, Jerry. Didn't you hear? I'm going. No, no, no. I'll say you and I made a trip. No, Paul. I can't let some other guy but do... But I'm not some other guy. I'm your buddy. What's the matter, Jerry? You never did it for me? a drag on that butt, Jerry? Paul. Paul, you're alive. I'm alive, Jerry. I'm here with you. In your living room. No, you can't be here. I went out afterward. I found your body. I carried it back. Maybe it wasn't you. It was me. But you were dead. You were killed. Yes, Jerry. I was killed. Jerry, will you turn that radio off and come to bed? March, he's here. Who's here? Can't you see him? Jerry, I don't see anyone. Paul, why can't she see you? She will. They all will. When? Later. I have to go now, Jerry. No, no, Paul. Paul, tell her. Jerry. Don't think I'm crazy, Paul. Paul. He's gone, Marge. He's gone. Jerry, honey, what, what's going on here? Marge, he, he, he was here. He was right Ooh. here. Now, you've got to believe that. I'm not drunk, and I'm not crazy. I, 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 I believe you. I believe you, Jerry. Now... Here, uh, just, just sit down. Uh, don't do anything. Don't say anything. And we know who she's calling. But can a doctor help what ails Jerry? And now, Act Two of The Bullet. Let us trace the path of the bullet. We have a worried Marge, a concerned Dr. Steiner, and a distracted Jerry. Tell me about this man, uh, Paul, you called him Jerry. I said we were buddies, Doctor. That tells it all. Jerry, please don't be so hostile. Dr. Steiner's only trying to help. You were buddies. You came back alive and he didn't. Yo. Yeah. There's an extensive medical literature on the subject. Oh, I'm sure there is. Jerry. I'm not being hostile, Marge. I know I saw him. Of course you saw him. Well, finally. But that doesn't mean he was there. You see, Jerry, the death of a wartime comrade remains an eternal reproach. All who survive are sentenced forever to feelings of guilt. No, no, no. 
Doctor, the wars are fought by kids in foxholes. The literature is written by doctors and authors. That's hardly fair, Jerry. I'm the authority on war, Doctor, because I was a kid in a foxhole. And I don't feel guilty about... about my buddy. You don't? No. Tell me why. Well, you wouldn't believe it. Try me. All right. You see, there's a bullet. And it's designed especially for you. And if it's your bullet, it'll find you no matter where you are. You can't evade it. You can't avoid it. It was meant for you. It was meant to be. You and the bullet. Both of you were dust originally. You were dust because the Bible says so. And the bullet was also just dust in the ground. Well, that bullet was mined and refined and cast into metal. It was shaped into a slug and joined with a shell. It was one of billions of bullets, but it was yours. All yours. And at the right time, at the right time, there'd be a tremendous explosion of gases in the narrow chamber. And the bullet would be torn loose from the shell case and spun around the grooves of a gun barrel and hurled through space. This is the bullet you don't hear. You don't hear it, Doctor. You don't hear it whine past your ear or ping off a rock or thwack against a tree. That's because it's your very own bullet. It's coming to meet you or you're going to meet it. It's been arranged. You see, it's an appointment that can never be broken. The dust that had become the bullet would encounter the dust that had become you. And after a while... After a while, both of you would become dust once again and, and return to the ground, your original home. Jerry, I know you're overworked, you're overwrought, you're overtired. I keep telling him to slow down. Okay, okay, I know I'm under a strain. I know I'm working too hard, but what can I do? Jerry, try to understand. Right now, you're having what is popularly known as a nervous breakdown. This alleged visitor from another world... I say he's an illusion. Oh. I say you have subconscious feelings about him which you're not aware of. And I say they burst through because of heavy pressure on your nervous system. Yeah, I knew you'd say that. Prove me wrong. How? Go away. Get out from under. Rest a while. Relax. <laughs> This looks like a good spot. You want to stop here and try for some fish? Well, Marge, uh, I think I'd like to go back and play nine holes this afternoon. Great. I need more practice with my irons. Uh, honey, honey, you know, uh, you, you've been getting a lot of sun. Maybe you better take it easy for a few hours, huh? And besides, you have an appointment with, uh, oh, what's that name? Uh, Biscayne Appliances. <laughs> See, Jerry, I wasn't sleeping when you called that number this morning. Now, Marge, I've been good all month. I was just getting restless, that's all. Look, they're a big chain down here. If I can open them up, I'll justify the trip. Justify? To whom? Why, why do you have to justify anything? Isn't your health important enough? Honey, Joe Keller was very nice about it. Joe Keller had no choice. Marge. Honey, Steiner was right. I was beat. I, I don't know how I managed to drag myself along. So I did I did the right thing. I chucked it all. Now I'm fit, see? I, I never felt better in my life, and I'm raring to go. Great. In a month or two, we may think about going back. I'm, I'm not used to being idle, well, honey. Neither am I. But I am learning to love it. <laughs> oh, boy. Why didn't I meet you when I was young? <laughs> young? Jerry, you weren't even 21. Well, no, I was already made when we met. I had already become what I was going to be. You know, I've got a certain amount of ability. Mm, a tremendous amount, Jerry. But I'm not confident, honey. I doubt myself. I, I guess I didn't have very much encouragement when I was a kid. You know, my brother was a great athlete. My sister was a great beauty. I, I was kind of clumsy and funny looking. Anyway, Frank and Alice were sent to college. When my turn came, the money had run out. Well, maybe they thought I wasn't worth the effort. That's why I enlisted when I was 18. I had to get away from the house of my father. There was no place else to go. You never told me this, honey. I decided if I ever had a kid, I'd never make jokes at his expense or tear him down in any way. I know how these things cut inside where it doesn't show. I would do everything to build him up and give him confidence. I, I will never, never have any real confidence, March. Oh, yes, you will. No, 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 baby. 
You, you won't get it from a pep talk. I think we can go back home now, Marge. Mm. All right, on one condition. You'll just have to slow down. Mm -hmm. I promise. And, honey, there's only one way you can really slow down. And that's to get a partnership from Joe Kelly. So much. Don't you deserve of it? Of course I do. Well, we're, we're going to adopt a child. Which means I'll, I'll quit my job and you're not going to spend time on the road. That kid will need both of us, won't he? Yes. Yes, honey, he will. Then we need that partnership, don't we? <laughs> Jerry, baby. <laughs> you look like a million bucks. Less two percent for cash, of course. Yeah, Joe. Oh, hold it, hold it. Ramona, no calls. I'm in a meeting. I can't be disturbed. Well, anyhow, Joe, hello. I want you to take it easy for a while, you hear? Yeah, I'm ready for action, Joe. Oh, you think you're ready. Now, listen. I know you had a lot of expenses. I want you to take this little check. It's only 500. I'm strapped for cash this way. I had to pop for a whole new computer setup. But anyway, I decided to increase your bonus to 5%. That'll amount to a pretty sweet raise, huh? Now, Joe... Don't, 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 don't thank me, kid. You're entitled to it. We've got to make sure you don't get sick again. Joe, I have to talk with you. Well, sure, kid. What about? Well, it's, uh... Personal and important. Well, let me buy you lunch. Well, Jerry, what are we going to talk about? I'm fresh out of polite conversation. Joe... Joe, I want a partnership. No, you don't, Jerry. But Joe... No, 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 don't interrupt. You don't want one. You'd like one. Two different things. Now, don't nitpick, Joe. You'd like a partnership, which means it would be swell. Great if you had it. But want is something else. It means lack. It means need. I know you'd like to own a business, but... You're not cut out to be an owner. Why? Because an owner is an officer. And in your heart, you'll always be an enlisted man. Tell me, could you ever fire a guy because you could get someone else cheaper? If an old customer, a good friend, was getting slow-paying bills, could you cut him off? Thousands of guys like you go bankrupt every year. You're nice, sweet, big-hearted. But you don't have the guts, business need. Well, I'd like to remind you of the volume I sell. I know it's to the penny, Jerry, and you're well paid for it. Well, I'm worth more now. You are. You got a sweet raise this morning. Joe. Joe, don't... Don't think I'm not grateful. You gave me my first break. But I think I can do better elsewhere. Where? Anywhere. Consolidated. Freeman and Singer. Should I go down the list? Oh, they'd love to have you, Jerry. What will they pay? They handle the nationally advertised brands. What did you be there? Glorified order taker? They don't need your full selling ability, so they don't have to pay a full price for it. Sure, with me, you push out all the schlock. It's rough. But you get top dollar. There's funny outfits like mine. They grab you tomorrow. But where's the improvement? They won't pay you more. At least here, you got nine years equity in a pension plan. You and me are used to each other. Besides, I really like you. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like a father to you, Jerry. It was a fiasco, Patty, a fiasco. And how do I break it to March? Oh, what's it all about, Jerry? Well, at least I don't have to put up with Ed Clark tonight. I think I'd punch him right in the mouth. We'll be deprived of his wonderful company in the next two weeks. He's tooling that trailer into the southwest. Hello, Jerry. What? Patty. Patty, is someone standing behind me? No, Jerry. Well, will you tell me why? I'll tell you everything, Jerry. When? I think maybe tonight. Well, why do you keep popping in like this? I don't know, buddy. I can't control that. Yeah, but Paul. 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 Patty, don't you see anyone? No, Jerry. Hey, you didn't hear anyone talking to me either. No. 
Patty, Patty, do you think I'm crazy? Well, maybe you should see a doctor. I saw a doctor. Well, how about one of them uh, psychiatrist fellas? I never even told my wife. I did see a psychiatrist. But after a while, I figured, why pay him 50 bucks an hour when I can come in here and talk to you for nothing? Well, there must be more to them fellas than that. Oh, sure. He said that the roots of my problem go back to my unhappy childhood. But, Patty, I have a brother, Frank, who feels terribly insecure. He goes to a psychiatrist, too. Why? He had a happy childhood. Well, put it this way. If you see someone, and I don't, the flaw can be in me and not in you. Drink? No. No. I better go home and face the music. Go someplace and talk. Where? Let's go to the parking lot. Sit in your car. It's cold. That won't bother you, will it? Not yet. Turn the heater on for yourself. When will everyone else be able to see you, Paul? In two weeks. Oh, that's great. No, it ain't. Why not? Because you'll be dead. Because you'll be dead. Cold words from a warm friend. The chill inside the car becomes intense. But Jerry knows there's no point in turning on the heater. We'll rejoin these two friends... Now we return to the final act of The Bullet and a reunion of two war buddies who haven't seen each other in almost nine years. Jerry Price, who is alive, and Paul Gardner, who is dead. The heater in this car doesn't do much good. You're shivering. Why am I going to be dead, Paul? Remember the night I went out on the patrol? Yeah, I'll remember that night as long as I live. I completed my job. I was headed back, and then I felt something smash against my head, and I knew. I knew I just met the bullet. You know, the bullet we used to talk about? I bet you don't remember. No, I remember. I remember. I felt it slam into me. And then, I didn't know anything anymore. Yeah, well, when the guys told me, I went out to get you, Paul. Yeah, I might have known you would. One minute, I was moving through a rice paddy. And the next minute, I'm, I'm sitting in an office. And I knew a lot of time had gone by. Don't, don't ask me how. I, I knew, that's all. A man was talking to me. What, a, what kind of man? You know the type that's a clerk in the government or a big corporation, fussy, self-important. Everything's got to be in the right place. He doesn't even look at me. He's got a piece of paper. He says, Paul Gardner, you're going back. You should not have died that night. The computation was for you to survive. The plan was for you to marry a girl named Marjorie Stone. I married Marjorie Stone? Yeah. I told the guy, I want no part of it. And he gives me a look, this clerk does, like he couldn't care less about me or you or anybody else. And he says, come with me. He leads me to a door. It opens, and all I can hear is a hum and a click, and all I can see is a computer. I mean, there's no end to the thing. That's all you can see is computer. And he says, there it is, friend. City Hall, go fight it. <laughs> By this time, I'm shaking. That machine scared the pants off me. You couldn't see the top nor the bottom of it. There was no end to it, just machine, wherever the eye could see. Well, uh, then what happened? This clerk... He tells me there's a plan, a capital P plan. It calls for me to come home, not you. Yeah, well, maybe that's fair, Paul. You you were always the better man. No, you got more on the ball. You never got a break, that's all. I had a chance to go to school, become somebody. 
I could have gone into the old man's business, become the biggest hardware dealer in Atlanta. You and me. We both run away to join the army. You because you had nothing. Me because I had everything. But why are you coming back? Because Marge and I are supposed to have a boy. A certain kind of a boy. He'll grow up, I don't know, discover something, create something, or be somebody the world needs real bad. They wouldn't tell me what. Anyhow, 40, 50 years from now, he has to be here. And of all the millions of men and women, he could only be born to me and Marge. And when? When uh, am I leaving? I told you. In two weeks. How? Nine o'clock at night. A trailer truck will go past Patty Noonan's saloon. Just as you're crossing the street. And why does it have to be like that? Because you don't know how careful these things are figured. You could get killed a million ways. But the plan calls for a truck driven by a guy named Ed Clark. Oh, yeah, I know Ed Clark. He doesn't have a good record, so it'll be easy to prove he's a careless driver. He works for a big outfit, so Marge will have a good settlement. But why? I still don't understand. She'll need the money. You see, I won't be a good father. Not as good as you, for sure. Oh, I'll love the kid. I'll love Marge, but I won't be there a lot. You know me. I have to keep moving. But if you know how important it is for the kid... I won't know. Once I'm alive, I won't remember any of this. And you say it's all figured out. Maybe not. The human element. How can the machine predict Marge would go for you, huh? With all due respect, Jerry, did I ever have any trouble landing any name I had my sights on? Well, with all due respect, I can't see Marge falling for your line of chatter. She will, Jerry. I'll be there when she's having a bad time. She'll be all alone. She'll need somebody. Things will take their natural course. Sure, she'll see through my line, but after a while she'll get to like it. I'm different. You're quiet. I raise hell. You let things eat at your insides, not me. I pop off. Maybe my way's no better in the long run. And she's married to you, and she loves you. But deep in her heart, she loves my way better. She'll fall in love with me. Jerry, you have to believe I don't want to do this, but it was your bullet, not mine. Jerry? Hmm? What are you thinking about? Oh, a guy downstate wants to cancel a carload of refrigerators, so I'm uh, figuring an approach. Oh, didn't we agree? We'll no. work at home. Yeah, well, honey, this is just uh, thinking. Did you talk to Joe Keller about the partnership? Yeah. And? He said no. Did you give him notice? No, he gave me a raise. Oh. Okay. Marge. Why don't you mix us a drink? Honey, aren't you going to say anything? Mm Mm-hmm. Don't put in too much ice. Marge, please, you don't understand. I understand. I married a certain kind of man. And you're stuck with him? No. I'll stick by him. Because I love him. Would you have wanted a guy who'd barge into Joe Keller's office and say, Joe, either give me half the joint or I'll open up across the street and run you out of business? Oh, come on, Answer me, Marge. I have to know. Well, maybe I did. Why didn't you marry him? He never showed up. So you settled for me. That's what's known as falling in love. Come on, honey, take me to the movies. No, no, I I don't want to take you to the movies. Let's go downtown and see a play. But that's a lot of money. Are you going to worry about money? Now, and look, this weekend, would you like to fly out to, uh, say, Snow Valley and Snow. ski? Yeah, or how about Las Vegas, huh? <gasps> Jerry, what's gotten into you? Honey, we're going to have two weeks of the most fantastic... Why, why two weeks? Oh, what? What's so special? You? Me? I just want to spend the rest of my life having a ball with you. <laughs> Stranger, I haven't seen you. Why, it must be weeks. Where have you been? Oh, uh, giving Marge a good time. Well, I must say, it's done wonders for you. You look so calm. Do I? Do you ever see the little guy who wasn't there? Uh, no. 
Well, that's good. Let's drink to it. Uh, Jerry, if I'm not being forward, what did he want from you? You wouldn't believe it, Patty. Do you believe it? Well, I, uh, just dropped in to say hello, Patty, and goodbye. Jerry. Yup. Something's the matter with you. Well, I, uh, I understand Ed Clark is due back here tonight. I don't want to run into him. I, I just don't want to talk to him. Well, if that's how you feel, I'll buy him from the joint. Now, Jerry, something's wrong with you. No, 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 nothing, Pat. Now, look, I'm an old soldier, Jerry. I can tell. No, it's really nothing. Really, is it? No, Jerry, you got a look on your face. What kind of look? I've seen it before in the war. I've seen it on men who go out on the impossible mission. The look of men who know they're not coming back. The resigned look. What are you resigned to, Jerry? You have a vivid imagination. I have an imagination. Jerry, whatever it is, don't be resigned to it. Fight it. You can't fight city. Huh? I knew it. You're in a fight, Jerry. Well, you can fight anybody. You're an ex-combat soldier. And you weren't afraid of anything. When you were out there, you faced up to death, hunger, despair. What happened to you, Jerry? Where did you lose it? Face up to it now. Whoever he is, bit in his eye. Patty, I can't do anything. Jerry, I'm going to throw you out of here for your own good. Now leave, leave town. Go far away for a while. Fight it, Jerry, fight it. Patty, Patty, wherever I go. Listen to old Patty, just take off. Don't you see there's a plan? Who cares? Put up a fight. Why are you so upset, Patty, huh? I don't know. But listen to me. Fight now. Now get out of here. It's Jerry. I decided to fight it. Good boy, Jerry. You know, Patty, there's something about your place. I don't know how to say it, but I feel stronger. Better. Away from it. Well, I don't mind. So I'm going to fight. What have I got to lose, huh? Why, why should I do what he tells me? Why should I believe him? I don't know what it is, but I agree. I'll see you around, Patty. Universal Airlines, flight number three for Los Angeles and Mexico City, now boarding at gate 17. Who are you calling, Jerry? Marge, I have to tell him. Oh, Jerry, don't do it this way. There'll be a hundred other people on that plane. Do it the way it has to be done. Paul, I have to fight you. Why? Because it isn't fair. Was it fair for me to stop your bullet? Come on, Jerry. Ed Clark will be tooling by Patty's in less than an hour. Paul, I, I don't know if I have the nerve. I'll help you, buddy. I'll help you. Come on. I called you, and I hope it wasn't out of turn, Mrs. Price. It's about Jerry. What about Jerry? He's sitting back there in a the booth. Now, wait. Don't go to him yet. He's in trouble. Well, it can't be. We, we've had such a glorious two weeks. He's in trouble. Well, what kind of trouble? I don't know. We have to help him somehow. Is it that buddy? I think so. Well... The time has come to lay that nonsense to rest once and for all. And I'm going to... That won't work. Agree with him. Show him anything he wants is okay with you. Don't fight him. All we can give him is love. Hi, honey. Hi. Buy me a drink. Oh, sure. You know, I, I never knew you had those little gold highlights in your hair. Oh, I'm using a different bottle this week. I love you. I love you, too. And I want you to be with me always. Come on, Jerry. Let's start. No, not yet. Are you talking to me? The plan calls for it. How do I know there is a plan? Ask anybody. Ask Marge. Jerry, what are you talking about? Marge. Marge, do you believe there's a plan that determines the actions of everybody in the whole world? No. You sure? I'm sure. Well, then how do you think things work out? Well, Every which way. Come on, Jerry. It's time. No, no, I won't go. Where won't you go? Then, Marge, as far as you're concerned, there isn't any plan. Oh, well, well, I 
Oh, what do you think, Jerry? No, that's not important. What do you think? Well, uh, yes. Yes, there is a plan. I can prove it. You can? Yes, but you started me thinking there has to be a plan. Otherwise, you and, and I, we just never would have met. Remember that day? Yeah, yeah. You you were taking cash at Ryman's drugstore. That's the only reason I walked in there. Well, I'd already given notice I was going to leave. And then you walked in and asked Doc if you could open a charge. Then and there, I decided to stay. And where? Where were you going? Oh, away. Pull up stakes. Why? Well, my folks were gone. My friends were married. Neighborhood had changed. The girl I went to school with had a father, a construction engineer. He'd been transferred. Well, she took a job in his new office, and she wrote and said she found a nice crowd. They needed secretaries down there. She could fix it up. Well, why not? I was set to go. But it was not to be. You came wandering into Ryman's. Obviously, there's a master plan that rules our lives. And, and where was this wonderful place you almost went to? Atlanta. Atlanta? Oh, what's so remarkable about that, Jerry? It, it was definite you were going. Well, sure. And only because I... Only because you met me. Only because I met you. Otherwise, I'd have gone to Atlanta and married a southern millionaire. But evidently, something had been planned for me. Aren't you flattered? I met you. And it changed my whole life. Are you ready to go now, Jerry? Joyce, will you come with me? Yes, Jerry. Where do you want to go? Why, I have to do something. I'll come with you. No, no, wait here, darling, please. It's time, buddy. Just like going out on a patrol. Jerry, where are you going? It's all right, Patty. It's all right. I didn't want this, buddy. I know, I know. I don't want you to take my bullet either. Goodbye, Jerry. Yeah, goodbye, Paul. Take care of her for me. You know I will. Throw this coat over you. She's gonna fade. It's all right. I've got her. We'll bring her into that bar where it's warm. Give her a little stimulant. It's all right. Everything will be all right. Everything will be. It'll be all right. So many people preface what they believe with, "It is written." It is written in the stars. It is written on the wind. And for so many like Jerry, it is written on the bullet. I'll be back shortly. I remember an old soldier once told me he wasn't worried about the bullet that had his name on it. What really bothered him was the bullet marked to whom it may concern. Our concern is mystery, excitement, suspense, thrills and chills. Our cast included Larry Haynes, E.V. Juster, Martin Newman, Ralph Bell, Leon Janney, and Danny Ako. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Welcome to the world of mystery, the world of terrifying imagination. The story you are about to hear is called Lost Dog. Yes, a dog story. But please don't expect a charming family tale about man's best friend. In fact, you may even decide that the dog in this story is man's worst enemy. It all depends on whether or not you share the particular terror of our heroine. 
Miss Julia Smollett. Get out! Our mystery drama, Lost Dog, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Kim Hunter. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll return shortly with Act One. Our story begins in the quiet parlor of a small suburban house at the end of Elm Street. Well, uh, not completely quiet, since young Ronnie Hughes is once again practicing his scales under the gentle, watchful eyes of his piano teacher, Mrs. Julia Smollett. Well, that was very good, Ronnie. It was much better than last time. I still wish we could skip this scale stuff, Mrs. Smollett. I mean, I'm not saying that I'm ready to play concertos yet, but just the same... Why don't you bother you so much, Ronnie? Well, playing scales makes me feel like a little kid, I guess. Oh, <laughs> that's silly. All the finest pianists had to learn their scales before they could play any composition. Uh, I guess it's my fault for starting to learn to play so late in life. I... Ronnie, 19 years old isn't very late in life. I'm 20, Mrs. Smollett. Are you? Already? Oh, now, that don't tell me you've been coming here a full year. No, just about four months. But my birthday was last week. It was on Thursday. You weren't well last Thursday. Oh, uh, yes, that's right. You, you, you still don't look well. Um, uh, listen, uh, why don't we see how well you know the chromatic? Your cheek, it's swollen. It's still swollen. Does it hurt? Uh, no, 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 it doesn't hurt at all. It was, it was silly of me to stumble and fall that way. I know that your husband hit you, Mrs. Smollett. Now, that's a very silly thing to say. You can't tell me it isn't the truth. I remember the first time he did it. At least the first time I knew anything about it. Now, I'm going to have to put a stop to this. Yes, I wish you would. I wish you'd call the police or something the next time it happens. Now, listen to me, young man. You've been listening to a lot of foolish town gossip. Then tell me it isn't true. What I'm telling you is that it isn't any of your business. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess that's right. It's none of my business. I, I should never open my big mouth. I'll, I'll just keep it shut from now on. Oh, Ronnie. Yeah? All right. All right, my husband and I had a quarrel. He was drunk, wasn't he? George is in a very difficult occupation. The competition is very keen, and, well, the people he has to deal with aren't always very gentle. I don't know anything about the trucking business, Mrs. Smollett. I just hate the idea of anybody hurting you. That's all. I, I just can't understand why he'd do such a thing. What did you do to him? Well, if you must know, Ronnie, I, I won't allow him to have a dog. You what? <laughs> it sounds silly, doesn't it? And you're right, it is. It's silly on my part. But I, I'm absolutely terrified of dogs. And unfortunately, my husband wants one. He wants one very much. And that's why he hit you? Well, the argument goes back a very long way. It's almost, almost since George and I were married seven years ago. Well, it, it wasn't much of a problem when we lived in the city. George didn't have his trucking company then. He was just a driver. But when he got the chance to buy into a firm out here, well, we bought this house. And I guess having a house in the country made George think about dogs and things. But I just don't see what's so important about it. Well, some things become important in marriage. Oh, now, just look what all this talk has done to the time. It's after 630 my husband's going to be home in half an hour, and I haven't even started dinner. Well, he beat you for that, too? Ronnie, if you keep talking this way, well, I just don't think it would be wise to continue giving you lessons. You, you don't mean that. Uh, I'll see you on Thursday, Ronnie. Yeah. Sure. 
Goodbye, Mr. Smollett. Goodbye, Ronnie. And happy birthday, Ronnie. What else could I tell the guy? I had two semis in a repair shop. If I wanted the job, I had to use his equipment. Well, fine. Only nobody was going to hook me for a 500-buck premium. Hey, are you listening, Julia? Uh, yes. Yes, I'm listening, George. What's the matter with you tonight? I'm a little tired, I suppose. Tired? You? From what? Lifting the piano cover? Ah, you make me sick, you know that? You weren't listening to a word I said. You don't care about what happens in my business. You never cared. But I never understood much about it. You always talk to me as if I'm one of your associates. I know what's eating on you. Think I don't know? You're sitting there like the last judgment. You're sitting there blaming me for taking that swipe at you last week. No, you're wrong. Look at yourself. You didn't even bother putting makeup on that cheek of yours. Makeup wouldn't cover the swelling. Yeah. You want to remind me how much you suffer. Well, I got a hot flash for you, kid. The one who suffers around this house is me. I could enjoy this house plenty. I could have a great time if you weren't so sick in the head. <sighs> She's talking about the dog again. Why not? You think I forgot? But surely it can't mean that much to you. I've had dogs ever since I was six years old. You never talked about it when we were living in the city. That was different. Who put a dog in that air-conditioned chicken coop? But now we've got a house. A real honest-to-God house, Julia. A house needs a dog. Oh, George. You know I feel terrible about saying no, but I can't help myself. It's just something in me. It's a phobia, I guess, but dogs terrify me. Even small dogs, tiny, harmless little dogs. I, I, I go to pieces when one comes near me. It's all in your mind. Yes, isn't that enough? No, not for me it isn't. Can't you understand that it, it's like a sickness, like a disease? Okay. So if it's like a disease, how come you never got cured? How come you never saw a doctor about it? A doctor? Yeah, that's right. You're telling me you're sick? Well, just find out. Well, where, where are you going? I'm going to get you an appointment, a doctor's appointment. I'm calling Dr. McCann right now. At this hour? I'll call him at home and make an appointment for tomorrow. We're going to settle this thing once and for all. Well, Julia, maybe, maybe I'm the wrong kind of doctor. What do you mean? Well, if you're serious about getting rid of this phobia, that would take a specialist. You mean a, a psychiatrist? Oh, some kind of head doctor. Uh, I'm sure you realize that people who are afraid of certain things, well, they've usually had something happen to them in their childhoods, some traumatic experience or other that gets stuck in their mind like a burr and won't come out. Doctor, you know we couldn't possibly afford going through analysis. George's company isn't doing that well. He'd never stand for paying all that money week after week. Well, maybe you don't need all that couch stuff. Maybe there's something else you might try. Like what? Do you ever hear of hypnotherapy? You mean getting hypnotized by someone? Not just by someone. I mean someone who can put you under and maybe help cure you of this thing. I'm not saying it always works... But it does sometimes. Oh, I, I don't know. The thought sort of frightens me. Nothing frightening about it. It might be just the way to find out why you're really afraid of dogs. One minute. Ah, what'd you do? Forget your key? Yes. George, I'm sorry. Where are you burnt so late? It's almost a quarter after seven. I I went to a movie after I saw Dr. McCann. I was I was just so nervous. I, I had to get out of myself. So I, I went to this movie, and it lasted longer than I thought it would. Oh, that's great. Just great. Now what happens to my dinner, huh? Dinner's all ready. All I have to do is heat it. That's a fine thing. I come home early to surprise you. You're not even here. I'm sorry, George. 
Oh, do, do you think you should have more to drink now? I, I mean, it won't take me more than ten minutes to get dinner on the table. Never mind how much I drink. Besides, I'm in no hurry for dinner. I want to know what the doctor said. Oh, well, it's just as I told you, George. There's nothing Dr. McCann can do for me. It's not something that can be cured with a pill. There's got to be some way. Well, he suggested that maybe a different kind of doctor, a hypnotherapist. A uh, uh, what? Someone who hypnotizes you, who tries to make you go back into your past. Mm, it sounds like a lot of junk to me. Well, it might do some good. I, I really don't know. I'll tell you what would do some good. A little direct action. That's what you need. What are you talking about, George? The only way to learn how to swim is to jump in the water, right? Well, that's what you need, Julia. I simply can't make you understand, can well, I? Well, maybe I can make you understand. That, that, forget it. You want to get that dinner ready? I'm hungry. Yes, yes, I'm going now. Uh, look, uh, why don't you change first? Change? Yeah, yeah, you're close. Get more comfortable. Well... Yes, I think I'd like to do that, George. I, I won't be long. Ah! 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 Take it easy. That's my surprise. That's a teller. Get him out of here. Please, please, George. Take him away. It's only a dog, but he's not going to hurt you. Get him out. Oh, It only goes to prove that there are more terrors in this world of ours than anyone imagines. But the question in the Smollett house is, which one is the real terror? Attila the dog or George the husband? We'll learn more about both of them when we return shortly with Act Two. to the plight of Mrs. Julia Smollett, the woman whose nightmares take the shape of a barking dog. How long do you want me to board the animal, Mr. Smollett? I don't know. Until that wife of mine gets her head on straight, I guess. Uh, beg your pardon? My wife doesn't like dogs. Took one look at a tiller and screamed the house down. Well, some women get scared of governments. This dog's only six months old, for Pete's sake. Practically a puppy. Can you board my dog until my wife gets through with her treatment? Treatment? I don't think I understand. Just give me a straight answer. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, certainly, I uh, will take dog for as long as you like. We'll see how long that is. Well, please sit down, Mrs. Smollett. Uh, thank you. Uh, right here, Mr. Smollett. Uh, yeah, thanks. You both seem a little nervous. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Froelich, but I I suppose I am. <laughs> I know. Uh, Dr. McCann explained to me. He said that hypnotherapy was was an accepted kind of treatment. For some cases, yes. Not all of them. All I want to know is, will it work? Well, frankly, I don't know much about your wife or her problem. I'm not going to say I can help her get over this particular phobia until I do. Please, George, uh, let me tell the doctor about it. I can tell him in one sentence. My wife's afraid of dogs. All dogs. Big ones. Little ones. Falls apart when she just looks at one. No, no that isn't true. I, I don't fall apart, as my husband said, unless, unless I'm close to them. Animal phobias are one of the most common types I deal with, Mrs. Smollett. And I might say that I have a great deal of success with them. But but how do you do it? I use a technique called hyperamnesia. Amnesia? Actually, it's the opposite of amnesia. After placing the subject in a trance state and making her completely willing to free herself from critical judgments about her past... Hey, wait, 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 wait a minute. I, I, I'm not following you. What we do is get the subject to remember long forgotten, very, very deeply repressed experiences. Sometimes they remember them in great detail, even though they still maintain amnesia at the conscious level. And do you see? I'm not sure I do. Do you mean you can find something in my mind that, that I don't even know is there? Possibly. It may take some time. 
We might need several visits to establish a rapport between us. But if all goes well, we should soon be able to find out if anything in your past is causing this problem. And, of course, that something will most likely concern a dog. Longest passes, but it was a bullet right at Joe Flack, deep in enemy territory. Joe? Three minutes left in the half. Are you home already? Whether or not the race yes. tried to go all the way. Well, what happened? How'd it go at Folix? It was all very strange. Well, come on, let's hear it. Did he get you hypnotized or didn't he? Um, look, I just want to hang my coat up. Look, I'm missing a big game just because I want to hear. You might as well turn it on again, George, because all that Dr. Folick did was what he called the first stages. What does that mean? I mean, well, he put me under, all right. There wasn't any problem about that. Yeah, I figured that. Tell me what he said about the dog. He didn't say anything, George. Oh, what do you mean? Just that. He didn't start talking about my problem. That's going to have to wait until I'm more receptive. What's he trying to do? Keep stringing you along until he bleeds me dry? Those visits cost 50 bucks each, you know that? I know it's expensive, but you're the one who insisted that I go. 50 bucks a week plus kennel charges. A couple of months of that and I'll be hocking half of my trucks. Look, you tell that guy to get down to business. It's only my second visit, George. Well, we better start seeing some results on number three, understand? I'm not waiting any longer. There doesn't have to be a number three. As far as I'm concerned, we can stop right now. What are you talking about? George, I don't want to do this thing. I I hate being put under. I hate anybody poking around in my subconscious for, for something that, that, that isn't even important to me. You mean you want to be sick? I think I'll lie down for a while. Don't you walk out on me. I'm sure you'd rather watch a football game. Oh, tell me what to do. I know. You think I'm Mr. Lowbrow. But let me tell you something, kid. You're no fairy princess anymore. Maybe that's what you used to think you were back in the old days. But the only fairy around this house is that piano student of yours. I don't like to talk to you when you're like this. That's what you always say when I'm drinking. Well, I'm not drinking now. And you better listen to what I'm saying. Oh, please, George, don't touch me. Yeah, I knew that was coming next. Don't touch. That's your favorite phrase, night and day. Don't touch, George. You're hurting me. That's the only thing you understand. The only touch that means a thing to you. Let go of me. Stop being such an, an animal. I'll show you what animals do. No, George, please, don't. Don't. I'll show you what kind of animal I am. No, I'll show you. No, George, please don't. Please. Well, I guess that wasn't much better, was it? Uh, what? You didn't think much of the performance. Uh, I mean, it wasn't exactly horror lips, was it? Uh, no, I, I, it was perfectly all right, Ronnie, really. But you're not all right, are you? Yes, I'm fine. You look awful. No, I, I didn't mean that. You never look awful. But you're acting so funny today. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I have something on my mind. Can I take a guess? No. What you can take is the next page of this lesson. Listen, Mrs. Smoke. Look. Can I call you Julia? Oh, really, Ronnie? I know, I know. You're going to give me all that stuff about teacher-student relationship. Only I'm sick of calling you Mrs. Smolin. I, I hate it. I hate it because it's his name. Ronnie. No. You're the most important thing in my whole life. Please, you... Ronnie. I don't want you to say things like that. They're not true, and they're just making it impossible for me to teach you. You know how I feel about you. I'm sure you do. You're just too smart not to have seen it. I know that you're 20 years old. Is that why you don't want me to talk about it? Because I'm younger than you are? It's flattering that you feel that way, Ronnie, but I know it's just a little crush you have. 
Boys go through that sort of thing all the time. Boys? Crush. Look, you're treating me like a kid. If you ask me, that's why you keep me on those damn scale exercises all the time, so you won't have to think that I'm any more of a man than those ten-year-old kids that you teach all the time. Uh, no, Ronnie. I know you're a man. Of course I do. Well, and if you think that, uh, treat me like one. Just once, uh, please. Please... Let me... Let me kiss you, Julia. Just once. Uh, uh, Ronnie. Please, Julia. Uh, uh, what is it? What, what's the matter? Uh, it, it, nothing. I, I just bruised my neck a little, and, and when you touched it, it... Your neck? Yes, it, it's nothing. Is that why you're wearing a scarf today? Let me see. No, Ronnie, don't. Oh, my God. It was an... It was just an accident. Nothing but an accident. You're all bruised. Your whole neck. Look at it. I can see more bruises. Down the shoulder. What did he do to you? Oh, please, please don't talk about it. I can't bear to talk about it. You don't have to. Julia, you don't have to. But he's going to talk about it. With me. <laughs> Listen to that, will you? Doesn't that bring back memories? Hi, Julia. What? That song. We used to dance to it, remember? In a girl room, first year we were married. Hi. You want a drink? No, thanks. You're drinking enough for both of us. Ah, it makes me feel good. Yes, yes, I know. That's the thing about wives. They ought to do what their husbands do. A man needs a pal, not just a wife. I'm sorry that I'm not a pal, George. That's why I need a dog, you understand? A man's got to have a friend. Somebody who understands him, you see? You really think that dog, what's his name, would understand you? His name's Atella. Atella. It's an awful name for a dog. A frightening name. Everything scares you, even names. Now, who the heck is that? I don't know. Hello, Mr. Smollett. Hey, what is this? Since when do you get piano lessons at night, Julia? Ronnie, what are you doing here? I didn't come for a lesson. I came to... to talk to Mr. Smollett. You want to talk to me? About what? May I please come in, sir? Yeah, yeah, sure. Come on, sonny. Ronnie, you shouldn't have come here. I won't stay long. I just want to say something. To your husband. Sure, kid. Go ahead. I wanted to say that I know what you're doing to Julia. I know how you've been hurting her. And I won't let you get away with it. What was it's that? Ronnie, no. Oh, lucky. But if she doesn't want to say anything about it, I will. You touch her again. I'll go to the police. I mean that. See, there are laws in this country. I think maybe I'm hearing things. I swear, Mr. Smollett, you ever hear her once more, you're going to go to jail. So I'm going to jail her, and you're going to put me there. Riley, I begged you not to do this. No, 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 no. It's okay, Julie. I like hearing this. I mean, I want to know what the younger generation is thinking. You don't want me to hit my wife anymore, is that it? That's it. You sure you know the difference between hitting and just giving little love taps? Please, Ronnie, go. Go right now. I mean, maybe you made a mistake, kid. For instance, this is a love tap. Oh, George! Now, that's a love tap, Ronnie, baby. This is... Oh! George, stop it! No! And you see the difference, kid? You better be sure you know the difference before you talk to the cop. George! Oh, no! Yes, it's sad to realize that all men who love dogs aren't necessarily lovable themselves. But obviously, George Smollett is a man who believes that brute force trains people as well as animals. He may be right in some respects. 
but perhaps he should be aware of the old saying that every dog has his day. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. An important day has arrived in the life of Julia Smollett and her husband George because Julia is on her way to the offices of Dr. Froelich, who has promised that this is the day which may bring her back to the forgotten days of her past, perhaps to the very day when she equated the word terror with the friendly eyes and wagging tail of man's best friend. Ah, this better be the payoff. That's all I've got to say. I hope you're not disappointed, George. Well, at least you're talking to me. That's the first word you've said to me in two days. I haven't had much to say. Look, the kid Ronnie's all right. I didn't mark him up. He's still as pretty as ever. That worries you, doesn't it? Nobody's got a right to walk into my own house and say those things to me. You have nothing to worry about, George. Yeah, that's what you say. Fifty bucks a visit is something to worry me. And 40 a week for the dog and a lot of other things. We've also lost a piano pupil. I suppose you realize that. Who cares about that? Ronnie paid $20 a week for his lessons, George. I won't miss it. Not as much as you'll miss your little Prince Charming. Well, what about it? About what? You're going to miss him, right? You're not going to have any shoulder to cry on, are you? I think I'd better explain exactly what I plan, Mrs. Smollett. Uh, We're going to try something called age regression. Age regression? It sounds as if you're going to make me younger. (laughs) That's almost exactly what we'll try to do. Well, if you can, Doctor, you'll have every woman in America on your doorstep. All I'm going to do is attempt to take your mind back into your own past. I'm going to see if you can relive some of your early years. You mean that I I might actually remember things from from my early childhood? I'm hoping that you'll recall one particular thing. The thing which you've been concealing from your adult self for a very long time. It's, uh, it's rather frightening, isn't it? No. No, you mustn't fear knowledge, especially self-knowledge. Now, I, we'll just draw the window shade and we'll get started. <laughs> Smollett, would you like to come inside? Me? You mean you're all through so fast? No, 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 we're not through. But your wife is in a deep trance, and I thought you might want to be here when we begin the age regression attempt. Well, sure, if you want me in there. Hey, she looks like she's asleep. But she isn't. Hypnosis only resembles the sleep state, but it's not. Mrs. Smollett is very much awake. Yeah? Mrs. Smollett. Julia. You may open your eyes now. Ah, that's fine. Now, tell me, do you know what day it is today? Uh, yes. Wednesday. No, you're wrong. It's Friday, Julia. Is that right? Yes, Friday. No, Julia, it isn't Friday either. Do you know what day it is now? No. I don't know what day it is. In fact, right now you don't know the day or the month or even the year, Julia, do you? No. You see, Mr. Smollett, I'm purposely doing this to dislocate your wife in time. Oh, yeah, 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 I understand. Julia, you're going to be a child all over again. You're going to see and hear and feel everything you did since you were a baby. And you're going to tell me everything I want to know about what you see, hear, and feel. You're going to answer all my questions starting right now. You understand? Yes. Julia, you are one year old. Do you hear me? You're an infant, only one year old. Tell me what you know, Julia. Tell me... If you're afraid of dogs. Oh, my God. 
You sound like a happy baby to me, Julia. I don't think you had any fear of animals when you were a little baby. Did you? Now you're two years old, Julia. You can probably say a few words now. Are you afraid of dogs? No. No. And now you're three, Julia. You're growing up very quickly. Now you're a big three-year-old girl. And are you afraid of dogs now, Julia? No. No. I'm not afraid of Bow Wow. You're four years old now, Julia. Tell me if you're afraid of dogs now. <laughs> it's all right to shake your head as long as you tell me, Julia. Now you're five. Five years old. What? Still not afraid of dogs? No. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Now you're six, Julia. Six. This can't go on forever. Please, Mr. Smollett. Not afraid at six, Julia? Then let's be seven years old. You're seven years old. Still not afraid, are you? Now, what about eight? You're an eight-year-old girl now. Topper. Topper. What was that? Topper. Oh, Topper. What's she saying? Julia, who is Topper? Is Topper a dog? Topper's my dog. Where is Topper now, Julia? Topper's dead. They put Topper away. Then they killed him, and it's all my fault. It's all my fault. What's your fault? What did you do, Julia? No. It's his fault. It's Bobby's fault. Who is he, Julia? Is Bobby a friend of yours? I hate him. He teases me. He teases me all the time. I'm glad I did it. I'm glad. Only, only don't kill Topper, please. Please don't kill my dog. Does all this mean something? Yes, it means a great deal, Mr. Smollett. Uh, Julia, now please listen. I, I want you to tell me all about Bobby and Topper. Bobby lives next door. He's ten. He teases me. He pulls my hair. He, he tore my dress. He put mud in my shoes and he hit, hit Topper with a rock. Mommy! Mommy! What happened, Julia? Why are you calling your mother? What's happened to Bobby? He, he killed him! He, he killed him! Who? I warned him! I told him what I would do! I told him! Was it Bobby you warned? Take him. Take him, Topper. Kill him. Kill him. Kill him! Oh, my God. Quiet. Julia. Listen to me. I want you to explain everything to me very clearly. Did you tell your dog to hurt Bobby? Yes. Did he hurt Bobby? Did Topper kill him? No. No, he hurt Bobby. He didn't kill him. He hurt Bobby in the neck. But they killed Topper. They killed my dog. And it's my fault. It's my fault. <laughs> ah. Well, I think we found the lost dog. So, now you know, Mrs. Smollett. Now you may be able to understand. It was this one incident in your childhood, this one tragedy of your past innocence, which is responsible for your phobia. <laughs> More than anything, you have a strong feeling of guilt. You blame yourself for what happened to little Bobby when, in all likelihood, you were not in any way at fault. No, Dr. Furlick. You're wrong about that part. It was my fault. I remember it all now. You probably just wished that Topper would turn on the little boy, and you saw your wish become a reality. So you accused yourself of a crime. I didn't wish it. I told Topper what to do. I hated Bobby so much I wanted him to sink his teeth in that little boy's throat. Well, at least you've brought it all into the light, Mrs. Smollett. 
And something tells me that it won't be long before you willingly accept the love and friendship of a dog again. Oh, hello, Ronnie. How are you? I'm okay, I guess. That looks like a brand new car you're driving. Oh, yeah, it is. My parents gave it to me for my birthday, but, well, it took a couple of months to get it here from the factory. Well, you see, I mean... I wanted a couple of special things done to it. It's very handsome, Ronnie. I'm sure you're enjoying it. Yeah, it's great. Uh, I guess you've been shopping, huh? Ah, uh, yes, I have been. Oh, uh, Ronnie, maybe you'd like to come inside for a few minutes for some tea or something? Hi, uh, I'm afraid I can't right now. I mean, see, I'm supposed to pick up Lisa at her house. Lisa? Yeah, Lisa Bryant. We, uh... Sort of going steady now. Uh, yes, yes. Yes, of course. Well, um, it was very nice running into you, Ronnie. Yes, it was. Uh, hey, by the way, you're looking... Well, I mean, you seem real fine these days, Mrs. Smollett. Yes, Ronnie. I'm really very fine. Now I've got to go inside. It's time to feed Attila. Who? Goodbye, Ronnie. Where are you? Attila? Here, boy. Oh, where's that animal? Oh, well, I suppose he's playing in the yard or something. Oh, or maybe he's in the bedroom. Attila? No, not in there. Oh, I see George's jacket's back from the cleaners. I hope they haven't taken all the smell out of it. <laughs> no, they couldn't do that. Nothing will ever take the smell of George out of anything. Now to find that animal. Attila! Where are you? Attila? Are you here? Oh, 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 there you are. Oh, for heaven's sake. Are you still tied up, you poor thing? Oh, well, don't worry. I'll have you out of that in a minute. We can't have you tied up, can we, boy? We can't play our little game if you're tied up. Yes, yes, that's a good dog. Good, good boy, Attila. Now, 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 let's play our little game. See the jacket, Attila? See? Smell the jacket, boy. Go on, smell it. That's a good boy. Good boy. Now, sick him, Attila. That's it. That's it. Sick him. Sick him, Attila. Sick him. Sick him. Who said a dog has to be man's best friend? Why not woman's best friend? Especially a woman like Julia, who is just learning how really helpful a dog can be. Or rather... She's remembering how helpful. And one day soon, George Smollett will come home to a very surprising greeting from his own pet. I'll be back shortly. We hope we haven't given you the impression that we don't love dogs. We love them very much especially since dogs are descended from wolves. And the wolf is not only a fascinating creature, he also does something wonderful for all lovers of mystery stories. He makes this chilling sound. <laughs> Our cast included Kim Hunter, George Matthews, Robert Dryden, Gil Mack, and Mandy Patinkin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense, to the fear you can hear. I have a story for you about a writer, a writer of books. We all know what it is to read a book. We all read, sometimes to learn, sometimes to pass the time, sometimes to experience a life unrelated to our own, and sometimes to surrender ourselves to the fantasies of a person we have never met and will never meet. But what is it to write a book? Ah, that's another thing altogether. But what difference does it make? All the difference in the world. Well, it's not as if it were real. It is real. Don't you see that? Well, uh, I mean, it's not real life. It is real life. It's a life more real than yours or mine or any life that anyone will ever live. How can you say that? It's just a book. Our mystery drama, Three Women, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Ruth Ford. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll return shortly with Act One. What is a book? Two, three, four hundred pages of words lying side by side in rows. That's all. Words we all know. Many of them we use. Nothing mysterious about the words themselves. But they are not thrown helter-skelter on the pages, are they? No, they lie there in a certain order, each one following on the one before. And who prescribed that order? Who put this word here and that word there? A writer. And this is the story of a writer named Stephen Lake and the book he wrote. Uh, does Mr. Lake live here? Yes. Is he home? Yeah, he's home. Um, could I see him? Well, he's working. Well, could you tell him, please, it's Mr. Higgins to see him. Higgins? I'm a publisher. Look, could I step inside? It's terribly cold out here. Yeah, I guess so. He really is working, isn't he? I mean, I hear him. He's typewriter. You're a publisher, you say? Yes, that's right. If you just tell him... You can go on up. Up? Yeah, up that ladder. That's where he works up there. Oh, thank you. You get to the top, just bang on the trap door. Where? Yes, thank you. Bang hard so he'll hear you. Yes. All right. He heard you. Mr. Lake, I'm Albert Higgins. Albert Higgins. Not from... <laughs> yes, from Higgins and Hart. All right to come up the rest of the way? All right. Well, I should say... Uh, can you make it? Can I help you? I think I can. Yes. Here we are. <laughs> I can't believe it. Mr. Albert Higgins. Very same. This where you work? Uh, yes, it's the only place I can get away. I live with my wife and my mother-in-law. That was my mother-in-law who let you in. Well, it's... Nice and secluded up here, anyway. Uh, may I take your coat, Mr. Higgins? Oh, thank you. No, uh, actually, I, I think I'll keep it on. You're cold. Well, it's awfully cold outside. Well, I think it's even colder in here. <laughs> <laughs> I get where I don't notice it. You have a stove, I see. Yes, but sometimes I forget to put wood in. Uh, just a second, I'll get it going again. That's a real old Franklin stove, isn't it? Genuine article. I haven't seen a Franklin stove in years. They're great. If you remember to keep them lighted, uh, please sit down, Mr. Higgins. All right. Well, now, I'd better explain what I'm doing here. I'd sure like to know. My secretary handed me your manuscript just as I was leaving the office for the weekend. We have a little ski lodge up here, my wife and I, right up the road from you, as a matter of fact. Yes, I think maybe I've seen it. Right off Route 7, about a mile north. Yes, that's it. Well, I was coming up by myself, and on the train, I read your book. When I got to the lodge, I read it again. I like it a lot. Except for one thing. 
What's that? You've made one grievous error, Mr. Lake. Or, or may I call you Stephen? Call me anything. What's the mistake? You've killed off the most attractive character in the book. You mean Clarissa? <laughs> you can't do that, my boy. Why, nine-tenths of the book's appeal is the charm of that girl. She, she's another Scarlet O'Hara. You can't spend 200 pages making us fall in love with this marvelous creature and then poof, just like that, have a die on us, go out of our lives. Well, you, you just can't do that. But I have to. Well, you don't have to at all, Stephen. You've written a marvelous book. I want to publish it. All I want from you is 10 new pages, the last 10. Write me ten new pages at the end and let Clarissa live. I can't. I can't. Now, Stephen, that isn't asking much. It's everything. I can't do it. She has to die. She has to. Why does she have to die? Because... Because if she doesn't die, I don't know what will happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> Dinner ready? Just about. Mm, you call Stephen? He gets so wrapped up in his writing. Well, he's not wrapped up now. Listen to him. He's thinking, Mama. He's walking up and down to help him think. Well, you can't be putting words down every single minute. He's been walking up and down like that ever since that man left. What man? What? Was somebody here? A uh, Mr. Higgins. Higgins? Albert Higgins? From Higgins and Hart? I believe he did say he was a publisher. Oh, Mama. It was our last hope. You know, every other publisher turned down Steve's novel, and he sent it to Higgins and Hart. Uh, but Mr. Higgins was here? They were up there together for about 15 minutes, and then the great Mr. Higgins came tumbling down the ladder like the devil himself was after him. Very red in the face. Looked at me like everything was my fault, and catapulted out of here. But you didn't ask Steve what happened? Loretta, when have I ever asked Mr. Genius-type novel writer Stephen Lake anything? He feels like telling me, he'll tell me, which he never does. I'm going to find out. Uh, good luck is all I can say. Stephen? It's impossible. Absolutely impossible. Stephen! Impossible, Clarissa, I can't... Uh, darling, uh, are you all right? Loretta. You just get home? Mm, Mrs. McGinnis wanted her windows washed. Uh, darling, Mama said... I don't want you washing windows. S uh, Stephen, Mama said there was a man here today. A Mr. Higgins? Albert Higgins. He really was here? He has a ski lodge up the road. Well, he didn't just uh, drop in, did he? What did he want? He read my book. He wants to publish it. Oh, Stephen, well, why didn't you say so? He wants me to change it. Well, uh, does he want you to, to change it a lot? Completely. Oh. Well, would that be a lot of work? The last ten pages. He wants me... He wants me to let Clarissa live. <laughs> is that all? Oh, Stephen. What do you mean, is that all? Clarissa is supposed to die. It's all been decided. She has to die. I can't let her go on living just to please Mr. Higgins. But it's not just Mr. Higgins. Oh, Stephen, I, I, I wasn't going to tell you yet, not for a while. But I can't go on doing housework for other people much longer. I never wanted you to do housework for other people. But pretty soon, I won't be able to. I'm, I'm going to have a baby, Stephen. You're not. You, you must be wrong. Oh, no, I'm not wrong. Not about this. You must be. Well, Stephen, aren't you glad? Just a little bit and coming right now. What with Mr. Higgins wanting to publish your book, why in the spring we'll both be having babies. You'd be having your book and I'd be having... I can't let Clarissa live. I can't do it. She has to die. Just the way I wrote it, she has got to die. Stephen, you're frightening me. I'm sorry. 
What difference would it make if you let Clarissa live? All the difference in the world. It's not as if it were real. It's just a book. It's not just a book. Loretta, I, I, I can't talk about it anymore right now. Well, you think about it, won't you? About rewriting it? I'll think about it. <laughs> well, Mama says dinner's almost ready. I'll be right down. Well, don't be long. I won't. Clarissa, I can't let you live. Oh, yes, you can, darling. I can't. You can do anything you put your mind to, Stephen. Anything at all. You're such a great man, darling. You can do anything. Absolutely anything at all. You know you can. Mr. Higgins, this is Stephen Lake. I have to see you, sir. No, right away, if that's possible. I'll come to your place. Yeah, yes, it's better that way. In an hour. All right, sir, I'll be there. Oh, that's my sweet Stephen. My dear love. My own brilliant boy. My Stephen. <laughs> Oh, Miss Stephen, I must say I was a trifle perturbed at your outburst this afternoon. It seemed such a little thing I was asking to kill off a character like Clarissa in the last ten pages when you've spent the entire book constructing her, her, her magnetic personality. It's not right. I have to do it, sir. But it's cheating, leading your readers up the garden path. I'll tell you something, which perhaps I shouldn't, but anyway, I discussed with my wife the possibility of a sequel to this book using the same central character. Clarissa? It's a shame to waste a character like that on one book. There should be another, and perhaps another. How can we do that if you kill her off at the end of your first book? Mr. Higgins, I've been writing for seven years steadily. I've never sold anything. Six years ago, I got married. My wife, Loretta, has been working as a domestic all these years. And her mother goes out every day to do other people's laundry. I haven't brought in one red cent in all that time. But now you will. Lots of red cent. The house we're living in, that's an abandoned one-room schoolhouse. We bought it a year ago with every cent we had in the savings bank. Four hundred dollars. At a county auction. The room where I work used to be the place where they stored supplies. We got the Franklin stove from a junkyard. If you want the truth, we stole it. Young risers never have it easy, Stephen. My wife has never complained, never once. She's scrubbed other women's floors. She's washed their dishes and dusted their furniture and scarred their bathtubs and polished their silver. Well, in view of all this, I should think you'd jump at the chance to have your novel published. I do jump at it. I am jumping at it. Only... I can't. Let Clarissa live. She's got to die ten pages from the end of the book. But that's unreasonable. Don't you think I wanted her to live? Don't you think I kept her alive as long as I could? You think I wanted to kill her? I had to. I can't for the life of me see why. Because... Because... I'd fallen in love with her. <laughs> oh, come now, Stephen. Deeply, hopelessly irrevocably in love. Now, now, my boy, I've been a publisher a long time. I've talked to dozens of authors. They all fall in love with characters they've created. It happens all the time. Clarissa isn't just a character. Well, of course she is. She didn't exist before you created her, did she? She exists now. Good heavens, man. She came out of your mind. She has no life except the one you gave her. Maybe she did come out of my mind, but now she's got a life of her own. Well, in a manner of speaking, of course she has. And I want to prolong that life, Stephen. I predict great success for Clarissa. And for you, you and Clarissa are one, you might say. No. No, we are not one. We must never be one. I want her dead. Not of my life. On my word, I can't follow you. Mr. Higgins, if Clarissa is allowed to live, I shall desert my wife. Desert your wife? 
My wife is going to have a baby. Well, then why on earth would you desert her? Because I love Clarissa. I love her with the kind of love I never knew existed. A love that has more power over me than I have over myself. I can't fight it. I can't escape it. It haunts my waking hours and my dreams as well. Those last ten pages of the book weren't easy to write, Mr. Higgins. But I had to write them. I had to free myself somehow from a love that was destroying my soul, my life. I don't think you're quite sane, Stephen. Neither do I. Suppose... Suppose we were to publish the book as it is. Oh, if only you would. And Clarissa dies. What then? Why then? She'd go back to being a character in a book. And if you let her live... Then, then I would follow her. My life, my body, even my talent would belong to her. I myself would belong to Clarissa and to her alone. Everybody talks about love, but nobody does anything about it. Now, here for the first time, we have a man who wants to do something. He wants to kill the lady. It may not be the perfect solution, not one to be universally recommended. Still, it's something. We'll be back shortly with Act Two. It was an American writer who said it, and not so long ago. Novelists, whatever else they may be, are also children, talking to children, in the dark. Listen with me now to the second act of Three Women. Stephen is talking to Clarissa, a character he created in one of his books, In the Dark. Clarissa, I can't let you go on living. But I want to, Stephen. Of course you want to. We all want to. But I want to so badly, and it's your fault, Stephen. (laughs) Why is it my fault? Because you gave me such a wonderful life in your book. I enjoy it so much. I can't bear the thought of giving it up. Neither can I. Neither can I. To have had a life like that and then to die ten pages from the end of the book. I know, I know. When the book is published, you'll be dead. I don't see why, Stephen. I really don't. Because till now it's just been you and me and this room and words on paper. But after the book is published... What will it be then? It'll be... Something that sells for seven ninety five, dollar fifty in the paperback edition. My goodness, you're counting on a big sale, aren't you? Just hoping. But it won't have a big sale if you kill me off, sweetheart. It might. What was that? Who came in? Probably my mother-in-law. She gets home early to get dinner ready. Will she come up here? I don't think so. She hardly ever does. Oh, then let's talk some more about how much you love me. She, she is coming up here. Oh, bother. Well, we'll talk some more later. I am not going to let you kill me off, Stephen. It's too cruel. Uh, just a minute. All right, to come up. Of course, Mother, give me your hand. What? Right. How do you stand it? I like it. It's cold, too. The fire's gone out. You been working? Oh, no, not much. Well, what have you been doing? Figuring something out? Well, uh, trying to. Figuring out what to do with the last ten pages of your novel? More or less. Stephen, it's not up to me to tell you what to do. Then don't. I don't know one book from another, but this book of yours, it's a novel, isn't it? It's a novel. About made-up people, right? Yes. So what's the difference? You can do what you want with made-up people. They can live as long as... as long as you're alive to write about them. True? Is that true? Yes, yes, that's true. So, if Mr. Higgins says you should let this character, this uh, Clarissa, go on living, what's the difference? Let the lady live. Who cares? Also, and I don't mean this as a reproach, we can use the money. 
Believe me, I know that. So, if a little lady is worth more alive than dead, I say let her live. Yeah. Not a lot of work. The way I understand it from Loretta, I mean, you don't have to write the whole book over. Just the last ten pages. Well, what's that? You can knock that off in no time. Well, i better be getting on down and get dinner started. It'll be ready in about half an hour. I'll be down. Uh, yes. Yes, sweetheart. The cold hand I held, wet with my tears. Oh, be with the beautiful, stirred ever so little. The fingers moved faintly in mine. Oh, Stephen, yes. It was a very good dinner, Mother. How would you know? You hardly tasted it. Well, what I did taste was awfully good. Mm, nobody's going to eat any more, I'll clear. Well, let me help you. Oh, don't be silly, Mama, and I'll finish up. You go back to work if you want to. Well, all right, I, I guess I will. Poor Stephen, he looks awful. He hardly eats anything anymore. I had a talk with him today about changing the book. What did you say? I said, what's the difference? Character in a book can be alive or dead. Who cares? Stephen cares. Well, why should he? Oh, Mama, he's a writer. Writers care about these things. It has something to do with um, artistic integrity. You think maybe somebody's putting things into Stephen's head, artistic notions, things like that? do that. Mr. Higgins wants him to change the book. I wasn't thinking of Mr. Higgins. I was thinking of some woman. What woman? I don't know what woman. I don't suppose I should say this, but lots of times I hear him talking up there. Oh, Mama. Steve talks to himself all the time when he's trying to work things out. This isn't talking to himself. This is talking to somebody. There's a big difference. And another thing, that that mattress he has up there, it looks to me like there's two people been lying on it. Mama! All right, all right, all right, all right. I told you I shouldn't say it, and no, I'm sorry I did. He didn't seem very happy about the baby. I should have kept my mouth shut. Oh, that's all right. You finish up the dishes. I'm going up to talk to him. Don't say I said anything. Don't tell him we've been talking. I won't. Yeah, just a second. I'm not disturbing you, am I? Of course not. Well, I didn't hear the typewriter, so, uh... Stephen, do you love me? What kind of a question is that? It's the kind of question wives are always asking, even if they never say the word. Yes. I love you. Are you glad we're going to have a child? Yes. Yes, I'm... I'm glad we're going to have a child. <laughs> well, ask a straight question, you can get a straight answer. That's the way it should be. So, I'll ask you another one. Why don't you want to change the book? Loretta, I... I just don't. Well, it's not a straight answer. I know it isn't. I, I, I just can't. Stephen, I'm going to ask you another straight question. Are you interested in some other woman? Interested? Mm. No. Because if you are... I'll go away. Oh, I don't want you to go away. I'll go away and have the baby someplace else. Oh. Till you get over this other woman, then I'll come back. Or if you don't get over her, I'll stay away. Oh, Loretta. Stephen, can you swear to me that there's no other woman in your life except me? Can you promise me that? Loretta. 
I swear to you, I promise you that I love you. Uh. That I love you, that I want you for my wife for always, for as long as we live. I guess I'll have to be satisfied with that. It's the truth. Mm, all right. I'll let you work now. Oh, I thought she'd never leave. Please, Clarissa, I don't feel like talking to you right now. Why didn't you tell her about me? How could I tell her about you? She wouldn't believe me. Nobody would. Darling, you know what I was thinking while Loretta was going on and on about herself and you and the baby she's going to have? I was thinking, why don't I have a baby? Oh, not in this book, of course, but later on in some other book. I'll have this perfectly gorgeous child who will have my sweet disposition and your marvelous grace. How about that? Mama, I asked him if there was somebody else, another woman. Oh, well. He said he loved me and wanted me for his wife for as long as we live. Oh, I still hear him talking up there, and it certainly sounds to me like he's talking to somebody. Oh, Mr. Higgins, come in before you freeze to death. Winter's closing in on us. It sure is. How are you, Mr. Higgins? Hi. Hi, and I thrive on the cold. Uh, Mrs. Lake, mm. your husband's in, I hope. Mm, he's up there, working, I guess. Has he talked to you about, uh, you know, about Clarissa keeping her alive? He just says he doesn't want to. All right to go up and see him? Oh, sure it is. Good luck, Mr. Higgins. Thank you. Oh. Mr. Higgins. Okay, to talk to you for a few minutes, Stephen? Uh, I, I guess so, sure. I, uh, I thought I'd like to see how you're getting along. I'm not. You haven't done any work? None at all? Oh, a few pages. They're over there next to the typewriter. Okay, to have a look? If you want to. Mr. Higgins, if you're here, talk to me about letting Clarissa live. I most certainly am. But I'm not sure I can take it anymore. My mother-in-law's talking to me about it. My wife talks to me about it. Stephen, this is very good so far. And the hardest thing of all is Clarissa talks to me about it. Do you know what she wants now? She wants a baby. My baby. We well, could probably work in a baby later on. Mr. Higgins, if Clarissa has a baby... Am I going to love it more than Loretta's baby? Stephen, these pages are very good. Now write the last couple of pages. I've got to kill her off, Mr. Higgins, and never write about her anymore. Never. Oh, now, Stephen, stop it. Come down and try to be reasonable. I can't be reasonable. I love my wife, Mr. Higgins. I want to live with my wife and our child. I can't live with her and Clarissa, too. No, Mr. Higgins. Clarissa has to die just the way I wrote it in the first place. If she dies in this book, then I can't write about her anymore. And if I don't write about her anymore, she won't exist. Stephen, I won't publish the book if Clarissa dies. I put it to you straight. Don't you think you owe it to your wife, to your mother-in-law, to yourself? To make this little concession? Concession? What will happen to them if you don't? What will happen to them? If I do? Money is the root of all evil. And killing is certainly evil. Yet, here we have a man who wants to kill... and is letting himself be talked out of killing... For money, it leaves us with the perplexing question, what is evil? Maybe we'll find out when we return shortly for Act Three. Pity the poor novelist, alone with his thoughts, his visions, his conceits, his fancies, his only solid substantial companion, his typewriter. 
Stephen. What is it, Clarissa? Everybody wants me to live except you. I know, I know. And you're the one who loves me. I know. Nobody else even knows me. Except from reading the book, and that's not really knowing. Clarissa, I wish you'd let me work. How am I doing? You're living. Oh. Just barely, but you're living. I thought I was. Because I was feeling so warm and loving about you. I know the only reason you're keeping me alive is for the money. You can't fool me, Stephen. If there was a way to kill me and still make the money, I bet you'd take it. There ought to be a way. Clarissa, you've given me an idea. Oh, it makes me very happy if I've given you something. You've given me everything. It's about time I gave something back to you. Uh, Mr. Higgins, Stephen Lake. Yes, uh, I have an idea. Uh, I have to talk to you about it right away. Can I come to your house? Well, that's all right. I have snowshoes. I'll be there in, uh, say, uh, half an hour. Thanks, Mr. Higgins. What kind of an idea have you got? Never you mind. I'm coming with you. No, I don't want you tagging along. I want to tag along. Where are my snowshoes? Right there. Now, what's this big idea you have to tell Mr. Higgins? None of your business. Is it about me? As a matter of fact, it is. Well, then it is my business. Stephen, you're not going to kill me off, are you? I thought that was all decided. Are you? Now, my idea is this, Mr. Higgins. I'll finish up the book just the way you want it. Good, good. Clarissa stirs and comes to life. Whatever it was she was dying of, she only went into coma, etc., etc. I'll work it out. I'll give you the book in a couple of days... Maybe by tomorrow. Good. Then, if you still like it... Oh, I like it. It's yours. Only, I want it in my contract that whatever money the book makes goes to my wife. I want her to get all the proceeds. But it's your book? Why, well, I, I just happened to write it, that's all. And writing it... I nearly ruined my wife's happiness and my own. I don't want any money for that. Stephen, it seems to me that you're simply feeling guilty about your feelings for Clarissa. I am. Guilty as hell. And about the other books, the ones after this one. You're not going to tell me you don't want any of that money either. I want somebody else to write those things, not me. You're joking. Mr. Higgins, I've got to get Clarissa out of my head. And the only way to do that is to put her into somebody else's head. Let somebody else keep her alive, not me. Well, uh, I suppose we could find a ghostwriter, but... At least let me have those last ten pages with Clarissa alive. Mr. Higgins, you'll have them. Tonight. <laughs> You are busy, aren't you? Very. You're working on the new ending to the novel, aren't you? That's right. And I get to live and live and live and live. Clarissa, it's and... cold in here. Why don't you do something useful like putting some wood in the stove? I don't know how. You don't know much, do you? Uh, enough. Okay, I'll do it. Make a nice big fire and then we can sit and talk about what's going to happen next. What do you mean by next? In all the other books, the ones you're going to write after this one. Yeah. Now, blow on this fire, will you? Oh. At least you can do that. Okay. Go on, tell me about the other books. I don't know anything about the other books. Would you like to hear some of my ideas? Not really. Well, that's enough. You can stop blowing. It's caught fire. Ah. That feels good. I think the next novel ought to be in Venice. Clarissa, I have made a deal with Mr. Higgins. When I finish these ten pages, thereby keeping you alive, mm -hmm. I shall turn them over to him to replace the original ten. And then I shall write no more books. 
Well... No more books about you, anyway. But Mr. Higgins thinks I'm wonderful. He wants lots of books about me. He's going to get lots of books about you, but they won't be written by me. But who'll write them? A ghost. A ghost? I don't want to be written by a ghost. A part ghost myself. Oh, he'll be a real live man. A ghost writer. That's what they are called in the publishing business. But it won't be you? Definitely not me. But it will be a real live man. Yes. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'd like to get back to work. I wonder, will he be as handsome as you? Handsomer, probably. I wonder, will he love me the way you do? For his sake, I hope not. I wonder, will I love him? Why should you love him? Why not? You never loved me. Oh, that's the way you wrote it. I couldn't love anyone. Except yourself. But he might write me differently, mightn't he? He shouldn't. He should follow the character exactly as I've set it down in the first book. But if he falls in love with me, he might want it changed so I could fall in love with him. It would be so much more convenient for everybody. Clarissa, you wouldn't. Wouldn't what? Fall in love. Fall in love with the ghost rider. Would you? How should I know? Well, you... You wouldn't have his child. You wouldn't do that. I think I'll put another piece of wood on the fire. Or would you rather do it? Clarissa, would you have his child? There. Oh, look. That's a nice fire. Lovely. Answer me. Would you have his child? Well, Stephen, if that's the way he writes it, I guess I'll have to. Stephen, what are you doing? Oh, no, no. You're not going to have his child. No. Stephen. You're going back to where you were in the original. You're going to die ten pages from the end of the book. You're not going to burn the new pages, Stephen. You're not. Don't. Uh, help. Help. Someone help me. I'm on fire. Help me. The quilt. Get me the quilt, please. Help me. Mama. Mrs. Lake. Mr. Higgins. It's Mr. Higgins, Mama. Oh. I haven't seen you since the funeral, Mr. Higgins. Thank you for the beautiful flowers. May I come in for a minute? Why, of course. Come in. Would you uh, like a cup of tea, Mr. Higgins? I was just about to put the kettle on. Uh, thank you. No, Mrs. Lake. I, uh, I haven't wanted to intrude before this on your grief. Such such a terrible accident. Well, Mama and I can't figure out how it happened. You know, Stephen knew that Franklin stove so well. He, he'd used it for years. And then... It was like it sort of blew up in his face. Mrs. Lake, he was working on the new ending for the novel when he... when it happened. At least I think he was. Well, I don't know for sure, Mr. Higgins. He promised me I'd have the new pages that same night. He he acted as though he couldn't wait to get started. Well, then I imagine that's what he was doing. Mrs. Lake, would you mind if I'm not intruding? Could I go up and take a look? You see, if I can find them, I can just substitute them for the original last ten pages, and we can go right to work. I think we might be able to publish the book this spring. Why, that would be wonderful. At least you'd have a little money coming in. Mm, Stephen would have liked that. So is it all right if I take a look? Why, surely. You don't mind if I don't go up there with you. I haven't wanted to somehow since the fire. No, 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 that's quite all right. I'll go up by myself. Trap door is not locked, Mr. Higgins. 
Make it all right? Yes. Thank you. Fine. Oh, I suppose I should have cleaned up that place, but I just couldn't. No hurry. When the time comes, I'll do it. Never entered my head to look for those ten pages. No, never mind. Mama, if he if he finds the pages and publishes the book, and if it's a success, that'll be nice, won't it? Mrs. Lake. What is it, Mr. Higgins? You found them? I found something. I found these. These ten pages. Oh, thank the good Lord. All neatly stacked beside his typewriter. Oh, I'm so glad, Mr. Higgins. Glad? Have you read them? Well, no. Well, listen. Lovely, gorgeous Clarissa lifted her beautiful head. She wasn't dead after all. Well? But, but that that's not the way Stephen writes. I could hardly believe my eyes. That creamy complexion was beginning to pinken. Pinken? There's no such word as pinken. My adorable sweetheart had only fainted and wasn't dead at all. My goodness, but I was happy. Now I ask you... Stephen didn't write that way at all. Nothing like that. And who did? Who did write this awful trash? Mr. Higgins... You don't think that... Well, somebody wrote it. It's typed on his typewriter. You... You don't suppose it is possible that Stephen went mad and wrote this awful stuff while he was unbalanced? Mr. Higgins, if Stephen was a certified lunatic, he couldn't write ten pages like those there. Do you want them to keep for any reason? I don't think so. Well, I'll take them home with me and burn them. Mr. Higgins, does this mean that uh, that there won't be any book at all? Why, uh, I hadn't thought... I would so like to have a book of Stevens published. Tell you what we'll do, Mrs. Lake. We'll go ahead and publish the original version, the one where Clarissa dies. Oh! You say something? Mm, no. Sounded like a ghost, kind of. No. <laughs> it really does sound like a ghost. Must be the wind. Huh. Well, I'll be getting along. And don't you worry, you two. There'll be a little money coming in. It's still a good novel, even with Clarissa dying. Too bad, though. I'd hoped. Clarissa would have a long and happy life, but such is fate. And the moral of the story is... What is the moral of the story? How's this? Lie if you like, but never believe your own lies. Or... The man who fools himself is a fool indeed. Well, something like that. You figure it out. I'll be back shortly. The gift of youth is ours for just a little while. Fame is capricious. And money slips through our fingers. Health is a godsend subject to recall. Even the benison of love can elude us, or it can wither in our hearts. But the blessings of imagination, ah, they belong to us forever and ever. Our cast included Ruth Ford, George Petrie, Elspeth Eric, Joan Loring, and Roger DeCoven. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense, to the fear you can hear. What do you think about witches? 
Not the bony hags and atrocious crones of Shakespeare and legend, or the poor unfortunates of Salem, but witches who are young, witches who are beautiful, witches who even fall in love. Excuse me. Who let you in here? Well, I hope I'm not disturbing you. I'm only trying to make a deadline. Well, if you're in the news business, I've got something for you. It better be good. I... I'm going to have to kill my wife. That won't be news till you do it. I know. I want you to know why. Okay. Why? Because she's a witch. Our mystery drama, I Warn You Three Times, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Joan Loring. I'll be back shortly with Act One. It's one of those miserable, stormy nights in the dead of winter. A thick, clinging, wet snow seems determined to smother the entire earth and everyone on it. You'd think that most people would choose the cheerful indoors, a warming fire, a relaxing drink, a comfortable bed. That's the problem with most people. You can't figure them. For instance, consider that line of cars crawling down Main Street, bumper to bumper, skidding, sliding. Where is everybody headed on a night like this? Have we become a race of lemmings? Do we follow some mysterious, unconscious drive? An interesting speculation, but we won't pursue it. We'd better consider the traffic, which has come to a complete standstill. A car seems to be stuck at the intersection. Let's go, sister. That light's green. Oh, officer. Well, what are you waiting for, lady? Uh, my, my husband. Your husband? That, the, the light's red, and he said he wanted to step out and clean off the rear window. Uh, hey, mister. You finished back there? He just stepped out. It was a moment ago. Tom? Well, maybe he slipped in the snow. Tom, are you all right? Lady, there ain't nobody around the back. He just went out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Clean the rear window. Uh, that's what you said. But what could have happened? Uh, just sit there a minute, lady. Hey, lay off of that horn. I know you got one. Now, what's wrong, officer? Did you see a guy get out of that car up there? Did I see a guy get yeah, out yeah, of Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you? Huh? Are the police after someone in the skate Oh, come on, yeah. Buster. Just tell me. Did you see a guy cleaning off the rear window of that car up front? Well, to tell you the truth, I wasn't paying any attention. I was listening to the radio. Now, there could have been somebody, but then again, I, I couldn't say there was. It's not that I'm not trying to get involved, yeah, officer. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm a citizen. I know my duty, but... but yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Officer, where is my husband? He was just there. Lady, he uh, disappeared. How could he disappear? I don't know. I do know he ain't here. What am I going to do? Well, you can't keep blocking traffic, lady. you got to move on. Where? Well, I... it beats me. But you must find him. Look, you got troubles with your husband. That's your problem. But when you hold up traffic, but, that's my problem. Will you feed her a little gas, please? Come on, let's go. Let's but go. I can't. Lady, you gotta go somewhere. I can't go anywhere. I don't know how to drive. Desk, Lieutenant Carroll. Yeah. Nobody wants this guy, you say? Well, technically, that isn't true. His wife wants him. Okay. Well, look who's here. Lieutenant? You won't win any Pulitzer Prizes around this joint tonight, Peterson. I was hoping you might have a little bone to throw me. Page one? I'll settle for two inches on the bottom of page 38. If you promise to remember two R's and one L. First name, Irvin. Not Irving. Lieutenant Irvin Carroll. We may have something shaping up. Ah. I don't know where it can go. Everywhere or nowhere. What have I got to lose? Sitting over there on the first bench. Ooh. That's nice. And married. Well, you win, you lose. A very, very weird story. Tell me about it. No. Let her tell you about it. Why don't you ask her? 
excuse me. Uh, My name is Fred Peterson. I... I'm a reporter for the Union Messenger. Oh, no, I don't want to talk to a reporter. Why not? Because I... Because you're afraid? Why? Could you put Tom's picture in the paper? Well, that depends. Has Tom done anything? He's disappeared. Well, we need the how, the when, the where. The when? About an hour ago. Where? On Route 986 at Main Street. How? I don't know. You see, we were driving south. It was snowing hard, and he said, I can't see out the rear window. The light was red. He stepped outside to wipe it off. He didn't come back. Where where did he go? I don't know. Well, where could he go? I don't know. In that snow. And and there's nothing around there? Could, could you give me a why? I... I can't imagine. I don't know what to do. I sit here waiting. Look, my name is Hetty Parsons. Tom and I, we've been married five years. We don't have any problems. I mean, we're very happy. If you print his picture in the story, maybe someone will see it who can help us. Excuse me a minute. Well? Yeah, I think I'll run with it. I don't blame you. I was always partial to girls with honey-colored hair and baby blue eyes. Ah, so you noticed, too. Have you run a check on her husband, Tom Parsons? Well, he's not one of the known bad boys. No record at all. And what did she say he did? He's an accountant. He has his own business in the Barstow building. You looked him up in the phone book? Checks out. They were headed south, huh? That's what she says. If it was a trip, there should have been bags. There were. His and hers? His and hers. How does it look? What do you want from me? I don't solve crimes. I sit here behind the desk. Come on, Lieutenant. Now, this is one for you, Fred. How could a guy disappear just like that? In that storm. Hmm. There's no place to go. You could have had a car following in back of them. A friend was driving it, maybe. Well, he had to go somewhere. But why? Right now, we're treating it as missing persons. It's all we can do. He's not wanted for anything. He's a legitimate citizen, as far as we know. He hasn't even done anything to her. At worst, he left her in a car. He hasn't even deserted her. Yet, who was driving? He was. She can't. Well, that's abandoning her, isn't it? No. At best, we'd have him for abandoning the car. Yeah. Yeah, excuse me a minute. Listen, Mrs. Parsons. Yes. Why, why don't you go home? I've got my oh. car outside. Oh, no, no. I, I, I want to be here in case they find time. They'll let you know if they find him. No, I don't want to be home alone tonight. I... I... I just want to stay yeah, here. But it may be hours. It may be even days. Don't say that. I'm sorry. I... I'm just so jumpy and so nervous. I can't believe what's happened to me. Well, if you're going to sit here, you should have some coffee and a sandwich. Oh, I couldn't think of food. I'll be right back. <laughs> Officer Dennis. Well, look who's here. The friendly reporter. Yeah, listen, that girl. Yeah, I was going to ask what girl, but yeah, I won't. Yeah, I, I, I want to start at the beginning. Oh, well, you know, Lieutenant Carroll's got two R's, but Patrolman Dennis got two N's. Yeah, 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 yeah. What did happen? Well, like she said, he went out to clean the rear window and he was gone. Did anybody see him? Uh, I checked the car in back, but who looks? Who notices? Now, where could he have gone to around here? Well, on the south side, you got open fields. On this side... A couple of warehouse buildings locked up. Night watchman? Yeah, he's a retired cop. No sign of anybody trying to break in, to hide, or whatever he may have wanted to do. Okay, so what could have happened to the guy? Well, it's all very interesting, but in 15 minutes I go off duty, and I won't have to worry about it. I didn't think I could touch a thing, but I must have been starving. Has there been any word? Yeah, you'll hear the minute they know. Now, listen, Hetty. I can help you, but you have to help me. I'll do whatever I can. We have two basic roads to explore. One, somebody was out to get your husband. Oh, no. No. Tom is the mildest, sweetest, most obliging guy on earth. He has absolutely no enemy. That you know about. Tom and I have no secrets from each other. Everybody has at least one enemy. Tom is incapable of hurting anyone in any way. He sounds too good to be true. If he does have a problem, that's it. All right. The second road to explore. He wasn't pushed. He jumped. What does that mean? It means 
He walked out on you. Oh, it's, it's, it's inconceivable. Why? I've had a liberal education tonight, Mr. Peterson. Call me Fred. No, not yet, or maybe never. I've been introduced to a new world. I've been thrown in with people who basically don't believe in anyone. Don't trust anyone. And perhaps they have good cause. Perhaps that's how life is in their world. Perhaps their world is the real world, but it isn't my world. May I ask, do you come from another world? It's entirely possible. I won't call you Fred unless and until we become friends. But that's just the little thing. The policeman who brought me here is a confirmed cynic. So is the lieutenant. And so are you. I must plead guilty as charged. All of you propose two basic hypotheses. A, my husband was ambushed by enemies. B, my husband abandoned me. You can't conceive of people who... They simply don't make or have enemies. You can't conceive of people who are completely in love. I'm not a fool, Mr. Peterson. I read these attitudes. What a wonderful world you live in, Mrs. Parsons. I hope you can stay there always. We're so dependent on each other, Tom and I. We need each other. We're... We're so complete together. But we still have the basic fact of his disappearance. Yes, but all you can see are two alternatives. There is a third, you know. Really? Perhaps he was taken ill, suddenly, and he just wandered off. Oh, maybe I should go back there. Uh, I've and... already been back there. There's no place he could have wandered off to. Tell me, does he have a history of any sort of illness, amnesia, oh. anything like that? No, nothing like that. Well, then, where are we? Nowhere. Perhaps you are nowhere, Mr. Peterson. Okay, tell me where you are. I have faith. I believe Tom will be found, or he will find himself, and he will have an absolutely reasonable and rational explanation. I hope so. Hey! Oh! Hey! Tom! Oh, Tom, darling. Tom, what happened to you? I was so scared. Oh, darling, you're all right. Hey, are you all right? Yes. I don't understand. I happened to tune in the news, and there it was. Tom Parsons' accountant with offices in the Barstow building had disappeared under mysterious circumstances. Oh, Tom, I was so worried. Mr. Parsons was driving with his wife. He stepped out of the car to clean off the rear window and... Hetty, what did you tell them? I wasn't in the car with you. I was at home. <laughs> Well, here we have the story of two people who love each other deeply, who trust each other completely. It sounds like the Garden of Eden. But we all know what happened back there in the traffic and the snow. We shall return shortly with Act Two. You've seen these couples, or rather heard of them. They dwell in a sea of perfect harmony, never a ripple of discord. But when they do have a disagreement, well, it's a beaut. Here we have Fred Peterson listening to Hetty and Tom Parsons having a fantastic difference of opinion. Tom! Tom, how can you say that? Hetty, darling, I was not in the car with you. I was home. Home. You said, let's get out of this miserable cold and snow. Let's head south for a couple of weeks. Hetty, when did I say that? How could I say that? Uh, you know I'm swamped with work at the office. You came home this afternoon, Tom. You said, how would you like to leave for Florida tonight? And I said, give me an hour to pass. <clears throat> Excuse me. Who's he? Oh, he's just... A... I'm just Fred Peterson of the Union Messenger. A reporter? Oh, please, 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 don't be alarmed. I assure you it's a thoroughly respectable profession. Well, I... I see no point in... Well, emblazoning this all over the newspapers. Is there anything to emblazon, as you put it? This is a private affair. Tom, tell me what happened. What happened to you after you left me? Eddie, I told you I never left. Tom! How could I have left you? I wasn't with you. Oh, no, Tom. This time I have witnesses. The police officer, he knows you went out to clear the rear window. How does he know? Because he... Because you told him. Mr. Parsons, 
Now, obviously, your wife seems distraught. I would suggest... Keep your suggestions to yourself, Mr. Peterson. Don't you dare imply that I'm overwrought or nervous or hysterical. I am completely calm, extremely rational, and absolutely in command of myself. I know what happened this evening. Mr. Peterson, this is obviously a private matter between my wife and me, and nobody's business but ours. What did you mean, Mrs. Parsons, when you said that this time you had witnesses? Have there been other times when... Hetty, it doesn't do us any good to air this in public. All right, Tom. Take me home. Uh, let me talk to that officer at the desk there. Find out if there's anything we have to do. Well? Well what? Friend, husband, Tom. He didn't turn out to be quite as advertised. And what is that supposed to mean? He isn't quite the sweetest, mildest, most obliging guy on earth, is he? He is to me. I guess it's all a matter of how these words are defined, isn't it? And about this oh-so-complete understanding between the two of us. Won't you at least admit you're having a difference of opinion right now? I don't have to admit anything. Okay, okay, don't shoot. I'll go quietly. Are you sure you really want me to go? Please. Regardless of what you say to me, you are in trouble. No, I... no, don't deny it. Well, what if I am? I'd like to help you. Why? Because, because... Would you want to help me if I were middle-aged and fat and sloppy and ugly? It isn't ten minutes ago. You accused me of living in a world where no one trusted the next fellow or believed in him. You accused me of being a confirmed cynic. Is it possible you don't remember what you say from one minute to the next? I'm sorry. Don't be. There's a great deal to what you said. You're kind, but no one can help you. I could try. And no one should try, either. Why not? It's too dangerous. That was the wrong thing to say to me. I'm warning you. You're only getting me in deeper. Please, Fred. For openers, my business is to take chances and get myself into... Hey, you know what happened? What? You called me Fred. Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have. But you did. And that means we're friends. Look, I only want... You're the one who set up the ground rules for this thing. First names are for friends only. Please, forget what happened here tonight. I warn you. You've already warned me twice. It won't work. I can only warn you three times. Do you mean you keep score? Please don't joke, Fred. You keep saying the wrong word, or I should say the wrong name. The wrong name is Fred. You can't call me Fred and expect me to forget everything. I warn you. I warn you for the third time. Forget. All about tonight, for your own sake, for your own safety. And after saying all that, you still expect me to forget about it. I... Tell my husband I'll wait for him outside in the car. Wait a minute, Hetty. I warned you, Fred. I warned you three times. Now, goodbye. Where's my wife? She said she'd meet you in the car. Uh, Mr. Peterson, if I were you, I'd forget everything that happened tonight. Is that a threat? No, a warning. That's all I've been getting around here, warnings. Well, for your own good, take them seriously. And if I don't? You'll regret it for the rest of your life, which may not be a long one. You still insist that you're not threatening me? I'm only trying to help you. Really? And why should you do that? Why? I don't know why. Maybe it's because the last guy tried to help me. What last guy? I didn't listen to him. The last guy? What do you mean? Uh, nothing. Forget it. You know, with you and your wife, it seems, everything turns out to be nothing and forget I it. don't think it matters now. I have an idea. It's already too late for you. I'm sorry. Good night, Mr. Peterson. Hey, Fred. Fred. Yeah, Lieutenant, I'm coming. Well? Well, what? There's nothing there for us boys in blue. What's in it for the fourth estate? Looks like he's trying to drive her nuts. It could also be the other way around. I don't think so. Because of that honey-colored blonde oh, hair? Lieutenant, Lieutenant, you always know where the exposed nerve is. Just stop and figure it. Couldn't this also be her way of trying to drive him nuts? As a reporter, I would have to say yes. But, uh, as a man? I don't know. Well, you got a problem, Fred. How are you going to tackle it? As a reporter? Or as a man? <laughs> Good morning. Oh, Fred. What are you doing here? 
Won't you ask me to come in? Well, I... You could also offer me a cup of coffee. It's been a long drive on a cold morning. Oh, well, I suppose you might as well come inside. How gracious. I'm sorry. I'm... Uh, well, I'm, I'm still upset, and you should know why. Come into the kitchen. I was just pouring myself a cup. Thanks. Charming place you have here. Thank you. I suppose Tom is generous enough when it comes to money and things. The implication being that he is not generous when it comes to what? Fred, if you insist on talking about Tom, I'll have to ask you to leave. Okay. Let's talk about you. No. We can't talk about me either. What can we talk about? The weather, politics, sports. You'd be surprised I'm a very well-informed person. We could talk about art. Or literature? I didn't come here to talk about those things. I know why you came here. Do you? Fred, I'm a married woman. But you're not a happily married woman. I'm happy enough. Okay. Let me tell you why I'm here. As a reporter, that is. It doesn't happen very often that you get a chance to be in on a story before it's a story. You follow me? No. Last night, all I could have gotten out of it might have been a squib on the back page, or maybe nothing. But something's happening here. Something's building. I don't know what it is. But one of you is lying. One of you is trying to destroy the other. And you think you can stop it? Oh, no, that's not my job. But there's going to be an explosion. And I want to be there when it blows. Because then, I'll have a story. And that's all this is. That's all I am to you. A story. I was talking as a reporter... But as a man... Yes? As a man, I'd... I'd like to help you, Hattie. Even if it meant losing your story? Yes. I'd like to believe that. Why can't you? I tried to warn you, Fred. Look, we had all that last night. I can't warn you anymore, but remember, I did warn you. Yeah, sure. Don't brush it aside, Fred. Hattie, on the general subject of warnings... I've had a few in my day, from gangsters, from politicians. I mean from people who had clout. But I did warn you. Look, if you want me to, I'll sign a receipt. Let the record show that you warned me. You were right. He is trying to destroy me. Ah, finally. Why? I don't know. Okay, let's go through the standards. Is he after your money? I don't have any. Another woman? I don't think so. Is he tired of you? I don't know. Well... None of this is very helpful. I'm sorry. What was this business you were giving me back in the station house about your perfect marriage, about your perfect husband? Because he is. It's just... Well, now and then he, he imagines things like last night. What's now and then? Oh, for every few months. One time he stranded me up in Maine. Another time we were supposed to go to Europe. He told me he would be delayed and to get on the plane he would make the next one. And there I was, all by myself in Paris. He denied everything. Has he seen a doctor? Yes. And? It hasn't done any good. Is he overworked? Oh, yes. Well, maybe he needs a long vacation. I'm sure of it. It all sounds pretty simple to me. Except for one little item. Why have you insisted on warning me? Because it was the right thing to do. I don't understand. First, you imply that everything is so simple. Then when I start to believe it, you drop a little suggestion that throws me off balance. I, I can't seem to get anything definite out of you. Oh, but you did. What was that? A warning. Lieutenant Carroll. Hey, Lieutenant. How did you know I was going to ask you about the part? That honey blonde hair. Does it really show that much? Hell, you are hooked. You know something? That's true. And she may even be playing me like a fish. So what can I do for you? Well, no crime has been committed yet. But you can bet there's one on the way. Well, till then, we're handcuffed around here. Sure, but you got all the facts. What facts? I mean, I mean you can get at them in a routine way. Work up both of them. Some past histories. That's spending the tax. You spend the taxpayer's money every day. Something's ready to blow up there. Just be ready for it. That's all I'm asking. Actually, Fred, if you want the truth, we've already started. And? Keep in touch. 
Yeah? They said you're in this office. Well, look who's here. Tom, Tom, the piper, son. Come on in, sir. Mr. Peterson, I've decided to tell you everything. Because... Because I know you're in love with my wife. Oh, wait a minute. Now, there are all kinds of meaningless expressions. Wait a minute, see here, hold on, or if you... Let's dispense with them. You can't accuse me. I don't accuse you. I state a fact. Well, now, let, let's be fair. I only met your wife last night. I, I admit she's attractive. Uh, I don't even know her. <laughs> That's what I told him. That's what you told who? The last guy. The last guy she was married to. <sighs> I wish I knew how to start this. Well... Start at the beginning. Okay. I'm an accountant. You're a reporter. Both of us are men of the world. I, I mean this world. You live on facts. I live on figures. So how can I tell you? How can I expect you to believe me when I say... that Hetty... isn't a human being at all? She isn't? No. She's a witch. A witch. Yes, that's what he said. A witch. But how can it be? Wasn't all that witch business over and done with more than 200 years ago? Well, that's what we intend to find out shortly when I return with Act Three. Parsons and Fred Peterson sit in a newspaper office. Both are young, alert, stylishly dressed, every bit the modern, sophisticated men of today. And yet, the subject, the very serious subject under discussion is witchcraft, of all things. Well, it isn't every day a man accuses his wife of being a witch. It isn't every day a man finds out he's married to one. I can only say... It's incredible. I know. That's what I said when he told me. When who told you? The last guy. Tell me about the last guy. I met Hetty on a cruise ship about five years ago. She said her husband had just somehow disappeared. She was distraught. <laughs> you know, she does the distraught bit to perfection. I know nothing of the kind. What happened? Had he, had he fallen overboard? Well, that's... That's what she made everybody think. Till we got a radiogram from shore. He claimed he knew nothing about the trip. Well, either he had boarded the boat or he hadn't. Okay, let's get all of that cleared away. There was a ticket in his name. There were some people who claimed they had seen him. The trouble is, there was a pretty drunk bond voyage party. Most everybody was in no shape to remember anything. Oh, yes. Yes, the steward did claim to have seen him aboard, but... But? I'm convinced the steward was bribed. So I bought her story. I fell in love with her. Just as you did. And I helped her kill him. Just as you're going to help her kill me. You know what I think? I know what you think. You think I'm a nut. You could look it up. Five years ago, Stacy's Mountainville Lodge in the Adirondacks. She called me. She was desperate. Come up here. He's going to kill me. I flew up. I found them. They were near a cliff. She was screaming for help. I started fighting him off. I I guess he slipped. He, he fell over the side. He was killed. Look it up. Coroner's office. You'll see. An accident. Let's assume I buy all this. How does it make her a witch? Oh. She told me. She'll tell you afterwards. She's a witch. She falls in love with men, gets tired of them, and destroys them. I think you must I know. be... I know. I know. I'm here to warn you. But I'm going to kill her first. Let me get you a cup of coffee. You're a fool... I'm here to save your life. Sure, sure. Okay. Look her up. I mean that. See if you can find a trace of her. See if you can find out where or when she was born, who her parents were. She has absolutely no background. I tell yeah, you... Don't, 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 don't oh, get excited. Lord, this is all so familiar. 
All of this is what he said to me. And what I said to him. Back there, before I killed him. Now, nobody's going to kill anybody. I don't know you. But you look like a nice guy. Take my advice. Save yourself. Save yourself. I'm not sure I should be here with you tonight, Fred. Well, you wouldn't let me visit you at home. Oh, it just wouldn't look right. Yeah, but it's all on the level. I'm a newspaper man. It's business. I'm doing a story. I had a very proper upbringing. Where were you raised, Hetty? I'd rather not talk about it. Why? Well, I told you it was proper. But it wasn't happy. I shouldn't say this, but there were times when I thought my parents were ogres. <coughs> Fred, is something wrong? No, 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 no. She, I, I just hope I, I, I didn't spell anything on you. No. I didn't have a happy childhood. I, I don't like to discuss it. Here's something we should discuss. I spoke with Tom this morning. I think I know what he told you. So far out, I even hesitate to mention it. But obviously, he believes it. I insisted that he see a psychiatrist. In fact, we both went. And it's the doctor's opinion that Tom is riddled with guilt. You see, he thinks he murdered Larry. Larry? My first husband. But Larry was a brute. I was very young and... We're really too young to know anything about people. Larry was a drunk. I didn't know that either. And when he had a few, he would abuse me. Well, I shouldn't have done it, but I was terrified. I called Tom, and he came up and got into a fight with Larry, and... Well, there was that accident. But why should he get that far-out notion about you? According to the doctor, it had to be something... Well, something he could live with, something that could justify what he did, and he really has a vivid imagination. It strikes me as a... Very sober-minded person, aside He was from... a lit major at college. He became an accountant because he had to make a living. I... I don't know what I'm going to do about him, Fred. I've had so much trouble in my life, and... He's really a wonderful guy, and I love him. Why does he want to destroy us? Why should he have a guilty conscience about Larry? Whatever happened was in self-defense. Well, look... Everything will turn out all right. Oh, you're only saying that because you have to say something. No, I believe it. Hello? Tom? Yes, it's Tom. But you said you were working late. Well, I am. I just took a break for dinner. Join you? Please. Fred, you obviously didn't hear a word I said this morning, did you? I heard every word. Heard them all and listened to none? Tom, you're not well, and I think we... Oh, I know what you think. You think we should go away for a rest and all that? Forget it. I know what I have to do. And I'm going to do it. Poor Fred. I feel sorry for you. You're in love with her. To keep the record straight, I'm a reporter. There's a story here. I aim to get it. Sure, sure. That's what you tell yourself. Let's go along with you, Tom. Suppose what you say is true. Suppose she's what you say she is. Why not walk out? Get a divorce. I can't. Why? I hope you never find out. You see, she destroys you. She takes away your capacity to love. Your feelings, your mind. It's as if you are only just nourishment for her. And when everything you have to give is gone, she discards you. For someone else. Tom, for your own sake, I think you should be under a doctor's care in a hospital. I suppose I should. But I want to save you. It'll make up for Larry. I must apologize, Fred, for exposing you to all this. I shouldn't have come here. But you wanted to expose him to all this. That's why you came here. You knew I always eat here when I work late. Tom, I'll do anything you want. Just tell me. <laughs> Disappear. As a supernatural person, you can arrange that without any problem. Please, Fred, go now. Leave us alone. But I don't want to... He's my problem. I have to live with it. And if you stay, well... An audience always excites him. Ah, now, 
look who finally showed up. What happened to that Nobel Prize for Journalism you were working on? Tenet, there is no Nobel Prize for Journalism. Oh. Well, what happened anyhow? I got off it all. Couldn't make heads or tails. Well, we're still on it. As a matter of fact, information keeps pouring in all the time. On her? On him. Funny duck. He was always interested in spirits, that kind of thing. He wrote his master's thesis on something called uh, demonology. Well, there's nothing there for me. As a man or a reporter? Both. You know, I've been married ten years, and I've never been tempted. But if I could be, she could do it. Oh, that dame or something. I'm surprised at you, Lieutenant. But there's hope for you. If what you say about the husband is true, he winds up uh, in the loony bin, and after a respectable interval, she could be yours. That's what's in your mind, right? You are the most cynical person I know. Come off it. We're two of a kind. I'd even wait for her myself. <laughs> Lieutenant Carroll. Is uh, Fred Peterson there, please? Hold on, I'll see. It's uh, the girl you love. Cut it out. Okay, the girl we love. You hear? Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm here. Take it. Hello? Fred, I'm scared. What's the matter, Hetty? Don't ask any questions. Just come to my place. Quickly. Come in, Fred. Oh, darling, I'm so glad you're here. Hetty, Hetty, why are you shaking like that? I'm frightened. I'm so frightened. Please, please, Hetty, calm down. I'm here. Everything is going to be all right. I know it. I know. It's wrong for me to talk to you like this. To feel like this. But I, I can't help no, it. No, no, we'll work it out. Somehow we'll work it out. No, no, no. Why are you scared? I. He asked me to take his suit to the cleaners this morning. And I found this in his pocket. To a seat? Read it. From Carrington's one double action Danforth Wilson revolver, caliber thirty two. He bought a gun. Don't you see he bought a gun? All right. Why would he buy a gun if he didn't want to kill me? Well, I think we have enough to interest the police now. Are you sure about that? Stop. Well, answer the question, Fred. What do you expect from the police? I have a permit for this gun. I have every right to own it. Now look, Tom, I get very nervous when people point guns at me. Maybe it's unreasonable, but do you, uh, do you mind putting that, that thing away? Well, I will. After I use it. No, Tom. Don't be a fool. You're not a killer. I always thought that. So just now... Tom, listen. Let's say you're right. That she is a witch, okay? Don't you see? You couldn't kill her anyhow. You'd empty the gun at her. It wouldn't mean a thing. Fine. Why don't we find out? I won't no. let you. Get away from me, Fred. No. Come on, stop. 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 Again? Call a doctor, Hetty. Oh. oh, what for? Oh, you poor sucker. You think she... Oh, she's not worth it. Uh. You think she's paradise? <laughs> she is. Ah, oh, she is. But it doesn't last. It doesn't last. And then she'll kill you. She'll kill you too. Tom. He's he's dead. Tom. You saw you saw there was nothing I I could do. I know. I know. Better call, please. <laughs> Lieutenant Carroll. Lieutenant, it's Fred. Hey, Fred, I got news for you. What I mean is I have absolutely no news for you. Lieutenant, listen to me. You know, we, we drew a complete blank on that dame. We trace her back to St. Louis City Hall, where she married a guy named Larry Bellows. She gave her home address as Charterville, Illinois. But there's no such place. Listen, Lieutenant. It's as if this dame just materialized out of thin air. No background at all. Wait a minute. 
Eddie. Who are you? Hello? Oh, Fred. Fred, why did you call? Who are you, Eddie? Fred, what's on your mind? Eddie. I warned you three times, Fred. I warned you three times. And how many warnings would you have needed? Or heeded? That's the trouble. When they have honey blonde hair, it's so hard to take them seriously. A mistake. You should always take every woman seriously. We'll be back shortly. Are there really witches? Everyone must keep his own counsel on the matter. However, if you should happen upon a damsel in distress, and she has honey blonde hair and baby blue eyes, remember, we warned you three times. Our cast included Joan Loring, Mason Adams, Tom Keena, Alan Manson, and Sam Gray. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. terrifying world of the imagination. I am a man normally filled with the milk of human kindness, but prepared, I'm afraid, to curdle your blood with a tale not of life and death, but rather death and life. I offer you one small comfort. It could hardly happen today. But in the last century, on the old Montgomery estate in Maryland, in the great dark rambling house called Westerly. It was easier to be marked for death than in this one. Yes, Mother. You look at home in your coffin. Sleep fast. It's taken many years. But you've made your son a very happy man. It's all mine at last. Westerly, I'm running the jewels. I'm my own man. How I've hated you the way you kept me on a leash like some old hound dog. Well, now the money's mine. And you'll hardly need those rings they've let you wear to your grave. I'll take them so I can buy them. You'll hang on to them uh, even if that. Uh, uh, you're alive. You're not dead. Help me now. I should have known you'd come back to haunt me. Even before we got you to the grave. Our mystery drama, Cold Storage, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Ruby Dee and John Baraglay. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. Robbing a grave 
Many years before Buford Montgomery found himself engaged in essentially the same activity, were every bit as shocked when the corpse whose rings they were tearing off suddenly sat up, alive. An epileptic seizure in other times could counterfeit death. The ghouls, of course, had a recourse. They ran away. Buford Montgomery has to stay and face his problem. You, but when you put me down... When, when I'm ready. I am quite able to walk. I, I want to make sure you don't run. What are you talking about? What, what are you doing locking me in? No, no, no. Keep away from me. It's all right, Mother. I'm not going to harm you. I, I heard you standing over me in that coffin. I, I want to... I need Dr. Wayne. That doddering old numbskull. He almost had you buried alive. You know he signed your death certificate. But how could he? I am alive. Oh, yes. I'm quite satisfied you are no ghost. But what what happened? Another of your epileptic seizures. Oh. We were all convinced this one was fatal. At last. Only it wasn't. Quite a disappointment to my beloved son. Well... At least I know now where we stand. Now, you open that door and send Hannah up to me. Not yet, Mother. Why? Because, you see, we don't really know just quite how we stand, do we? Buford, don't... Don't you look at me like that. How was I looking, Mama dear? You... You want me dead back in that coffin. I want all the things I thought were finally mine. The house, the estate, the money, and most, oh, most of all, the freedom to be a man. Look at me, Mama. (laughs) Listen to me call you that, Mama. A grown man, 38 years old, tied to his mother's apron strings like like some sniveling little boy. I I never meant to keep you tied down. Oh, yes, you did. You even did it with the judge. Father's life wasn't his own either. You killed him. You? You are mad. Keep away. Keep away. You want to kill me. I'm not going to kill you, Mama. You know I haven't got the strength of will for that. Oh, oh, of course you won't, son. But you can have anything you want now we've had this little talk. Now, now please get Hannah like a good boy. Oh, no, Mama. I don't need you anymore. You left me everything in your will. But I'm not dead. To all the world except me, you are. And you're going to stay that way. If you come one step closer, I'll scream. No one will hear you. Not in this big old house. Westerly's thick walls have no ears. What What are you going to do to me? You'll see, Mother. You'll see. Look, you... You're going to put me back in that coffin and... Marry me, you lie. Yes. I haven't any choice now. Please, please, please. Don't worry. You'll be quite comfortable. I'm going to bury you alive. But not in the coffin. Anna? Yes, Master Buford? I want you here, in the hall. What is it, sir? Where's William? He's in the stable, Master, grooming the horses for the funeral tomorrow. You want I should fetch him? I... No, not yet. Uh, Sit down. I want to talk to you. Yes, sir? Now, where to begin? Uh, uh, Hannah, you were mighty beholden to my father, weren't you? Judge Montgomery was a fine man. Was very kind to you and your son. The judge was powerful good to me and William. And my mother? Mrs. Montgomery is a fine lady. It's been a privilege to have served her as housekeeper. And will you consider it a privilege to serve me in the same capacity? If you want me, sir. And William? Where I go, William goes. You know, he's just a, a, a great big overgrown baby. Has to be cared for like one. Or they'd shut him away somewhere, is hmm? I wouldn't ever let them do that to my boy. He couldn't stand being shut in. He'd... Why, he'd... You wouldn't let them do that to him, would you, Master Buford? Not 
If I can count on you to help me. You can, sir. You can. Well, uh, what about William? He does what I tell him. He's old as you are, but he has the mind of a child. I'd want to be absolutely sure of both of you. I don't understand you, Master Buford. Then I'll make myself plainer. I think you must have always hated my mother. Why did you stay on after Father died? I stayed because I... Where else could I go? You're sure it wasn't because you were afraid? Afraid of what? Not of, Hannah. For. <gasps> for William. Right? Oh, don't look so terrified and, and trapped. I know it all, Hannah. I know it all. Master Buford, I... How you must really hate us all. Even father at the end. Not the judge. Never the judge. Even after what he made you sign? What would the judge ever have wanted me to sign? A confession that you saw your son William commit a murder ten years ago. Oh. How did you know? It's one of the advantages of my dear mother's unexpected death. It was among the papers the lawyer turned over to me. So she did know. All these years. <laughs> How could Randolph have done that to me? You know why. You were an eyewitness. And you know that William wasn't alone. It was an accident. And you were only boys. Pretty old for boys, Hannah. We were both going on 19. And the Copley kid was only 15. It was only my father being a judge that saved us all. Any jury in horse country like this could have told that boy's neck wasn't broken by any fall from a horse. The finger marks were gouged into the flesh. The rope burns were raw on his wrist. Why did you do it, Master Buford? Not I, Hannah. Remember? William was the culprit. William didn't know what he was doing. You egged him on. If I did, I didn't mean it to go so far. William didn't... Doesn't know his own strength. What does it matter? It's nearly 20 years ago. Why did you rake up old ashes? There are certain things I have to be sure of. What? In spite of everything, your complete loyalty to me. I have little choice if you have any confession. I have it. In your own handwriting. And William's scrawl, too. I'm going to ask you to stretch your conscience further. Come with me. No, no, Master Buford. Don't bring me to the coffin. I don't want to look at her. Stop that. I don't want to. Stop that. Here. Look. Open your eyes. Oh. It's empty. She's gone. What have you done with her? She's in her bedroom. Upstairs. What's she? Ah. <laughs> uh... I'm afraid that blind old boggler, Dr. Wayne, slightly exaggerated my mother's untimely end. You mean she's alive? And unfortunately quite well. <laughs> I see the news is as disappointing to you as it was to me. Oh, don't try to hide it, Hannah. You know you hated her quite as much as I. I won't deny it. The humiliation. The day-by-day day degradations your mother has put me through all these years since your father died. I can never forgive her for them. I'm glad to hear it. When she was dead, I was glad. God forgive me. It was one of the happiest days of my life. And mine. That's why she's going to stay dead, Hannah. You're mad. You can't murder your own mother. Nothing is further from my mind. No. Dear Mama will come to no physical harm. You and William will see to it that her bodily needs are well taken care of. And I, as complete master of Westerly at last, will see to it in turn that you and William are taken care of. What are you going to do with her? First of all, Hannah, you're going to explain to William. Then bring him here so we can nail up this coffin and the burial services can be completed tomorrow. Master you no, you can't. Better tell William to bring a sack of meal or corn. Won't do to have the coffin too light. How, how on earth can you hide your mother from, from everyone? <laughs> on earth. That's very apt. I'll tell you what we're going to do with her, Hannah. Just what we do with the roots and the preserves. We're going to put Mama in cold storage. <laughs> Mr. 
Make sure to drive them home, William. Do see machine burying a whole good sack of good feed. I picked up the worthiest what I could find. That's enough now. Finish up. Finish now. Got the ladder, Hannah? Yes, sir. All right. Did you strip the bed in the spare room, Hannah? Yes, sir, I did. William, you go on up there and bring that bed and all the furniture downstairs to the old hidey hole, right? Sure will. Where's this, this hidey hole? William could tell you as good as me. Or better. He's the one who found it. Must be, oh, um, 15 years ago. 16, Master Buford. That was the year Miss Prudence dropped her first foal. That's when old Mr. Todd Hunter, the vet man, told me all about his daddy and your grandfather and how they dug out the hidey hole and made it out of big room like a station on the Underground Railroad. William, go see to the furniture. Yes, sir. Take me a while to get the bed apart. Take your time. The Underground Railroad? You mean this was a slave station? To hide out escape slaves being passed to the north? What it was. But you can't put your mother in a place like that. Why not? She spent her lifetime trying to turn the clock back. Make a slave of everyone else. Why shouldn't it be her turn? For a change. How sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. As King Lear had occasion to remark. Still, on the record... Mama is not much of a prize either. Let's leave her in cold storage until we return shortly with Act Two. In the weeks that passed, Mrs. Randolph Price Montgomery is finding her quarters somewhat less elegant than she liked. But at least they are less confining than a coffin. Buford, her son and now heir, has been living as high as he promised himself in cutting a swath as the county's most sought-after bachelor. I declare, Buford, I thought I'd never be able to coax you away from all the other ladies. Nancy Lee, they may have had my arms, but my heart was with you. Well, I'd have felt a lot sure of that if I'd had your name a little more often in my car. I just don't want us to get talked about too much. Well, why ever not? Would you be ashamed to have your name linked with mine? Why, Nancy Lee, you know better than that. Aren't you going to sit with me, Susan? Oh, why, why, sure, honey. Hold my hand. Just lies in mine like a little bird. Now that's more like my beautiful. Kiss me. Angel. Still the same old thrill. Gives me goosebumps all over. Oh, that's nice. I wouldn't want to think I'd lost the power to get you going. Why would you think that? Well, I'll tell you, Buford. I thought when your mother died, it would give us a chance to be closer than ever. I mean, since we could come right out in the open. I didn't think it would stop you chasing after every pretty girl in sight. I wouldn't take a one of them. Or exchange any of them for you. Now, I'm right glad to hear you say that, Sugar, because I'm afraid you're not going to be a bachelor anymore. Huh? I got something to tell you. You're going to have to go back to being a family man again, I'm afraid. What? What, what, what are you saying? That, that you're going to be a daddy. Aren't you proud? Good Lord, I... Uh, are, you, are you sure? <laughs> that I'm in a family way? Well, it's very easy for a girl to be sure of that. Well, uh, what, what, are we, what are we going to do? Well, with Mama gone, there's no problem at all. You're just going to have to make an honest woman of me. My parents surely won't object. And <laughs> you wouldn't want the colonel to come after you with a gun, knowing that my daddy is the best shot in South Carolina. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Nancy Lee. You... Oh, Sugar, you know I'm only funning. And I know you're going to be every bit as happy as I am once you get used. To it. Oh, honey, aren't you just thrilled to death? We're going to get married. Come in. Excuse me, Master Beauty. 
What is it, Hannah? It's about Mrs. Montgomery. She isn't that yet. I meant your mother, sir. Oh. Oh, what about her? She keeps asking for you. Well, tell her I'm... Just don't tell her anything. You haven't said anything about the wedding tomorrow. No, sir, but... uh, But what? About your mother. She... She wants to talk to you. And it does seem so inhumane to keep her locked up alone. She sees you or William every day, doesn't she? Yes. Her quarters are comfortable and clean, aren't they? Yes. She's in perfectly good health? Oh, yes, never better. More's the pity. Well, then? She's... She's lonely. So was I all those years she had me under her thumb. And I'm not going back to that. By tomorrow, I'm going to have my own woman. And a beauty at that. Mother's not going to spoil that for me. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir. Good. Now get out of here. And take the whiskey carap with you and fill it up. It's almost empty again. Yes, sir, Master Buford. Sir? William? Yes, Mama? Take this carafe and fill it with Master Buford's bourbon and bring it back to him in his study. Yes, sir. <laughs> I reckon old Master Buford's getting himself licked up for the bachelor party. <laughs> I reckon he's trying to build himself some Dutch courage. What do you mean, Ma? I mean... I don't think he exactly figured on getting tied up again when he cut his mama's apron string. You. Mm. Oh, look at that. It started into rain. Such a pretty night, too. Mm. Let's go on up to bed, hmm? My husband... All he ever seems to think of now he's made me his little goods and chattel. Nancy Lee, all I mean was I'm tired. Tired of me after two short weeks? Now, you know I didn't mean that. Well, come in and lay your head on Mama's breast. Don't say that. Well, heavens, don't be so sensitive. Your Mama's dead and gone. Yes. Although sometimes, I swear to goodness, I get the feeling in this rickety old house she's still sort of around. Oh? Huh? What makes you think that? Well, don't jump so, darling. It's just a, just a spooky feeling. Maybe you and me should have gotten rid of Wesley and gone back on to South Carolina with Mom and Papa. No. We can't leave here. Well, all right, sugar. Don't take on so. I, I, I didn't mean to jump at you. Oh, of course you didn't. You're just so kind to little old me, and you were so generous to lend the Colonel all that money to go back south with Mama to build up our old, lovely old plantation again. It must be the size of half the state what it's costing to restore it. Well, it had gotten run down, sort of, but you've nothing to worry about, Buford. You'll get the money back. Of course, of course, Nancy Lee. <gasps> What is it? Oh, this old porch. It, it's starting to leak like a sieve. I'll have William look at it in the morning. That big old lame brain. Buford, if we're going to stay here at Westerly, I want some changes made. I'd like to do some rebuilding. We can discuss that in the and morning. I want some new servants. I don't want that silly old William and Hannah around. They've got to go. No. But Buford... I... Whatever happens, William and Hannah stay. And we stay. That's final. My Buford, you are so masterful when you get mad. I could just swoon. <laughs> Come on, let's go on up to bed. And I'll show you just how wonderful it is to be married. I came out with your mother's train, Master Buford, and she nearly caught me. What does Sam Hill was Nancy Lee doing in the cellar? I don't know. She didn't see anything? I'm sure not. Does she suspect anything? I don't think I... Damn that woman. That's her now. Get out, Hannah. I'll handle this. Yes, sir. Nancy Lee, what the devil were you doing down in the cellar? No need to take on, so I was... I was just making up my mind where to put the wine cellar. What wine cellar? The one we're going to build in the back there. What for? Well, I intend to start entertaining, having guests to stay. Well, bring this house alive. No. No wine cellar and no guests. And you stay out of that downstairs. Don't you order me around. I'll do what I want in my own house. What did you mean by locking me out of our bedroom last night? I don't allow anyone who can't behave like a gentleman in my room. If you think just by withholding your favors from me, you can get your own way. You listen to me, Buford. One way or another, I always get my own way, and don't you forget it. 
Master Buford, Master Buford, you can't sleep here on the floor, sir. Well, uh, uh, oh, yes. Uh, uh, got to, Hannah. Um, wife won't let me in, in bedroom. Come on, sir. You've been drinking. I've made you up a bed in one of the guest rooms. Want to sleep on bedroom? Not guest room. <laughs> Ironic, isn't it, Hannah? Don't have much luck with, with the ladies, huh? Out of the frying pan into the fire. <laughs> she, she's got to go. Except can't. Because of baby. Got child to think of. Can't figure that one out. I... William, is my horse ready? Morning, Nancy Lee. My, ain't you the prettiest thing? I asked about my horse. Oh, yes, this Nancy. I combed and curved and shined that old horse. Would you bring him around to the front? Yes, sir, Miss Nancy. And the name is Mrs. Montgomery. Yes, Mrs. Montgomery. Oh, get out of my sight. When you bring him around, let me know. I'll be in the parlor. Buford? Here. Hannah said you wanted to see me. I want to talk to you. I'm afraid I don't have time. I'm going riding. That's what I want to talk to you about. Do you think it's wise? What? All this riding in your condition. In my condition? Oh, man. I'd near forgotten. Forgotten? How could you forget the baby you're carrying? I'm sure I wouldn't if I were. Only I'm not. I never had one. What? Oh, Buford, don't splutter so. If you'd half a brain in your head, you'd have realized that long ago. It, it was all a trick to get me to marry you. At the time, you seemed such a catch, and the competition was a little heavy, so I thought I'd just make sure of you. And it worked. I'm really sorry to have disappointed you about the child. <laughs> disappointed? You don't know how relieved I am. Now there's no problem. What do you mean, no problem? To end this marriage, to get a divorce. You think that's no problem? It shouldn't be. I'm prepared to make a reasonable settlement. And just what would you consider reasonable, Mr. Montgomery? We can waive the money I loaned your father and call it a day. <laughs> the money you loaned my father? That wasn't a loan. That was a little payoff for a nice background of southern gentility to trap me a man. The colonel and his wife are just as phony as I am, dear heart. And they are long gone. I'm where I want to be with a name I like, and I'm not giving it up for anyone. You are never going to get rid of little Nancy Lee. No how, no way at all. Now, if you'll excuse me, dear husband, I... Why, Hannah. Hello. Did you get a nice earful? The door was open, Mrs. Montgomery, and William asked me to come in here and tell you that he's waiting outside with your horse. He could have told me himself. And I hope that damn beast throws her and breaks her neck. All right, Hannah, what are you waiting for? It's your mother, sir. She's in a state. She insists on seeing you. No. I've had enough of Montgomery women for one day. Tell her I... No. Forget that, Hannah. I've changed my mind. I think I will pay Mama a visit. I have a little surprise for her. But you can't be so cruel, Buford. Keeping me here locked up like a... like an animal. You, you've you got to let me go. You know I can't do that, Mother. I've explained again and again why you can't suddenly turn up alive. Oh, but I can't stand it anymore. It's like being buried alive. Oh, oh Buford, it's so... so lonely. I know that, Mama. <laughs> and I know it just plain isn't fair. So I thought of a solution. Oh, <laughs> what, dear? How would you like to have a nice, permanent companion? Did I make an unguarded statement that Buford was no match for the lady? Perhaps in one sense that's true. But in another, well, it seems that Nancy Lee is going to have cause to regret her match with Buford. We'll find that out shortly when we return with Act Three. It's one thing to get away with disposing of someone already legally certified as dead. 
and supposedly suitably interred. Nancy Lee is another problem. She can't have a convenient epileptic seizure. Can Buford get away with it? Nancy Lee, I've been thinking about us. Don't waste your time. Nothing's going to change. I've got nobody but you and nowhere in the whole wide world to go. I'm a permanent fix to Buford. Oh, I know that, honey. And I was wrong to think anything else. Don't you know I really want you here with all my heart? On my terms. Don't you try to fancy talk me. Won't you please let me tell you what I was thinking about? If you make it short... And sweet. What I was going to suggest, just to clear the air, sort of, and give us both a chance to get a new perspective, was a trip. I don't want to go anywhere with you. Oh, I, I, I didn't mean to gather. I meant just you alone, sugar. Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia. You could buy yourself a whole new wardrobe. L like, like it was the trousseau you never really had. Oh, Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia. Even Paris, France, if you want. Paris, France. Oh, beautiful. Do you mean it? Anything's worth trying just to work things out for us. And to prove I mean it, you, you just go tell all your friends and everyone around that you're on your way. Oh, won't I make them scared? Worm with envy. Washington, Philadelphia, Paris, France. Then you'll go? What woman will pass up the chance? Well, I'll ride everywhere this week and let everyone know. Just one thing, Buford, you ought to understand. Well, what's that, sugar? This doesn't change anything. I'm still going to spend the rest of my life right here in this house. Oh, I know that, Nancy Lee. I know that for sure. You just can't get away with it. Now, you hush up, Hannah. I'm going to. But what will other people say? There's nothing for them to say. Nancy Lee went off on a little trip, and she never came back. Master Buford, you're flying in the face of God. Hannah, to the devil with it. Now, you do as I say, hear? Yes, sir. Now, you and William have already got the extra bed set up downstairs, and the chest of drawers and so on. Yes, sir. Fine. Then get busy and take all Ms. Montgomery's clothes downstairs. Shouldn't take you too long. Most of her wardrobe is already packed. What am I going to tell your mother? Ever since we moved the extra furniture in, she's been like to, to drive me out of my mind asking questions. You haven't told her who to expect. You said not to. That's quite right, Hannah. We have to preserve the proprieties. I think it's my place to introduce my mother to my bride. Oh, Miss Montgomery? What is it, Hannah? Master Buford asked me to have you go right downstairs as soon as you got back from riding. But I want a bath and change. He said right away, the moment you got here. Why? He said he had a little surprise for you. Oh, very well. Buford? Nancy Lee? Yes, uh, what do you want me for? Come on down, I'll show you. Oh, for goodness sake. Hold that lantern a little higher, I can't see. Uh, how's that? Better. Right over here by the back wall. Hannah said you had a surprise. Why, Buford, you're going to do it. Do what? Put in my wine cellar while I'm gone. Something like that. Of course, we'll have to build regular bins instead of these old rickety shelves. You know what I thought when I was looking about down here before? Oh, what was that? If we tore down these shelves... Well, what I mean is, I was sort of stepping off the house upstairs... And it's some longer than this cellar. Is it? Yes, I walked off the cellar, too. You suppose there might be any room behind there we could sort of scoop out to make it bigger? Now, why don't you and me just try and find out? Why don't we? Of course, I reckon you'll need help. Oh, I don't think so. It might be quite easy. Like, um, like this, for example. <gasps> it's a secret door. And a room. There's someone in there. A room you're going to be sharing for a long time. No, no. No, I won't go in Oh, there. yes, you will. I, I, I'll scream. You, you'll do as you're told. Oh, Alex, uh, you bit my hand. You, you can't. Get in there. You can't keep me in here. I'll scratch your eyes out. Oh, no, you won't. You'll keep your mouth shut for once and do as you're told. Oh, no, I won't. You wouldn't dare shoot me. Don't tempt me. Your foot... Put that pistol down. <gasps> no. It can't be. Who are you? Don't you remember the first Mrs. Montgomery? But she... Your mother. Your mother's dead. Up 
popular misconception. Let's just keep this private, shall we? You... You really judge Mon Montgomery's wife? Certainly. Buford, what is this slut doing here? Now, Mama, that's not nice. Isn't this that Nancy Lee person I warned you to stay away from? Yes, sir. Maybe about the one time you were right, Mama. Well, get her out of here. I don't want her. And I demand you release me, too. You know I can't do that. The best I can do is provide you with Nancy Lee. You're not going to lock me up with this horrid old woman. Now, that's no way to talk to your mother-in-law. Her uh, uh, what? Oh, I'm sorry, Mama. In all the excitement, I forgot to tell you. Nancy Lee's my bride. We got married. Oh. That makes you both, Mrs. Montgomery. <clears throat> that's how come I thought it would work out real nice to have you roommates. Sort of keep it all in the family. Ma! Ma! Take the lie, William. You startled me so I almost burnt my hand on the stove. Ma, what are we going to do? What is it, son? Here. Here, sit down. It's shaking all over. You know that big old stone you wanted down in the preserve cellar to make a table of? For making cornmeal and such? Yes. Well, a while ago I took it to bring it on down for you. You lifted that heavy stone by yourself? It's what happened when I was down there. What? Well, I, I didn't have no light. And I didn't hear Master Buford come on down there. But all of a sudden, I see him light a lantern. And as far as I can say anything, Mrs. Montgomery come on down there to join him. I know. I sent her down there. You? You knew what he was going to do to her? Son, you got to understand. I can't help myself. You knew he was going to throw her in that hidey hole with old Mrs. Montgomery? I knew. But she's so pretty. And he hurt her, Ma. Master Buford hurt her. He took that little girl that's like a, like a little chickadee bird. And he's going to shut her up in there. Don't think about it now, son. I, I got to think on it. I couldn't be shut up, Ma. I couldn't be shut up nowhere. I know that, son. I'll just take my own throat with my hands like I've done with, with someone a long time ago. I... Don't, William. Don't do that to yourself. <laughs> no. Not to me. To Master Buford. The master Buford, unless he lets her go. That's who I got to. No, William, no. Listen to me. Let me explain. Let me go, Ma. Let go. William, you've got to understand that I... Ma? Ma, are you all right? I hope I, I, I didn't hurt you. Ma? No. You all right? Just sleeping. I'll wake you, Ma. I'll wake you just as soon as I set that poor little bird free. I spent my life trying to get free of you, Mama. And I did. Then I got myself trapped again. Now I've got to get free of Nancy Lee, too. Goodbye. You'll never see me again. You can't leave me here with this old woman. I can't be shut up anymore. You've been drinking again. You look drunk. You... I feel drunk. Drunk with relief. <laughs> Hannah and William are all you'll ever see from now on. As far as I care, oh. you could both rot. Oh. What's that funny smell? My head. I need a drink. What? Who's that? It's me, Master Buford. I'm sorry for... for what I got to do. <laughs> Master Buford. <laughs> Master Buford. I didn't mean to do nothing, Master. I didn't mean to do nothing. It was just... a bird has to fly free. You can't keep it locked up. William, 
William? Are you down there? I'm here, Ma. What are you doing? What's happened? Where's Master Buford? I'm glad you woke up, Ma. Something's happened to Master Buford. Oh, my God. Move aside. Let me see. I didn't mean him no harm. It was just Miss Nancy. I didn't want to hurt him, Ma. Ma? He's dead. Oh, William. William, you killed him. I never even touched him, Ma. How would you know? Poor, twisted mind. How would you know? Heaven help me. What are we going to do now? I've got to think. Well, I'm all packed. And William is taking my things down to the carriage now. What about you, Mother? I suppose you have to call me that. We might as well get used to it. Just as you have to try to sound a little fonder when you talk to your daughter, Nancy Lee. Very well, Nancy Lee. And I not only am all packed, but my trunks have already been taken to the railroad station. All ready for our new life. Yes. Oh, come on now. This was all worked out before the funeral. And you've had a lovely time of it, haven't you? Playing the bereaved widow, being wined and dined in sad farewell. Well, I had to stay hidden at home. Well, you could scarcely come popping out of the grave without creating a legal snarl. I know, I know. It's better this way. I hope we can smuggle me out successfully. At night, in Hannah's cape, there'll be no question. Hmm. Nothing left to be done. I don't think so. Hannah and William will stay with the house until the estate is sold. And the lawyer will forward us the money wherever we settle. <laughs> wherever we settle. You and I. Not much of a life to look forward to. It's the best your son left us. Your husband. Buford. Buford. Uh, I wonder about his death. Why? The doctor certified it is a heart attack. You don't think, William? Oh, no. William is so simple-minded that if he says he never touched him, he never did. No, it was something else. What? Uh, uh, that was the same doctor who wrote out my death certificate. You don't suppose Buford by any chance could have had epilepsy? It's a disease that does run in the family, you know. If Sarah Montgomery should have been right, then poor Buford went to far more than his just reward. After all, the coffin was already in the ground for over a week. But that's really too horrible a prospect to dwell on, isn't it? I'll return shortly. Before I go, I really do owe you an apology for that quite dreadful picture of poor Buford Montgomery awaking to far more confined quarters than he condemned his mother to. But as a storyteller, you have to agree, the irony is perfect. And then, of course, also, I did promise to curdle your blood. Our cast included John Barragray, Ruby Dee, Bryna Rayburn, Roxy Roker, and Todd Davis. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
Welcome to the sound of suspense, to the fear you can hear. For the next 52 minutes, I will be your trainer. I say trainer because we are concerned with a horse, a remarkable, powerful stallion who not only runs, but who thinks. And what does he think about? In our spine-tingling tale, he will think most about revenge. Go, Spartacus, go! You'll find him. You'll catch him. And what you do, he's yours. Oh, yours. Emily! Emily, here I am. See him, Spartacus. See him. I'm here, Emily. Get him. Well, go, get him. Go, go. <laughs> Our mystery drama, Death Rides a Stallion was written especially for the Radio Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mason Adams. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. big five-year-old chestnut stallion. He's in the prime of his glorious life. He has fire in his eyes and steel springs in his legs. The powerful muscles ripple beneath his shiny, velvety coat. And he also has a mind of his own. He's a rebel who acknowledges no master. That's why he's called Spartacus. But if he has no master, he does have a mistress. A slender, freckle-faced girl named Emily. And he will respond to her slightest touch, her softest whisper. Whoa, Spartacus, right here. <coughs> Steady, boy. Steady. Good boy. Listen, Spartacus, here he comes now. Here I am, Frank. Oh, good morning, Uncle Harry. Oh, Morning, Emily. Do I uh, detect a faint tone of disappointment? Disappointment? Oh, why, Uncle Harry, you're my favorite human being. Oh, I have the impression that you were expecting someone else. Who? Me? Well, I wasn't expecting anybody. Oh. But look, I, I don't say that Lollygag here is in a class with Spartacus, but we challenge you to race. Uh, well... How about here to Parsons Creek? Uh, now? Unless you just want to stand around all day. Yeah, the truth is, Uncle Harry, I I am waiting for somebody. Oh, oh. So that's the secret of your early morning ride. And who is your partner in these assignations? Frank. Oh. Well, there's no accounting for taste, I suppose. I think I'll commune with nature on my own. Oh, Lolly, here. Uncle Harry, wait. Whoa there, Lolly. <laughs> Emily, if everybody listened to you the way the horses do, you could rule the world. Uncle Harry, do you know what I think? No, ma'am. You're too deep for me. I think this morning Frank's going to ask me. Ask you what? Ask me what? Ask me to marry him, of course. Why would Frank do that? Why would he... Oh, I suppose I'm not really pretty enough for a man to ask. No, no, Emily. I, I never meant to imply that I... Why, you're even prettier than Judy. No, I'm not. Nowhere near. Well, it's just that, that I thought... That... Oh, what did you think? Well, Emily, it's, it's, it's obvious that Frank really... What's obvious is that you dislike Frank, and therefore you don't even bother to know him. Frank looks for more than a pretty face. Uh, has he uh, given you any uh, indication? Well, of course he has. Really? Well, what, what did he say? He didn't say anything. Does he have to? It would help. Uncle Harry, I know by the tone of his voice, the way he looks at me, everything.
everything about him. Everything tells me he loves me. And I love him. Oh, how I love him. You think I'm crazy. Uh, I think I'll ride back to the house and have some breakfast. Well, this is the last time I'll bear my soul to you. Darling, look up. I, I, I wouldn't want you to get hurt. I'm a big girl now. You don't know very much about men. Maybe, but I know what I like. Well, sounds like company's coming. Oh, hi. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Emily. Good morning, Frank. Well, look who's here. Kind of early in the day for you, Judy. I know, but we're out to spread the news. What news? Oh, Emily, darling. It's only right that you should be the first to know. After all, you introduced us. Frank and I... We're engaged. And we owe it all to you, Emily. We owe it all to you. And I want you to be my maid of honor. Now, promise. Oh, Emily, darling, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. Judy and I will never forget what you've done for us, Emily. Can you believe this wild man? This fantastic Frank? He asked me just five minutes ago. I mean, I've been proposed to in my time, but never on horseback. <laughs> <laughs> it's another Judy Montgomery fabulous first. Frank, let's ride back to the house and tell Mother... See you. Emily. They used to say, always a bridesmaid. But this time I'm doing better. Emily, I, I, I tried to I'm tell you. I'm honor. Maybe I'm getting there. Emily, he's not worth it. He is to me. Darling, please don't ride this morning. Why not? You're upset. I'm not upset. Oh, I can tell. All right, I'm upset. Emily, you'll get over it. I'm over it now. Emily, dear, one day you'll, you'll meet... I'll never get over Emily, it! Emily, believe me. Let's go, Spartacus! Go! Oh, Emily! Emily, wait! Emily! Go! Emily! Come on, Spartacus! Emily, Emily! Come on! Slow down! Faster, Spartacus! Faster! Emily, Emily, you hurt your heart! Faster, Spartacus! Emily, please, you kill yourself! Go, Spartacus, go! Emily! Emily, go! Jump, Spartacus, up! Sit down. Thank you. Wait till I shut up this music. Oh, let it play. It was her favorite rhapsody. So it was. Well, how are the ladies? Well, Judy and Mrs. Montgomery have gone to bed. It's been a terrible ordeal. Mm. But with the coroner, wh why was all that necessary? You have to establish the cause of death. Well, wasn't it obvious? What a thoroughly obnoxious man. Why did he have to ask so many questions when he knew from the start that his verdict would be accidental death? There isn't anything that I could do about it. But I disagree with the verdict. Well, what other verdict is possible? Murder. Murder? What? You mean someone killed her? Yes. Who? You. Me? Yes, you. That's impossible. Why is it impossible? Well, because I because I, I wasn't even there. You were there. What are you saying, sir? You don't have to call me sir. Don't pretend with me. I can see through you. You're a young hustler on the make. You have no right to accuse me of You any... used Emily to get to Judy. You're going to marry Judy for her money. I don't think I have to sit here and listen to I, the... There's nothing intrinsically wrong with marrying for money. Does anyone seriously believe that poverty improves the quality of love? I married Mrs. Montgomery's sister for her money. Yes, I married her for her money. She married me for my looks. And both of us knew it. And we've had a perfect marriage. But you're a scoundrel. And you won't even give Judy her money's worth. Now look here, sir. I said don't call me sir. You can relax with me. Don't be afraid. Even though every word I say is true, I couldn't prove any of it. None of it's true. You accuse me of killing Emily. That's a lie. You say I was there. You know I wasn't there. I was with Judy. We were riding back to the house. You know it for a fact. <laughs> Have a drink. I don't drink. 
Don't say it so smugly. You have other vices that are worse. I say you were with Emily. I was not. No, don't interrupt. Since the very day you met Emily or arranged to meet her, you've been with her always. I think you're mad. That's my saving grace. But to say that I was with Emily when you know... You were with her as far as she was concerned. I don't know what you're talking about. So few. So few girls like Emily in the world. Oh, what a shame that you had to waste one of them. You knew that she was in love with you. Well, love, I... I'd, I'd say it was a crush. Girls like Emily don't have crushes. They fall in love only once, and it's forever. She was in love with you, and you know it. Admit it. What is this, an inquisition? I don't have to put up with it. Of course it. you don't, but don't try my patience either. I'm doing this for your good. For my good? Make it difficult for me, and I'll wash my hands of the whole business. Why do you say for my good? If she fell in love with you of her own accord... Well, that's a tragedy, but it's her tragedy. But if you made her fall in love with you, you're guilty of murder. Why? Because you knew it would kill her. The fact that you were only playing with her would kill her. The fact that you were only using her would kill her. All right. Maybe I did lead her to believe that I was in love with her. And it's murder in the first degree. Premeditated. I didn't know she'd take it this way. You knew... You knew it would destroy her one way or another. Okay, Harry. I killed her. That's what you want me to say, isn't it? Yes. Well, maybe she'll forgive you. Oh, come on, Harry. That's unworthy of you. Sure, I killed her. And you know why it doesn't destroy me? Because she was a girl who walked around saying to the whole world, Kill me. Please, somebody kill me. She was so trusting, so naive. Anybody could have broken her heart. Anybody could have betrayed her. Nobody has a right to be that defenseless. I was just the guy who happened along. Yes. Well, despite it all, she'll forgive you. Sure, Harry. Don't humor me. She loves you. And when she loves, she loves forever. A little thing like death isn't going to stop her. <laughs> Good morning, Max. Morning, Mr. Frank. You going to ride... Who do you want? Spartacus. You do, huh? Saddle him. Saddle him, the man says. What's the problem? The problem's right there in the corral. You can look at the problem. You can listen to the problem. You want to ride Spartacus, Mr. Frank? You go in there. You put the saddle on him. How long has he been acting up? More than a week now. Since we lost Miss Emily. How long can he go on like that? Oh, for another five minutes, or for the rest of his life. Poor Spartacus. He's kind of in mourning, that's all. Oh, Miss Judy said she'd wait for you at Parsons Creek. I got Bolivar saddled up. You know, Frank, ever since I was a little girl... Nice things have always happened to me here at Parsons Creek. You're not listening, Frank. Judy, darling, I wait breathlessly for each word. No. Your mind is somewhere else. And I won't have it. I want all of your attention. Now, what have you been staring at for the past few minutes? Judy, look straight ahead toward that clump of birches at the edge of the field. Why? There's a horse standing there. I don't see anything. Big chestnut. If I didn't know that Spartacus was back in the corral... Have you had breakfast? No, but that doesn't... <laughs> it's the most important meal of the day. You're probably seeing things because you're faint with hunger. What do you mean you don't see anything? And it gives you a bad temper, too. Judy, don't joke with Missing me. Missing breakfast is no joke. We're going to go right back and get you some. That's Spartacus standing there and someone is on him. Wait. Whoever it was... Just move behind the trees. Come on. Where? We're well, right over there. I'll prove it. I didn't see anything. I don't have to prove anything. Wait here. Good morning, Frank. Where have you been all week? Emily. I've been waiting for you here every day. You're not angry with me, are you, Frank? Emily. Where would you like to ride this morning? You know, I never did thank you for that piano rhapsody. It was so thoughtful. Come on, boy. Let's go, boy. Frank, don't go. Don't go, Frank. 
Ready to go back for breakfast, Frank? Yeah. Yeah. Well, was anybody there? Oh, no. There was nobody there. Nobody at all. It could be a bad dream. And everything will be all right when Frank wakes up. But how can he wake up when we all know he hasn't been sleeping? We'll return shortly with Act Two. And now, Act Two of Death Rides the Stallion. Frank has gotten over the shock of seeing and hearing a dead Emily, but not completely, it seems, as he has breakfast with Judy. More coffee, Frank, darling? Thank you. You know, you weren't exactly filled with chatter and high spirits this morning. Sorry, Judy. You hardly said a word, all during our ride. I guess you're right. I should never skip breakfast. Oh, no, that isn't true. You should always skip breakfast. Or you'll wind up fat as a pig. <laughs> <laughs> the wit and wisdom of Uncle Harry. <laughs> morning, sir. And how are the true lovers this morning? Oh, I'm fine. Frank is a bit gloomy, I'm though. I'm not gloomy. Yes, I would say you are. I'm an expert on gloom. I was once engaged to a boy. Do you remember him, Uncle Harry, the tall, blonde? Uh, the one whose father owned uh, all that oil? No, no. He was a redhead. <laughs> the blonde's name was George, something or other. Oh. Anyhow, he was undoubtedly the gloomiest human being east of the Mississippi. Well, Frank, what's the problem? There isn't any problem. Frank's been seeing things. Is that a fact? Now, Judy. Now, Frank, don't deny it. He was actually convinced he saw Spartacus out riding this morning. Spartacus? And somebody was on him. Whoa. That's... Remarkable. Not to mention impossible. In the first place, nobody's been able to ride Spartacus since... Since poor Emily. And, and in the second place, Spartacus hasn't left the stable in all that time. Who was supposed to have been riding him, Frank? Look, the whole thing was a kind of a... A hallucination. Now, please forget it. All right, darling. Will you be judge at the competitions this year, Uncle Harry? Well, is it still on after all, darling? We're in mourning. Oh, would Emily have wanted us to call off the show? What better way is there to remember her? Poor child. Frank, do you think that we should... Where's Frank? Uh, well, he was just sitting here. Where'd he go? Come on, Spartacus. Come on, calm down, boy. Calm down. Everything's all right. Everything's going to be all right. I want to find you. Uh, oh, good morning. Uh, that Spartacus still can't do a thing with you. You don't have to play that game for me anymore, Mac. Game, Mr. Frank? Tell me the truth or I'm going to beat it out of you. You raise your hand to me and I'll be forced to break your jaw. There's nothing the matter with Spartacus. He was out riding this morning. Well, that's news to me. Who's paying you off? Mr. Frank, the jaw of yours is starting to look like a good target. You saddled Spartacus after I left here. I saw him. He was near Parsons Creek. Oh, you ain't well. You want to sit down? I'll get you a glass of water. Now, now, just get, get your down. Get your hands off me. Frank. Frank, what's the matter? Nothing, 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 nothing is the matter, Judy. Jack. I think the, uh, the sun's a little strong this morning, Miss Judy, and you know these city fellows, they... They never wear hats. Frank, you don't look well at all. I'm fine. Now, listen, darling, listen to me. I'm going to call Dr. Stone. I don't and... need a doctor. Yes, you do. You do? I don't want to hear another word. You just go to your room and rest. Come in. Oh, it's you, darling. I don't want to hear another word. Just go to your room and rest. <laughs> Well, I could tell who's going to wear the pants in your family. Not to mention the shorts and the slacks. When $26 million tells me to go up to my room, I go. There's a bit of an exaggeration there. She only has 23. Well, it won't change my style of living. What's this I hear about you uh, hallucinating? <laughs> I'll admit you had me going, Uncle Larry. 
I had you go? Never a minute back there. I believed. Oh, did I ever believe? What did you believe, Frank? I believed, and listen to this. I believed that the dead return. I believed that I actually saw Emily sitting on horseback, sitting on Spartacus. Oh, of course it was your imagination. No, it wasn't. You mean she was sitting on Spartacus? Let's say somebody was sitting on Spartacus. Somebody you hired, an actress what? made up to look like Emily. Why would I do a thing like that? Because you know I hate your guts. Oh, come on, Frank. You don't really... Oh, hate... I do. And once I marry Judy and start assuming some control around here, you will be thrown out on your ear. Frank, you wouldn't... And you can either starve to death or you can find somebody else to sponge on. Oh, I see. That's why I'm trying to drive you crazy. Exactly, but it won't work. Yes, I could have hired someone to impersonate Emily, but I could never get her on Spartacus. That horse is completely unmanageable. I think you're bribing that fool down at the stables. Oh, don't let that pose of his throw you. He's far from a fool. Actually, he's a physicist. You plan to put this girl, this actress, on Spartacus, and my vivid imagination would then do the rest. He just realized one day that live horses were more interesting than dead mathematics. Oh, I blew it this morning. No question about that. I panicked. I lost my cool. First, when I actually thought it was Emily. Second, when I tried to put muscle on that moron at the table. Frank, believe me, his IQ is higher than yours. I lost points with Judy, but it'll never happen again. Sorry to end your fun so soon, Uncle Harry. Come in. Frank, darling. I came by to check. Has he been resting, Uncle Harry? Oh, yes, yes. He's been as good as gold. My darling Judy, won't you believe I'm all right? You didn't look all right, and you didn't sound all right just a little while ago. Well, I'm fine right now. I'm just fine. Oh, that's good, darling. Because we're having dinner with the Farrington. Far oh, Judy, he's such a bore. Oh, of course. But he has one of the biggest stock brokerage firms in the country. We were talking about making you vice president. Judy, I'm not interested. Frank, darling... You'll have to do something. I don't know anything about... And there's no reason you can't learn. Now, Uncle Harry knows all about finance. Let him teach you. Will you, Uncle Harry? Oh, gladly. I'll pop in again soon, just to check on you. <laughs> Does she know your plan to assume control after the wedding? Don't you worry about me. I know how to handle women. Well, Judy has all the money. But you know you'd have been much happier with Emily... I was so proud of you this evening, Frank. You were so attentive and so interested. You hung on Jim Farrington's every word. I'm going to work for him. No, dear, not for him. With him. After all, Mother and I are major stockholders in Farrington and Company. But don't you find stocks and bonds? Slow down, Judy. What? Slow down. Look uh, out, Judy. Judy, you all right? Oh, of course I'm all right. Why did you make me skid off the road? Uh, there was, there, there was, there was somebody up ahead. I didn't see anybody. Yeah, there was somebody up ahead on horseback. On a horseback? At eleven o'clock at I, night? I could have sworn I. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it was the shadows. Oh, you have this thing for people on horseback, Frank. Oh, I'm never going to get out of this ditch. We're less than a mile from home. Let's walk. Oh! Oh, no! We'll have to wait till it lets up. Oh, we could wait all night. I tell you, I can run to the house, pick up another car, and be back in ten minutes. <laughs> I was waiting for you to suggest the gallant thing, darling. You mind waiting alone? Why should I mind? These are my woods. Well, there goes... Hello, Frank. What? Emily. Poor oh, Frank. You're getting soaked. Climb up. Ride with me. Emily, what what do you want? I want you to come with me, Frank. Where? Where we can just be together all the time. Just you and me, Frank. You love me. This is some kind of trick. But it isn't working. Harry, he hired you. No, Frank. I'm Emily. Really? When I saw you this morning, you mentioned the piano rhapsody. Harry knew about it. He coached you. No, Frank. Only you and I know about the day we met. 
Only you and I. Oh, Look, my ticket stuff says R1. So does mine. Hey, look at the date on your ticket. It's for tomorrow. Oh. Well, look, you, you, you take the seat anyhow. Oh, but I couldn't. I insist. Now sit down and enjoy yourself. And we met in the lobby at intermission. And you bought me a lemonade. And when I said my name was Emily Montgomery, you said... Of the Montgomerys? Well, yes, that's what we're called. Hey, I had no idea I was buying a lemonade for an heiress. Oh, I'm not an heiress. My stepsister Judy has the money. Come with me, Frank. No. Don't be afraid, Frank. I love you. I wouldn't harm you. Come with me. I, I can't go with you, Emily. Why, Frank? Why? Because, be, because you're dead. Oh, no, Frank. Love never dies. And neither do lovers. You remember that verse you once recited? So speak to me of parting never. For all who love shall live forever. Get away from me. Frank. I forgive you for Judy. Keep away, I said. You were poor all your life, and when she smiled... Keep away, please. But I'm the one you love. I'm the one you want. Come with me, Frank. Keep away from me. Frank! Don't go, Frank! Keep away from me. Keep away from me. Keep away from me. And so... We have here a man who is sprinting down a country road at midnight, in a pouring rain, shouting, keep away from me. And his urgent plea is directed to a dead young lady. And yet, 12 hours ago, he was convinced that the dead do not return. We'll return shortly with Act Three. country road in the dead of night. It can try the souls of the most practical of men. Pragmatic, sensible Frank is now terrified, delirious Frank. Keep away from me. Keep away. Keep away. What? 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 Lie back, Frank. Lie back what? and be quiet. What? How? How did, how did I... How did I get here? What am I... What am I doing in bed? Judy found you lying on the road unconscious. I waited in the car for almost an hour. <laughs> I thought you'd taken this as an excuse to run out on me. Oh, Judy, don't say that. Right, darling, now don't excite yourself. No, I'm fine. I'm okay. You see, the rain had let up, and I started to walk home. And there was someone lying in the road. And it was you. What happened? I, 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 I must have tripped over something, or maybe I, I ran to a low-hanging branch. I, I guess I was knocked out. And, and you kept moaning, keep away from me. Uh, why? Well, Who? I don't know. I, 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 I just, I guess I must have been having a nightmare. Well, listen, the first thing in the morning, we'll see Dr. Stoneman. But right now, what you need is some sleep. And we'd better leave you alone. Are you coming, Uncle Harry? Yeah, just a minute. Frank, dear, you look very tired. You try to get some rest. Good night, my darling. Good night. <laughs> so... You were running, you tripped, you fell, you were knocked unconscious. Oh, no. No, that story won't do. You don't have a mark on you. What are you talking about? She's starting to have second thoughts, Frank. Bad move. You should have chosen Emily. No 23 million there, but she wasn't exactly a welfare case either. It won't work, Uncle Harry. You can't hope to psych me out of it. Nobody can psych me out of it. Little things, Frank. Little straws in the wind. For instance, she just said, I waited in the car. I thought you'd taken this excuse to run out on me. What she really meant, Frank. She might be looking for an excuse to run out on you. Enjoy yourself, Harry. I've been with that girl through... Oh, it has to be at least a dozen engagements. Each one is like a fever. It runs a predictable course. And you can always tell when she's reached the crisis... She becomes thoughtful. Pour you another glass, 
glass of wine, dear. Judy, more wine? No. Oh, thank you. What a glorious spot for a picnic. Frank, did you tell Dr. Stoneman everything? Of course. You heard what he said. I am 100%. Did you say anything about that mysterious rider? What mysterious rider? Oh, I know for a fact you've seen it twice. Once yesterday morning and again on the road last night. The rider who's supposed to be on Spartacus. What's there to say about it? It's impossible. Who can even get a saddle on Spartacus these days? Then why do you keep seeing him with someone on his back? Julie, darling, didn't you ever have a momentary flash from, well, an illusion? No. Not really. I take after Dad, both feet on the ground. You know, it's a pity you never knew my dad. There was a man for you. You're a lot like him, except... Well, except when you get these... What do you call them? Delusions? No. He wasn't like that at all. Who's that coming? I don't see anybody. Oh, Frank, not again. Hello, Frank. What's the matter, darling? Nothing. Nothing is the matter. I'm fine. Well, you don't look it. Come with me, my dearest. Frank... Are you sure you don't have some deep, dark secret? Come with me. She won't mind if you come with me. I always thought I wanted to marry a man of mystery, but... Judy and I, we grew up together. We loved each other as sisters do. Frank, are you sure you haven't been drinking? She wouldn't have taken you if she knew I loved you. Judy, let's go back to the house. But we just got oh, here. No, oh, no, but please. Don't go with her, Frank. Come with me. All right, we might as well. I can tell you're not going to be much fun today. Good morning, Mr. Frank. Do anything for you? Matt, Spartacus has been here all morning, hasn't he? This time you don't have to take my word for it. The vet's in the stable. He's been here all morning. Ask him. Want me to call him? No, no, no. Never mind. Hey, you, you, look, you look nervous, Mr. Frank. You ought to get some rest, Ash. Sure, sure. The vet's been here all morning, and so is Spartacus. Why do you keep asking? How, how, how long will it take you to saddle Spartacus? The way he is now? Forever. I'm going to ride Spartacus. Mr. Frank. Now, that is a damn fool thing to do. If you won't saddle him, I will. I'll tell you what, Mr. Frank. This is a bad time. Toward evening, he kind of simmers down a bit, and that's the best time to try. Right now, he'd kill the both of us. That's five o'clock. Who I'd say five o'clock's just fine. Come in. Well, I'm here to attend your education as a budding financier, as per your fiancé's instructions. So, let's begin with something right up your alley. Let me tell you about watered stock. Oh, shut up. People have been talking about you. Mac in the stables, for one. He tells me that you intend to ride Spartacus. That's right. Why? Harry, at first I thought you were out to destroy my mind with an actress who was impersonating Emily on Spartacus. But that's impossible. <laughs> Might have been fun at that. Now I know for sure that I am having hallucinations. I keep seeing Emily. Oh, that's bad. But as long as I'm aware of it, I can handle it. It's my own mind, and I can control it. Hooray for you. The key to this thing is Spartacus. If I can break that horse, I can break this whole psychological hang-up. Well, that's what you think it is, a psychological hang-up. Absolutely. Judy's also been talking about you. She's uh, a little disturbed. I didn't notice. Yeah, key sign. Tell me, did she talk about her father yet? No. You sure? What, she... She happened to mention him briefly. But his name did come up. Uh, just in passing. Oh, bad news for you. Why don't you get out of here? I don't think she'll ever marry anybody. None of this is going to work, Harry. Her daddy was just too overwhelming a man. She's attracted to guys who resemble him. And then when she finds out the resemblance is only superficial... She's done it no fewer than 12 times. Oh, my goodness. You're number 13. Will you get out of here? I'm supposed to teach you how to be a stockbroker. Cut it out. Well, here you are, you two. Hard at work, I hope. 
how are the lessons coming? The lessons are coming to an end. <laughs> you mean you've learned everything already? I don't intend to learn anything. I don't care about finance. I won't go into an office with that idiot Farrington. And when we're married, I intend to make the decision. Well, uh, of course. Now, what did you want to see me about? Well, I, I just came up to find out if you were all right. Obviously, I'm fine. Oh, well, I'll, I'll see you at dinner. That's how you handle women, Uncle Harry. That's how you regain control of your mind. And now, I'm going for a walk. Oh, if you happen to see Emily riding Spartacus, say hello for me. Hello, Frank. Emily, you're either in my mind or you really are out there. I'm out here, Frank. Either way, I can live with it. You won't destroy me. Oh, my darling. I'm not here to destroy you. I'm here to save you. Emily, I don't love you. Believe me, I used you. I used you to meet Judy. No, Frank, that's not true. You love me. Some stranger. Something. Someone who's alien to your very nature was attracted to Judy. Oh, Frank, she won't marry you. She doesn't love me. She will marry me. I've come for you, Frank. We'll be together always. Go away from me. Speak to me of parting never. For those who love shall live forever. Emily, I don't want you. Yes, you do. Oh, how badly you want me. How you need me. I can live with this. I can keep seeing you and talking to you. It won't destroy me. I'll just get used to it. I will get used to it. So soon, Frank. Have a nice walk. Of course. Thought Judy would be here. Wanted to find out what the plan was for dinner. Aren't you the newly appointed planner? No, not when it comes to dinner. That's a woman's prerogative. Well, Judy isn't here. Where'd she go? She left for the airport. Why? I wouldn't know. Did something come up suddenly? Probably. Oh, she uh, left you this note. Thanks. How lucky we are to find out sooner rather than late. Obviously, it isn't going to work. The one thing I must have in my life is someone solid, dependable. Someone who has a clearly defined goal and purpose. You're wonderful, Frank, but so moody, so unpredictable. How ironic. You would have been just right for Emily. I realize that now. Had she lived, I'm sure you would have found each other. I hope we can meet again as friends. Judy. Well, Frank, I'm sorry. Uh, Let me pour you a drink. I'll ride that damn horse. I'll kill him. Frank! Yes, Mr. Frank. You saddle Spartacus. No, sir. Saddle him. I have strict orders from Miss Judy that no one's to ride Spartacus at this time. Anyhow, sir, he's impossible. No, no, no. He's standing there very quiet. Well, that's just for the moment. Frank. Oh, Frank, darling. There's Miss Emily. She's getting ready to ride him. Miss Emily? There she is, right beside him. You see Miss Emily? Of course. Come with me, Frank, darling. We'll be together now. Yes, Emily, I was so foolish. Mr. Frank, please tell me, who are you talking to? Uh, Miss Emily. Come, Frank. Yes, Emily, you're all I have. Climb up behind me. We'll ride Spartacus together. Hey, Mr. Frank, Mr. Frank, where do you think you're going? You can't go in that corral at her. It'll kill you. Spartacus, look at him. So still, so gentle. I can't let you go in there. It's all right. Emily and I will ride him together. Come, Frank. Let go of me, No, Mr. Frank, quick, quick, quick. Come on, give me a hand. I can't hold. I'm waiting, Frank. Let me go. I'm coming, Emily. Mr. Frank, get out of that corral. Climb on, Frank. Climb on. Get away from that horse! Get away! Don't be afraid of him, Frank. Climb on. Don't touch him, Mr. Frank. Back away, back away. Here, let me help you. Back away. Take my hand, Frank. Take 
Oh, my God. Yes, Emily, yes. Don't touch that horse. Don't be afraid, Fred. Emily, give me your hand. Emily, where are you? Emily! <laughs> Emily, help me! Help me! Mr. Fred! No! no. <laughs> As you can already guess, the ambulance was too late. But, as the poem says, those who love shall live forever. If Frank truly loved Emily at the end, then both of them will be together somewhere forever. I'll be back shortly. story of Spartacus? Well, maybe you should, because whenever we vouch for something, we say it's from the horse's mouth. That's because everyone knows that horses never lie. Our cast included Mason Adams, Marion Seldes, Paul McGrath, Barbara Worthington, and Harry Belliver. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Welcome to the sound of suspense, to the fear you can hear. Consider this. What is the nature of danger? Is it a clear threat to our safety? Or is it a murky product of our imagination? And what is safety? Do we ever really possess it? Isn't there always danger? Our tale is about a little old lady who ran from danger and was pursued by a cat. How did you get into this house? Now get... I didn't even touch you. What's the matter with you? Sooner or later, you're going to have to get out of my house. Don't you think I want to feed you? Because I'm not. There's nothing in the house to eat anyway. How in the world did you ever get in here? How am I going to get rid of you? mystery drama, The Resident, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Carmen Matthews. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. to live with danger. Hard if you're old, elderly. Hard if you're a woman. And hardest if you're alone. Miss Malvina Thrip is elderly, a woman, and alone. Oh, my. Oh, how many years since I lived in a place with stairs? Forty at the very least. How am I going to navigate up and down six, eight times a day at my age? Well... I wanted to get out of the city, and here I am. Oh, but it's a nice house, 
It really is a nice house. <laughs> what was that? Was that a cat? Didn't I hear a cat? I'm sure... All right, Malvina. You heard a cat. There's nothing surprising about hearing a cat. Nothing alarming. <laughs> the thing is that I... I haven't lived in a house since I was a child. It makes me feel very alone. Not that I'm not used to being alone. I, I, I like being alone. But in the city, there was always somebody around. Other tenants. Not necessarily anyone you'd want to know or, or even talk to. But, but you'd meet them maybe in the elevator and, and exchange a few words. <laughs> not that I even knew their names or cared to. Also, there were the children at school... But I never knew what to say to them either. What I really liked was to talk to people on buses. Because sooner or later, one of us had to get off. <coughs> Quiet out there, cat. <coughs> cat, go away. <coughs> Honestly, cat, I will not let you in my house. Well, where are you? After all that racket, where are you? Cat? <coughs> Gone off to howl at somebody else. Well, good. All that meowing. Well, how in the world did you get in here? Did you skitter through the door without my seeing you? Now, nah, you're, you're a big cat, aren't you? Big yellow eyes. And you're sitting in my chair, you know that. My favorite wing chair. I'm probably getting cat hairs all over it. So, um, I think you'd better get down. Come on, cat. Get down. Get off my chair. Yes. I didn't even touch you. What's the matter with you? Who could that be? Maybe somebody looking for you. I devoutly hope so. Mailman. Mail? For me? Nobody knows I'm here. I just moved in. One letter addressed to resident. You the resident of this house? Oh, I'm the resident, all right. As of this morning. Yeah. Here's your letter. Thank you. It says, Sam's Garage. Circular. Sam runs a good garage. I don't have a car. <laughs> Better luck next time. Uh, uh, Mr. Mailman. Huh? Do you know anybody who's lost a cat? Uh, you uh, found a cat? It's in my house. It doesn't want to leave. Crazy about you, huh? I wouldn't say that, no. Uh, maybe if you leave the door open, you'll sort of wander out. Well, is that safe? To leave the door open? In this town? <laughs> Are you kidding? Well, it's good to hear that. <laughs> I had a cooperative apartment in the city. Every cent I had was invested in it, and I, I traded it for this house. <laughs> to be safe. Everybody here was born here and is about to die here. <laughs> I'll inquire around if anybody's lost a cat. Oh, thank you. I'd appreciate it. Oh, no. Leave it open, he said. Safe, he said. Well, now, Cat, anytime you're ready, the door is open. You can... Where are you? Where have you gone to? Are you still in this house looking for someone? Oh! You frightened me. The door was open. I, I left it open for the cat. You have a cat? No, no, I don't have a cat. It just showed up here a little while ago, and it didn't seem about to leave, so I... Did you, uh, did you want something? Something in particular, Miss... Viola's my name. Viola? Mm. What? I've forgotten. <laughs> oh, you have a little scratch on your arm. Well, the cat did that. What did you do to the cat? And I just wanted her to get out of my chair. Why did you? Well, it's my favorite chair. No wonder. It's nice. Oh, you, uh, you don't want to sit in it. Yes, I do. Well, it has cat hairs all over it. <laughs> These old dungarees have been up against worse than cat hairs. Okay to drop my knapsack here? Oh. You live alone. I just moved in. This morning. I saw you. You did? I should think you'd want a nice cat living here with you. Well, I, I don't. Anyway, it seems to have disappeared. Maybe she went upstairs. You think so? I think it's possible. Well, I must go and have a look. Good idea. Uh, if you, um, if you want to be on your way now... Not quite yet. Do you, uh, need some money? I, I have a little in the house, not much, but... I just 
Why don't you sit here in this nice chair? You go ahead. Go upstairs. But I... I won't steal anything. Oh, I, I didn't mean to suggest... There's nothing to steal. Well, if you want to rest yourself... I do. I really do. Yes. Well, you rest yourself and I'll just look upstairs. Maybe I'll take a hot bath and change my clothes because I'm going out going for dinner. Out? There's no food in the house. I... I don't like leaving you here. You want me to come with you? Oh, no. No, I'll, I'll go by myself. Oh, wait. You forgot your letter. Oh, that's nothing. I guess it's yours. Resident. Is that you? What a nice name. My name is Malvina Thrip. Malvina Thrip. I think Resident is a much nicer name. It could be anybody. Miss Viola, why don't you leave right now? Miss Thrip. I shall leave when I'm good and ready. Now go on upstairs. I really don't understand why I'm letting myself be subjected to all this. Uh, I'll, I'll be back. Shortly. <laughs> oh, why, Miss Thrip? You were born to be subjected to all this and more. One bedroom door closed. You are a natural victim, Miss Thrip. Other door closed. Rest well, Miss Thrip. Pull the pretty pink and white afghan up around your shoulders and rest well. There's excitement in store for you. Ah, oh, there you are, my beautiful. Come here. Come. Come, Eva. Come to my arms. Oh, my beautiful evil one. She's lying down now, upstairs on her little white bed. She's staring at the ceiling, making plans. She'll stay up there for a while, so you and I must make our plans, too. Our careful, careful plans. Better, Miss Thrip. You're still here. You've changed your clothes. What on earth are you doing? This is our dinner. I'm going out. I told Look you. Look, a barbecued chicken and a bottle of wine. What on earth? I had them in my knapsack. On the road, I buy a chicken and a bottle of wine every day. Have a drumstick. I couldn't. Not hungry? Not a bit hungry. Oh. You pack up your chicken and your wine and your knapsack and you get out of my house. Miss Thrip, you sit down. Uh, sit down, you old fool. Now listen to me. You're a selfish old lady. Here you are with a little gem of a house, two bedrooms, and you won't even share a little corner of it. Well, it's my house. It's my house. Mine, mine, mine. What a way to talk. But it is my... Don't you know what it is to share? Why should I share my house with you? With anybody, if I don't want to. It's sharing I... that makes life beautiful, Miss Thrip. Don't you know that, for heaven's sake? No. Well, I... then you are going to learn. Here. Have some wine. Well, perhaps I'd better. Of course you'd better. There you are. Do you like me, Miss Thrip? Well, I... I'm sure you're a very nice girl, really, but... Don't you think you are... I mean, do your parents know where you are, what you're doing? What are parents? Your, your father, your mother. Oh, my biological predecessors. Do, do they know what you're doing? Wandering about with a knapsack, living off of chicken and wine? Let me fill your glass. They don't care. And I don't care. It's very strange. Only the very weak cling to their families. Well, I know I'm not strong, but on the other hand, I'm, I'm not weak either. I don't think I am. Wishy-washy. I've, I've supported myself. I, I've lived alone. I, I haven't complained. You call that being strong? Well, it isn't being weak. Anyway, I, 
I've never thought it was. You've endured, Miss Tripp. Strong people don't endure things. They change them. Well, they take things and they change them. I wouldn't know how to change, to take... If one way doesn't work, try another, that's how. The thing is, get what you want. Well, I want my house. I want my house. Take it. If you just go. Make me. If the cat would just go. If I could just have my house back again the way it was when I moved in. You want more chicken, Miss Tripp? Oh, no, no. <coughs> it's the cat. She's back. <laughs> you like those bones, do you, my lovely? My evil? My beautiful evil? What did you call her? Eva. That's her name. How do you know what her name is? Because I just named her. Evil is a horrible name. No, it isn't. Think about it, Miss Thrift. Evil spelled backwards. Is live. Think about that. Evil spelled backwards is live. E V I L L I V E. The girl's right, no doubt about it. But wait. Take the same letters and mix them up again, and they spell vile. V I L E. Think about that. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Now let's get back to the story of a lady living alone until a cat moved in. A cat named Evil. Until a girl moved in named Viola. And the lady no longer lived. Alone. Wake up, Miss Tripp. It's morning. Time to wake up. What? Huh, where? What happened? You went to sleep on the couch, that's all. Why did I do that? Who are you? You know me. I'm Viola. Why are you holding that cat? <laughs> this is Evil. Evil slept upstairs with me on my bed. Your bed? Don't you remember anything at all? I, uh, I wanted a cat. To get out of my house. And Evil wouldn't go, would you? You lovely thing. And then you walked into my house. A total stranger. I won't be a stranger for long. You can count on that. I want you to get out of my house. You and the cat, both of you. Can't you understand that? This is my house. Where's the telephone? I don't have a telephone. Why? Look at you. You've got my dress on. Why don't you have a telephone? How dare you put my dress on? My dungarees were dirty. Why don't you have a telephone? I haven't had one put in yet. No, I'll have to go out. You're leaving? I have to go out and get some food. We have to have breakfast, don't we? I don't care about breakfast. I want my house back. Miss Thrip, you really must stop being so selfish. I just want what belongs to me. That's not selfish. Listen, old lady. I'm going out, but I'll be back. Don't get any ideas in your foolish head that you can keep me out. I'll get the police. I'll tell them... Tell them a girl is in your house and a cat. Tell them they moved in and ate chicken and drank wine, and so did you till you fell asleep on the sofa. But... But it's true. Does it sound true? But I'll show them. They'll see. I'll hide. Where? Where would you hide? Under the porch. Behind a bush. What? Up a tree. In the attic. In the cellar. Under the stairs. Oh, I know how to hide. You've done this before. You've moved in on people before. I do it all the time. I have to live, don't I? Well, I've got to get going or we'll all starve. Please, take the cat with you. And leave you all alone. I want to be alone. It, It's what I'm used to. I'm off to the store. I won't forget you, Evo. I'll bring you something to me. Be quiet, cat. I want to think. I'm afraid. That's what I am. Scared to death. <laughs> oh, I wish I had my little apartment back in the city. I loved it there. I, I, I really did. Well, no use thinking about that. Those people have it now. They'd never let me have it again and, and take back this awful house. 
Why, you're purring, aren't you? Are you talking to me? What are you saying? Tell me. Oh, tell me. Because I'm not just frightened. I'm... I'm panicky. I don't know what to do. I don't want to do anything foolish. And when people are in a panic, they do do foolish things. Anything I did might be foolish. There's no use locking the door, is there? Or that, there's no use going to neighbors. They don't even know who I am. They've never seen me before. Neighbors. The police. Well, those are things I do in the city. Sensible things. Practical things. Not here, though. No, I'm... I'm in a strange place. In very... Strange... Circumstances. <laughs> You're a very extraordinary cat. I'm not going to pretend I like you. I couldn't fool you anyhow, could I? Of course I couldn't. But you're very unusual. I'm sure you're very wise, very knowing. You must know strange things, secret things that I don't know, couldn't possibly know. Evil things. Evil, spelled backwards, is live. And I want to live. And I can't live being afraid like this. Fear is an impossible thing to live with. So tell me, cat, tell me what to do. I'm sure you know. And I'll do whatever you say. I'm back. Where are you? You didn't go out, did you? You wouldn't be such a fool. We're in the kitchen. Well, there you are, the two of you. We're hungry. Well, I bought plenty. Eggs and butter and all that kind of stuff for breakfast, coffee, tea, and meat and vegetables for dinner, enough for the whole week. The whole week? I don't want to keep going to the store. And for you, my lovely caviar. <laughs> did you... Did you have enough money for all this? Of course not. I charged it. To, to me? To Miss Malvina Thrip. But... They... Didn't they say anything? They don't even know me. That's how small towns are. They just went ahead and, uh, and charged it. Mm. They'd never do that in the city. They gave me a couple of applications to fill out for charge accounts. I said I'd drop them by tomorrow. You'd better sign them. In the city, I always pay cash. You're not in the city now. Oh, I know, I know. So sign them. Huh. There. That fixes that. Viola, did you say... Did you tell them at the store that you were me? I said my name was Malvina Thrip, so I guess they thought I was Malvina Thrip. Uh, are you just going to sit there? Or are you going to fix us some breakfast? What should I fix? Well, I don't know about you, but I want grapefruit and fried eggs and toast. Oh, and open the caviar for the cat. Put the coffee on. And start the eggs. Um, before the coffee's ready. And put the bread in the toaster. Well, I, I haven't unpacked the toaster. Well, then butter some bread. Uh, cut the grapefruit. There's no knife to cut the grapefruit. Oh, let's have a little efficiency around here. There's no frying pan. Hurry up! I can't. There, it's the butter, there's the bread. Now put the butter on the bread. Use your fingers. I can't understand why I'm doing all this. I am telling you to. There's no reason. And you like it. I don't. You like being told what to do. I... Hate it. All right, Miss Thrip. You may not like it now, but you'll get where you like it. Never. I won't. You'll get where you can't live without it, Miss Thrip. You just wait and see. You're a very passive person, Miss Thrip. And passive people need someone to tell them what to do. And then when they do it, they get a pat on the head and they are very, very happy. Is that how it is? That's how it is. To the end of time. The coffee's ready. People like you need people like me. I tell you what to do and you do it, and that's what makes the world go around. Pour the coffee. <clears throat> Very nice. Hot and strong. 
Mm, thank you. Pour yourself a cup. Thank you. I will. You're getting the hang of it. Of what? Of doing as you're told. Am I? Now, let's see. What'll I have you do next? I'm not going to do anything next. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Oh! Oh, oh hey! Get out! You burned me! Out of my house! Coffee all over my dress! It's not your dress! It's my dress! Oh. It's not your coffee! It's mine! And it's my kitchen! And my house! Oh. And oh! One more word about your house and I'll slap you again! Now! I am going upstairs and change these clothes and put something on those burns. And when I come back, I want you to be in control of yourself. I can't possibly be in control of myself as long as you're in this house. You told me wrong, Cat. It didn't work. You told me to give in to her and do everything she wanted. And it didn't work at all. I don't think I want any more of your advice. She was asking me to be her servant. Pretty soon it would have been sweep the floor, scour the sink, take out the garbage. I'd be her personal slave for as long as she stayed here. Suppose she stayed forever. Suppose I never cut my house back. Is that possible? Sooner or later, surely somebody would... Would what? Come to the door? Who? Oh, I wish I had friends. People who cared about me. And would miss me. And worry about me. I used to think I only needed someone to talk to now and then. And not for very long, but... That's not true now. I need... Someone close. Someone who cares. Both of you asleep? What kind of a household are we running here? I just put my head down on the table for a minute. Dirty cups. Evil, get off the table. I said get off the table. Go lie down somewhere else. Okay, Miss Thrip. Wash the cups and then sweep the floor. Oh, uh, here's something else. What? My dungarees, they're filthy dirty. I've been traveling in them for weeks. What am I supposed to do with them? Wash them. What? You want me? Throw them in the washer dryer. I don't have a washer dryer. Everybody has a washer dryer. And if I did, I wouldn't wash your dirty dungarees in it. Then you're just going to have to do them by hand. No. I am not going to wash them by hand. And I'm not going to wash your clothes or buy your food or cook your meals. We had an arrangement. You had an arrangement where you'd swagger around this house, my house, and give orders, and act as if you owned the place. And I would do what you told me. And that's the way it's going to be. It's not. That's the way it has to be, Miss Thrip. It can't. There are people who give orders and people who take them, and nobody in between. That's the way it is. That's the way it always has been. And that is the way it's going to be. Not in my house. Right here! In your house. Now, pick up those dungarees. You pick them up. Pick them up! And take them to the sink and wash them. Wash them yourself. And then put them on and get out of my house. Don't talk to me that way. You stupid old woman. I'll show you if I have to kill you! Oh! 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 It's true what they say. Put two women in the same house, it never works out. Or am I being catty? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Two women in the same kitchen, plus a cat. Teeth are bared. Claws are unsheathed. Fur flies. It's a cat fight. What else could it possibly be? Yeah. 
Did she hurt you? My arms are bleeding. Your face is bleeding, too. And my hands. What got into her? I can't imagine. I thought she was asleep. Have you got some iodine? I, I haven't unpacked it well, yet. Well, unpack it. I, I wouldn't know where to look. Then give me some soap and water. Yes, that, that will do just as well. I thought that damn cat liked me. Well, you can never tell with cats. Maybe she didn't like me, but she respected me. It is very hard to get respect from cats. As hard as getting them to like you. Oh, here's the water. And here's a towel. There's no soap. This water is very hot. Well, it's the best I can do. Oh. Well, that's enough. You can use it now. I don't need it. Why don't you need... Why, look at you. You haven't got a scratch. That cat didn't even touch you. But we were standing right together. She came between us. Why didn't she scratch you? Why just me? I, I wouldn't know. It couldn't be that she likes you. <laughs> no, I don't suppose so. Once in a very long while, a cat falls in love. Well, I've never heard of that. When a cat falls in love, it's disgusting. They lose everything that... that... Made them cats. Proud, beautiful animals, aloof, untouchable. Sitting in the softest spots, staring at things no one else can see. Thinking their secret thoughts. Why, the ancient Egyptians worshipped cats, kept them in temples, bowed down to them. They knew what cats are. The inscrutable. The unknowable. But when a cat falls in love, everything is changed. What happens, Viola? A cat becomes the lowest of the low. Shameless. Cringing, rubbing up against the person she loves, wanting to be touched, to be held. Not looking off into the distance anymore, only watching where the loved one moves. And when will he return to the cat who is waiting so patiently, loving and longing without dignity, without pride? It sounds sweet. It's sickening, I suppose. And that cat is in love with you. Oh, I, I don't think so. It, it, it isn't reasonable. That's why she came between us when she thought I might hurt you and she didn't scratch you. She only scratched me. She's in love with you. She's put me out of her mind, and she's in love with you. Well, that settles that. We'll get rid of her. Uh, put her outside, you mean? What good would that do if she's in love with you? She'd get back in. No. We have to kill her. Kill her? Well, you couldn't do that. Have you got some poison? Poison? We'll put it in the caviar. But I, I don't have any poison. Why would I? A knife. I... Give me a knife. Well, there isn't any knife. A poker, a shovel. I don't have any of those things. I'll strangle her. That's what I'll do. Oh, you I better be polite. I dare you. No, I'll stay in my house. She I don't hate you. you. She loves you. Viola, you don't mean that I should... Oh, no. No, I, I couldn't do that. I, I just couldn't. Pick her up. No, no, I... Pick her up. I... I... I can't do what you said. I can't strangle a cat. You didn't mean it, did you? We'll take her upstairs. And we'll throw her out the window. Come on. No, no, we can't do that. Nevertheless, it's what's going to be done. It's what you're going to do. Up the stairs. I'm right behind you. Keep going. I I never wanted this cat in my house, but but that doesn't mean that I I wanted this. Keep going. Uh, in here. Oh, good. Uh, the window's open. Go ahead. Throw her out. I can't. I can't do it. Yes, you can. Just lean out and drop her. The doorbell. The doorbell. Come back here. Come back. Oh, it's a friend. It's a friend. Someone remembered. I'm coming. Wait. I'm coming. 
Another letter, Miss Rick. Oh, come in. Uh, this one's addressed to you. Oh, please, please come in. I'm so glad to see you. Miss Malvina Thripp, it says. Nothing like hearing from a friend, is there? Listen, they're in the bedroom. Hmm? She's going to kill her. Uh, hold on now. Uh, Maybe she has already. She wanted me to do it, but I couldn't. What uh, bedroom is this, Miss Thrip? The front one. Top of the stairs. I look outside. Maybe she's there. Maybe she fell in a tree or a bush or something. Cat? Where are you? Are you all right, Cat? Oh, please, be all right. I didn't want you in my house, but, but that was all. I never meant that you should... Oh, oh, where are you? Yes, yes, I'm here. What... What did you find? Upstairs. Nobody. Nothing. Nobody? No cat? No cat. Wasn't there a girl? A young girl? Nobody. Nothing. Well, both of them couldn't have gone out the window. I, I don't think both of them... Look, Miss Tripp, you're all shook up. Why don't we go into the kitchen and I'll pour you some coffee? I, uh, I threw the coffee at her. There isn't any. Well, I'll make some fresh, and you can tell me all about uh, the cat and the girl, the, 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 the whole dream. Uh, it wasn't a dream. Well, what if it was? Do you think it could have been a, a hallucination? Ooh, maybe something like that. You remember I told you there was a cat in my house. And I told you I'd inquire around about a lost cat, and I did. But uh, nobody's lost a cat. This girl, this Viola, she went and bought things at the store. Look, look, all these groceries. She bought them. I didn't. And caviar for the cat. She charged everything to me. Mm, you sure it wasn't you charged all these things? Well, I haven't been out of the house. What would I have done if you hadn't run the bell? Viola was going to make me throw the cat out of the window. Hey, Miss Tripp, uh, uh, maybe I should call a doctor. Oh, I'll be all right now that you're here. You're my friend. You brought me a letter yesterday from Sam's Garage, you remember? Address to resident. Yes, and I'm the resident here. I'm Malvina Thripp, and I'm the resident of this house. Sure you are. Although for a while there, I, I didn't know if I really was the resident of this house. Well, I wouldn't have taken the letter from you if I wasn't, would I? The resident means anybody who's living here. And I'm living here. I was at the time, and I am. Of course. Of course you are. You, uh, you don't think I'm out of my head, do you? Oh, not necessarily. You're uh, upset. I'm going to call a doctor for you, eh? Well, there's no phone. I, I haven't had one put in yet. I'll go next door. Oh, don't go. Don't. Don't leave me. You don't believe me. You don't think there was any any cat here, or any girl, or that we ate chicken and, and, and drank wine and the cat ate the bones. And in the morning she came downstairs and she was holding the cat in her arms and I was on the couch. I'd been there all night. I think, I think I was drunk from the wine. Drunk, huh? Well, the bottle must be around here somewhere. Mm, I don't see it. And, and she told me to get breakfast. And wash the dishes, and then to sweep the floor, and wash her dungarees, her dirty dungarees. Look, look, there they are, her dirty, filthy dungarees. They're not yours? Well, you don't think I'd wear anything like that, do you? Oh, lots of women wear dungarees these days. Um, what was this girl wearing if she wasn't wearing her dungarees? My dress. Can you imagine? She was wearing my dress till I threw the coffee pot at her. Threw the coffee pot at her, did you? Yes. And the cat attacked her. You don't say. Not me, just her. Uh huh. And she said the cat was in love with me. Now, I don't know if that was true. If such a thing could be true. But she said it was. And she said in that case, we would have to kill the cat. Poison it. Or stab it. Or strangle it. But I couldn't do that. Of course not. Not, not any of those things. Then she said, we'd take the cat upstairs. And throw it out of the window. And that's where we were when you rang the front doorbell. And oh, was I glad. You, uh, 
You don't believe any of it, do you? Well, now, let's just say you've been through a lot. What with one thing and another? Oh, I have. <sighs> what you need is something to calm you down. I, I never take anything like that. Oh, just something mild to relax your nerves. I'll be all right. Now, uh, now that I have my house back. There's a very nice doctor who lives not far from here. He's on my mail route. I'll call him and ask him to stop over. Oh, please, don't go. He'll fix you up fine. Hey, look what's coming up the walk. Yeah. Why, it's... Oh, cat. I'm so glad to see you. Careful. Don't let her in the house. Oh, that's all right. I've gotten sort of fond of her. And she's, well, she's rather fond of me. Oh, see. Almost forgot what I came by for. It, got a letter for you. Another circular? Not Sam's garage again. Oh, no, no. Addressed to you, Miss Malvina Thrip. Well, for heaven's sakes. It's from the city, my oh. old address where I used to live. Miss, you already, do they? <laughs> well, I don't think anyone misses me. I, I didn't even tell anyone I was moving. Well, open the letter, why don't you? Imagine. My... My hands are shaking. <laughs> Want me to do it for you? No. No, that's that's all right. Why? It's from the people who took my apartment. The people who used to own this house. <laughs> I told you, we traded. <laughs> well, dear Miss Tripp, we hope you are enjoying the little house as much as we are enjoying your apartment. <laughs> One day soon, if it's all right with you, we want to drive up and see you. Well, and how you're getting along. <laughs> also to pick up our cat. We came away in such a hurry, she got left behind. Will you be kind enough to let her share your house until we can make arrangements? She's a dear, sweet thing. Her name is Viola. And we know you will love her as much as we do. Dear Viola, sweet Viola, good Viola. Or is she vicious Viola, violent Viola, vile Viola? Hmm? Well, anyway, for the time being, Viola has a home with Miss Valvina Tripp, the resident. May they both rest safe and sound. I'll be back shortly. There's so much good in the worst of us, and so much bad in the best of us, it scarcely behooves any of us to talk about the rest of us. So the poet said, think about it. That's what I'm going to do. Our cast included Carmen Matthews, Joan Loring, and Gilbert Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense, the voices of victims, the fear you can hear, 
For the next 52 minutes, we're going to take you into the world of mystery and murder, but mostly into the world of terrifying imagination. The story you're about to hear might be called a morality play. It's a story which has a question you can ask yourself. What is your price tag for killing a man? If you think you don't have one, listen to the story of Walter Van Haas and the Chinaman Button. Mr. Van Haas, I'm making this as easy for you as... as pushing a button. Now, if you give your approval, my agents in Johannesburg will be contacted within hours. The rest will be handled simply and with dispatch. My God, I really think you mean it. I really think you'd commit murder. Our mystery drama, The Chinaman Button, was written especially for the Radio Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Paul Hecht. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. And now, Act One of The Chinaman Button. But it does not begin in China. It begins in New York City on the executive floor of a bustling advertising agency. Good morning, Mr. Fisher. Good morning, Susan. How have you been? How is Hawaii? Oh, just great. Oh, you look perfect. <laughs> My partner get in yet, or is he goofing off? Oh, no. Mr. Michaels is in his office. He's been there since 8 o'clock. Oh, don't give me that. I bet Lou hasn't been in the office before 10 since I went on vacation. Well, what do you know? There you are, just like Susan said. Hello, Phil. Welcome back. How do I look? Fat and sassy? Three weeks in Hawaii, luau every night, plenty of rum and pineapple. I figured I gained ten pounds. Well, it looks good on you, Phil. No kidding. What is this? What's the matter with you? <laughs> I'm nice and brown. You're white as a sheet. You look terrible. Lou, are you sick or something? No, I'm okay. I'm fine. You look like you've been sleeping in the office or something. Well, let's hear it. There's some bad news, right? Something happened while I was away? Yeah, that's right. Something's happened, Phil, but... It wasn't my fault, so help me. Okay, come on, let's have it. We lost an account, Phil. Okay, so we lost an account. We lost the Brewster account. You want to tell me that again? I know it's real bad news, but I don't know how else to tell you. Brewster's definitely out. You want to tell me what you did wrong, Lou? Well, nothing, Phil, I swear it. It'll come out sooner or later. Phil, I had nothing to do with it. It started with a call from Charlie Edwards a week after you left. He wanted to talk to you. He said it was urgent. When I told him you weren't here, he hung up. Next thing I know, there's a letter from old man Brewster, the official 90-day notice of termination. But did you call Charlie? Well, sure, I called him. Only Charlie isn't the ad manager anymore. Charlie's got a new job. He was kicked upstairs. He's in customer relations, out of advertising completely. There's a new guy in charge. Oh, you know what you're telling me. You are telling me that our gross profit has been cut in half. You think I don't know that? I think I'd better sit down. The new ad manager's name is Walter Van Haas. Six million dollars in billing? Just just like that? Charlie said the whole thing was his fault. Who's? Walter Van Haas, the new ad manager. Charlie says he started the whole thing, but I never got the full story. Charlie's been too busy in his new job to talk to me. Give me that phone. Yeah, sure, sir. Charlie is not going to be too busy to talk to me. I haven't been kicking back ten grand a year to Charlie for him not to talk to me. You want to know who Walter Van Haas is? I'll tell you, Phil. He's a Boy Scout, and he won his merit badge for backstabbing. So Walter Van Haas is a backstabber. How did he get close enough to do the job? He's my assistant. He's been my assistant for like eight months. How come I never knew him? Because that's the kind of guy Walter is. 
He keeps in the background. He's a mouse, Bill. A 200 buck a week mouse. Only this mouse roared like a lion, right? Two weeks ago, he came running into my office with a box full of invoices. It seems he was conducting a private investigation, Phil. Can you believe that guy? He was checking into all the supplier bills you guys sent over. He was actually checking out every engraver, every stat house, every printer, every artist bill. Phil, he found overcharges like 50, 60, even 100%. You were his boss, Charlie. Why don't you tell him what to do with his invoices? He thought I'd be shocked. He wanted us both to go to old man Brewster and expose your agency. That's when I did the only sensible thing. And what was that? I offered him part of my take. A third of it. Phil, he practically turned blue when I offered him that money. Him take a bribe, the Honorable Walter Van Hart? Are you kidding me? It could have been the whole 10000 and it wouldn't have been enough. It was a matter of principle. You dig? No, I don't. He didn't tell Brewster about my offer. He wouldn't rat on me. That was part of his code, too. But he did tell the old man about the phony charges. I couldn't stop him. That's when I got booted upstairs and you got booted out. And Mr. Walter Van Haas gets your job. He didn't even want to accept that. Can you believe it? Old man had to twist his arm to get him to accept it. And a 50-buck-a-week raise. What is this guy, some, some kind of a fanatic? I don't know how to describe Walter. He's so square. He's so honest. I swear it's true. You couldn't budge this guy for a million bucks. A million bucks, a million bucks. The great American words. The incantation of the American dream. Charlie, hmm? did you ever hear of the Chinaman button? The which? When you were a kid. Didn't anybody ever ask you about it? It's, it's kind of a puzzle. I, I guess you could call it a moral dilemma. No, I never heard of it. What's a Chinaman button? Uh, it goes like this. Now, suppose you were told that by simply pressing a button, you could kill the Chinaman thousands of miles away. A Chinaman whose fate meant nothing to you, no more than the fate of a fly on the table. And yet, by pushing this button, by sending just one anonymous Oriental to his death, you would receive one million dollars. Tax-free. What would you do, Charlie? Uh, I don't know. Press the button, I guess. Sure, that's right. You'd press the button. I'd press the button. Even Walter Van Watts' face would press the button. No, not him. Not that guy. Oh, yeah, sure he would, Charlie. No, I, I really don't think so, Phil. Walter would think about it and begin wondering if that Chinaman might not have a wife and kids. Walter does. He's got five kids, as a matter of fact. You're wrong, Charlie. Everybody's the same when it comes to money as the great leveler. No, no, I really mean it. Walter wouldn't push that button for ten million dollars. That's the kind of guy he is. And that's why you don't have the Brewster account anymore. He'd push that button just like anybody else. Okay, okay. What's the difference? There isn't any Chinaman button. So, what's the difference? That's right. There isn't any Chinaman button. Or is there? I don't get you, Phil. What's all this talk about uh, a button? I didn't say there had to be a button, Lou. Not literally. Or a Chinaman, for that matter. Van Haas sounds, sounds Dutch. How about a Dutchman? What are you talking about? I think he drank a little too much at lunch. He wouldn't be so high and mighty once he pressed that button, would he? That would knock his halo off. What? Which is worse, Lou? Taking a kickback or killing a man? Oh, come on, Phil. Will you talk sense? Uh, we'd have him right where we want him. We could call the shots then, Lou. We can get Charlie his job back. We might even get our account back. Oh, for Pete's sake, Phil, will you tell me what you're talking about? Better. I'll show you what I mean. Only first, I gotta compose a letter. A letter to who? Don't rush me. This has gotta be done right. We're going to have to print up a special letterhead, something that really looks authentic. Somebody in the art department can do that. For what for? Yeah, let me use that portable of yours. Uh, we'll have to find one of those services that post letters from overseas. Dear Mr. Van Haas, you're writing this guy? Yep. Well, what are you going to say to him? I am going to offer him the American dream, Lou. Uh, Millie? Oh, Walter, I, 
didn't know you were home. I got here about ten minutes ago. I was looking through the mail. How are you? Oh, all right. Tired as usual. Isn't it, isn't it kind of chilly to be out here? Oh, I just had to get out of the house. Kids have been impossible all day. You know how hard it rained this morning. Yes, yes, I know. Honey, did you see the letter? Hmm? The one from South Africa? Oh, yeah, sure, I noticed it. Uh, say the stance, will you? Peter wants it. Yeah, them. Millie, Millie, uh, do you know what the letter's about? No, well, can't imagine. Oh, you, you don't know anyone in South Africa, do you? Of course not, but somebody there knows me. It's it's from some law firm. Look look at the letterhead. Uh-huh. Dree Sertog and Beer, Beer and Brook? <laughs> what a name. Uh, it's, it's Dutch, I guess. Mm-hmm. Dries, Hardog, and Berenbrook. Mm-hmm. 200 Commissioner Street, Johannesburg, South Africa. Read it, huh? Well, it says... Dear Mr. Van Haas, our firm is collecting data for record-keeping purposes concerning the surviving family of one of our clients. Would you be so good as to confirm the following facts? Your name, Walter Van Haas. I can confirm that, all right. Well, go on. Read the rest. Your father's name, Benjamin Van Haas. Right again. Your mother's name, Sylvia Reach. I didn't know your mother's name was Sylvia. Uh, She always hated the name. That's why she called herself Sally. Anyway, now let's see. Paternal grandparents, Jan van Haas, Elsa Voort. If the foregoing facts are not correct, would you kindly advise us by return mail? Well, oh. I just saved some postage anyway. Is that all it says? No, just one more sentence. If these facts are correct, there is no need for further communication. Thank you for your attention to this matter. Yours faithfully, L. Something or other. I can't make out the signature. For heaven's sake, Walter, what do you suppose it means? I have the faintest idea. Maybe I've got a rich uncle in South Africa. Maybe he owns one of those diamond or gold oh, mines. Oh, if only. Tell him to send us a couple of diamonds fast. Oh, maybe we could start looking for a new house. If I don't get out of this cheese box soon, I'll, I'll, I'll just go out of my mind. I'll settle for a couple of gold nuggets. We can melt them down and use them to fill Elsa's teeth. That ought to cut down that... Dental bill. Look, why don't you write to those people in South Africa and ask them what it's all about? Well, you heard what the man wrote. If these facts are correct, there is no need for further communication. Thank you for your attention to this matter. Faithfully yours. Scribble, scribble. <laughs> How does that sound, Lou? Sounds like the real thing, Phil. <laughs> Look at that letterhead. Is that perfect or is that perfect? Harry Twinner in the art department did it. Use the transfer type. You just rub on the paper. You can't tell it from the real thing. Well, where'd you get the names from? Van Haas's family? I got them from Charlie Edwards, right out of the files of the Brewster Company. You really got it mail from South Africa? Yeah, straight from Johannesburg. Airmail special delivery. Should have arrived by now. Phil, it's crazy. You going to all that trouble just for a joke on the guy? It's not a joke. It's serious business. Hand me that phone. Yeah. What are you doing now? Hello, Brewster Company? Mr. Van Haas, please. My name is... Thompson. Just tell Mr. Van Haas that I wish to speak to him in connection with South Africa. I'm sure he'll understand. Yeah. Yeah, I'll wait. So, will you please tell me what you're doing? I'm going to make an appointment with this man, Lou. I'm going to make a deal with him. For the Chinaman button. Phil Thurston seems to have invented his own Chinaman button. But will his improved model work? It all depends on Mr. Walter Van Haas. We'll return shortly with Act Two. Now, let's go back to Phil Thurston. Or rather, let's go back to Mr. Thompson, since that's the name Mr. Thurston used to make his reservation at the Ebb Tide Restaurant in downtown Manhattan. 
Nice of you to come all the way downtown to meet me for lunch, Mr. Van Haas. That's okay. I'm sorry I don't have a permanent office, so a place like this is convenient for me. You still haven't told me what business you're in, Mr. Tom. I would have come to your home for this meeting, but I didn't want to disturb your wife and children. Uh, you do have children, don't you? I sure do. Five of them. <laughs> How old are they? Step ladder. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Yeah, that's a lot of mouths to feed. Yep, and teeth to fill. <laughs> I don't doubt it. Did you say that you were with that law firm in Johannesburg, Dries Hartog, and... Sorry, I can't remember the last name. I'm not sure I could pronounce it if I did. Your family is Dutch, isn't it? Yeah, my grandparents were Hollanders, but the rest of us are strictly Yanks. Uh, well, the answer is no. I don't come from the attorneys in Johannesburg, but... I wanted to talk to you about their letter. Now, frankly, we couldn't figure it out, Millie and I. It's my wife. I, I, I don't remember having any relatives in South Africa, and neither does my father. Oh, your dad's alive, then? Yes, he lives in Allentown. I called him, but he didn't have any answer. Well, maybe I can help. You see, there is a relative, but a very distant one. One of those cousins four and five times removed. What's his name? Well, it wouldn't mean anything to you if I told you. Yeah, but you do know his name. It is my business to know such things. Well, that, uh... That brings us back to the original question, doesn't it? About what business you're in. The person who told me the name of your relative was a clerk in the offices of Dries, Hartog, and Birenbuch. He works for them, but you might say that he's on my payroll, too. I don't think I understand. He's the one who informed me about the letter that was being sent to you and uh, why it was being sent. Is there any reason why you can't tell me my cousin's name? No, I'd rather not. I think you'll understand why later. But I will tell you something about him. Fine. He left the Netherlands with his family when he was when he was very young. He's lived in South Africa since. He's in the diamond business. Well, well. He's a widower, he has no children, and he's rich. He is very, very rich. And at the moment, he has only one traceable heir. Wait a minute. You mean that I actually do have a rich uncle in South Africa? I know, I said cousin. But that's incredible. I mean, Millie and I were kidding about it. We even said that he, he might be in the diamond business. Oh, he is. Very much so. A and are you saying that I'm his only heir? That's correct. Well, if there was the possibility of some kind of inheritance, why didn't the lawyer say so? Simple enough. There was nothing to say. What? The attorneys were only performing a routine function, putting the gentleman's will in good order. Undoubtedly, they'll have to redraw the will sooner or later in favor of a closer relation, such as a new wife. A wife? You see, this rich cousin of yours is only 41 and in excellent health. How old are you, Mr. Van Huss? 43. <laughs> so that's all there was to it, just a routine inquiry. At the moment, that's all there is to it. Well, I'm not surprised. I... I never did believe you get something for nothing in this world. I said at the moment. What do you mean? Mr. Van Haas, you don't know this man in South Africa. You don't know the first thing about him. In fact, he means nothing at all to you. I guess so. And the only way he could mean something to you is, is by dying. Isn't that right? Well, that's a rough way of putting it. But uh, if you mean that he won't benefit me until his death... I guess that's obvious. Now, what if I told you that this man will be dead in two or three days and that his entire estate will be yours? I thought you said he was healthy. Well, I'm just asking how you would feel. Sorry for the guy, I suppose. Sorry about a man you don't know. Well, he's a human being. I see. Mr. Van Huss, did you read the newspaper this morning? Yes, I did. You looked at the obituary page? Ah, briefly. Did you feel sorry for all the people whose death was reported? Did you feel any real sorrow for them? No, I, I can't say I felt sorrow. Because they were all strangers, weren't they? All right, Mr. Thompson, I'm a human being, too, and I guess if I got a letter from Dries, Hartog, and whatever, telling me that I was rich, I wouldn't go into mourning. I'd... Probably go out and celebrate. <laughs> if you saw my kids' dental bills, you'd understand. <laughs> but I do understand. Believe me, I understand very well. That's why I wanted to see you. To suggest arranging that happy event without the slightest trouble on your part, without any obligation until you're completely satisfied. What the devil does that mean? All you have to do is say yes. Just that one word and your dream will come true. Yes to what? 
Now, in a short time, you'll receive another letter from Johannesburg informing you of the sad news that your cousin, Mr... Well, I still won't reveal his name. Let him remain anonymous. That'll make your decision a great deal easier, I'm sure. What decision? The decision to inherit his estate. Now, hold it just a minute. Are you talking about... Please, keep your voice down. Mr. Van Haas, I'm making this as easy for you as pushing a button. If you give your approval, my agents in Johannesburg will be contacted within hours. The rest will be handled simply and with dispatch. All you'll have to do is wait for official notification of your inheritance. When the money arrives, of course, I'll expect payment in the amount of... Ooh, 50% of the total. By our calculations, I'd say that total should be just about uh, one million U.S. dollars. Good Lord. I... I really think that... I think you mean it. I think you really do. I know you have scruples, Mr. Van Haas, but I also think you have common Listen, sense. Listen, Mr. Thompson, if that's your name... And of course, you're quite right. It isn't. But it's the name you'll use to get in touch with me. I'm not getting in touch with you because I can give you your answer right now. It is no. Oh, don't be so hasty. I never heard such a filthy proposition in my entire life. Look, if the percentage is a problem, we can discuss it. Our organization has been known to be flexible about such Money things. has nothing to do with it. We could base our agreement on a sliding scale. That is, we would take 50% of any inherited amount up to and including $1 million. Anything after that, our percentage would be 40%. Does that sound more attractive? Are you talk about it like it was some kind of a simple business deal. But it is. Especially simple for you. A very clean, very uncomplicated deal. You do nothing at all, Mr. Van Haas. Can I make you understand that? You won't be connected to your cousin's death in any way. In fact, our agents are so expert at what they do, it's almost certainly going to be called an accident. Believe me, we've never had the slightest bit of trouble in the past. You heard my answer, Mr. Thompson. Now, if you'll excuse me. You yeah, haven't had your lunch yet. My appetite is gone. Van Haas. What? I, I'm sorry. Perhaps I put the whole thing to you too bluntly. I shouldn't have expected a man like yourself to agree immediately. Or ever. All right, all right. Maybe you'll never agree. But at least give yourself some time to think it over. I don't need any time. Just 12 hours. 12 hours, that's all I'm talking about. Now, if you change your mind any time during the next 12 hours, you can reach me at the Florentine Hotel on 51st Street. Hey, did you get that name? I don't need to remember it, Mr. Thompson. I'd like to forget your name, too, and this whole conversation. I'll be at the Florentine Hotel between 8 o'clock and midnight tonight. Uh, don't call me after 12, my sleeping habits, you understand? I don't see how you can sleep at all, Mr. Thompson. You'd be amazed at how well rich men sleep. Well, you can go to bed early tonight. Don't wait up for my call because there won't be one. Goodbye. So long, Walter. I'll be hearing from you. No, 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 no. Tell me, tell me what the matter is. It's nothing. It's, it's, it's nothing. It, it's got to be something, Millie. I, are the kids okay? Yes, they're all right. They're pretty quiet in the playroom. Oh, that's because I packed the twins off to Mother. They were getting out of hand, Walter. I just couldn't stand it anymore. Oh, okay, fine. I'm sure your mother is delighted. No, she isn't. Maybe she used to be when she was younger, but... She's getting too old for that sort of thing now. Maybe I'm getting too old, too. Come on, what are you talking about? I'm 41 years old, Walter. Sometimes I feel like 141. You know what's wrong with you? You're not eating right. You're eating like a bird these days. Well, that's practically all I can afford to buy these days. Bird food. I didn't mean that, Walter. Honest, I didn't. I know you didn't. I know it. Look... Honey, I wish you'd see Dr. Julian and have him check you over. Well, that... I did see Dr. Julian. You did? When? Mm, this morning. I didn't know you were going. Well, I, I didn't want you to know. Not until I was sure, anyway. Sure about what? Hey, you're, you're not sick, are you? I mean, did he find anything serious? No, I'm not sick. I'm... I'm pregnant, Walter. 
What? You see, I'm not over the hill after all. I can still make babies. It should be some sort of comfort, shouldn't it? A baby? Dr. Julian shook his finger at me and said he was going to call you sometime and give you a lecture on the population explosion. Well, that's just great, honey. No, Walter, it's not just great. Oh, honey, don't pretend to be happy about it. I just can't... Well, it's not the end of the world. Oh, that's right. It's a beginning, isn't it? That's what Mother said when I told her. She's always said that, even with the first one, with Peter. Ten years ago, almost eleven. Well, did you realize we've been married almost thirteen years? I know, Melly, and I know they haven't always been easy years. Why is everything always beginning? When does the middle of everything start for us? Is our life just going to go from beginning to end without anything worthwhile in the middle? <laughs> Oh, no! What was that? I asked Elsa to wash the dishes and put them away. I'd better get in there before they're all broken. Millie, we have to talk. After dinner, all right? I haven't even started it yet. I'm sorry. It's all right. I... I've got some work to do anyway. Or... some thinking, anyway. Got something going for yourself? You might say that. Oh, you bachelors really have a good life. Where does she live? Pat around here? Actually, I took a hotel room for a couple of days. We have to Florentine. She wouldn't have a friend, would she? Oh, well, I could call Louise and tell her I have to work tonight. <laughs> now, forget it. She'll never buy that. My wife's got a built-in lie detector. Don't eat your heart out, Charlie. This is strictly a business proposition. Yeah, I know your business propositions, Phil. Monkey business. You're trying to get a new client for the agency, right? Something like that. How do you think it looks? Will you get the deal? Charlie, I'm almost dead sure of it. Will Walter Van Haas press the Chinaman button? Would you press it? To make a million dollars? Before you answer... Wait until we return with Act Three. Now let's pay a visit to the Florentine Hotel. It's a posh little hotel with all the conveniences. And in room 610, there's a gentleman registered under the name of Thompson. for the gang of the Williamsburg Warehouse. And now, here's time to weather check. It's exactly 40 minutes past the hour. Also. Hi, Lou. Come on in. So, this is the Florentine Hotel, huh? Well, that's not a bad-looking room. Why, well, the corners are sweet. That's right. The bedroom is in there. Look at this bar set up. Glasses, refrigerator, and everything. It's nice. Very nice. You want a drink? <laughs> All I got is vodka. Oh, no, Thanks. I'm strictly a scotch man, you know that. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. I'm not staying long. I'll just uh, leave the layouts and the reports for you to look over. We can talk about them in the morning at the shop. Relax, Lou. Your wife knows you're working late tonight, doesn't she? Yeah, she knows. Well, sit down. Take it easy. Look, I got some orange juice. I can make you a screwdriver. No, thanks, Lou. <laughs> Guess I have to drink alone, then. Well, aren't you going to ask me about your friend, Van Haas? What about him? I told you I was going to see him today, or rather that Mr. Thompson was going to see him. Did you? That's right. I saw him for lunch and told him the whole story about how easy it was for him to become a millionaire just by pushing the Chinaman button. Or <laughs> maybe I should have called it the Dutchman button. Did he believe it, Phil? All the way. But did he go for it? I mean, about having a guy in South Africa killed. Uh, no. No, he wouldn't go along. Ah. Uh... So Charlie was right. He said no because he was scared. He was afraid that he was getting into something too deep for him. Well, maybe that wasn't it, Phil. Maybe he is the kind of guy Charlie says he is. Maybe he was that kind of guy, Lou. That was before he ever got really tempted. 
A lot of people are honest because they never had anything worth being dishonest about. Am I right? You don't think much of people, do you? I think people are people, that's all. Open your eyes, Lou. Look at what's happening all around you. Everybody's on the grab. You don't know that by now. You've been living in a cave all your life. All right, all right. I don't want to argue with you. Everybody's corruptible, Lou. Everybody. High and low. Yeah, it sure looks like it these days. These days, old days, any days. We're just hearing more about it now. That's the only difference. But there are limits, Phil. I mean, like what you offered Van Haas. Well, let's face it, you were talking about murder. Maybe that's the word that came to his mind, too. But when he thinks it over, he'll give it a different name. He'll come to the conclusion that all I was talking about was pushing a button. You mean you still think he'll say yes? I told him to call me here. That's why I took this suite at the hotel under the name of Thompson. So that's what it was. And I figured, I don't know, that you had some chick you didn't want to know your right name. I told Van Haas to call me here any time before midnight, in case he changed his mind. Before midnight? It's almost 11 o'clock now. That's right. Well, why did you give him a deadline? Because he needs one. We all need one, or we postpone things forever. Phil, I don't think he'll call. Why not? I think the guy's already made up his mind. Oh, no, he hasn't. He's watching the clock right now, just as we are. He's watching those hands move towards 12, thinking about how simple it would be to pick up the phone and call. <laughs> you see, that's the beauty part of the whole thing. The simplicity. <laughs> you remember that old camera slogan, you press the button, we do the rest? No, I don't think you're right. I don't think he'll do it. I can see him right this minute, Lou. Maybe he's in bed. Looking up at the ceiling. Maybe he's locked himself up in the study and he's telling himself all the reasons why he shouldn't say yes. Then he wonders if he's really fair to make the decision all by himself. I mean, I mean, there's his wife, too. He remembers all the little deprivations, all the promises he made to her when they were younger, those trips to Europe, the mink coat. And then there are the kids, of course. Five kids, Lou. Think what that money would mean to them. <laughs> he's really moved by the thought of the kids. You know, uh... Maybe I'll have a drink after all. He's not thinking of himself, of course. No, he doesn't count. The things he would like to do, the places he wants to see, or, or that car he wants to own. You ever know a man who didn't want some car he couldn't afford? Yeah. And then there's that nice, smug feeling of security he could have with that pile of money swelling with interest in some bank that never thought he was worth more than a calendar at Christmas. Well, maybe he is thinking all that, Phil, but just the same... I don't think he'll call. Walter, are you still awake? Yep. Do you feel all right? Yeah, I'm okay. You're not still thinking about it, are you? About what? About, you know, the baby. Oh, yeah. No, Millie, I... I wasn't thinking about the baby. Go back to sleep, honey. But, you know, I'm less than two months gone, honey. I, if, if you're really upset well, about... Stop that kind of talk. Well, I just thought... Well, that our alternative... I'm sick of hearing about that alternative. I heard about it the last time you were pregnant, remember? I'm sorry. I... I knew you were about money... I know all the debts we have. We'll get along. Honey, you're not angry with me. No, I'm not angry. I'm just restless. I've got business worries. Can't turn my mind off. Oh, why don't you read a while? The light will keep you awake. Well, I'll go to the living room. Walter? Yep. I love you. I love you too, Millie. Listen to that clock. Why do cheap clocks have to tick so loud? Yeah, you know, we've got to get ourselves an electric one, maybe one of those digital clocks. Darling, they cost money. Yes. What doesn't? Hello? Oh, yeah, yeah, I ordered the scotch. Oh, you can, huh? All right, thanks. 
Sorry, Lou. Room service can't deliver from the bar after 11.30. That's okay, Phil. I don't really want to drink anyway. I'm almost out of liquor myself. You're almost out of time, too. Quarter to 12. See, I just can't believe it. I can't believe that guy could be that... that stupid. Is that what you call it? Of course. I mean, who wouldn't jump at a chance like this? Lou, I'm making it so... so easy for him. So painless. Easier than scratching along on a paycheck shot through with deductions. Easier than, than bowing and scraping every day of your life to people whose guts he hates. You know old man Brewster. Can you imagine having to be nice to that guy every day? We did it. Yes. That's why I know. Ah, oh, Phil. I think you're taking this joke much too much to heart. You're letting it mean too much to you. There's still time left for him to call. But he won't. And he's probably getting panicky right now. What about you, Phil? He sees the whole thing slipping away from him. He's telling himself how dumb he is. He's telling himself that the Chinaman doesn't mean a thing to Dutchman. him. Dutchman. He's telling himself that he's got a bigger duty, a, a greater responsibility to his wife, to his kids, even to himself. Well, to forget it, it's over. No concern of his what happened 7,000 miles away. He doesn't have to dirty his hands. All he has to do is, is call. You're lost, Phil. Why don't you admit it? Aren't you going to answer it? Sure, sure. I'll answer it. Maybe room service again. Maybe. Hello? Mr. Thompson? This is Walter Von Haas. Okay, okay, I'm coming, I'm coming. Who is it? Room service. Ah, breakfast. Come on in, I'm starving. Yes, sir. Are you sure those scrambled eggs are hot? They tasted like rubber yesterday morning. They should be all right, sir. Yeah, well, you tell the chef he'll hear from me if they aren't. Yes, sir. Will you sign right here, sir? Okay. There they are. Thank you. I'll be back later for the table. Uh, half an hour, that's all I need. Yes, sir. Uh, I guess my shower's going to have to wait. Oh, now what? Hello. Phil, it's low. Oh, hi, what's up? How come you're still at the hotel? I thought you're just going to stay there one or two days. It's the third day now. I like it here. May stay until the end of the week. Besides, I saw some great-looking chicks at the bar downstairs. Well, what's happening? Nothing. I was just wondering if you knew anything about, uh... What do you know, Van Haas? <laughs> Walter Van Haas? He's just waiting for the mailman, Lou. Waiting to hear the good news from South Africa. <laughs> well, I spoke to Charlie Edwards... Says Van Haas called in sick yesterday. Yeah, I bet he was sick. I bet he was home planning on ways to spend all that money he thinks he's going to get. One million bucks. Uh, no, <laughs> 500 grand. Are you coming into the office soon, Phil? Sure, I'll be there just as soon as I finish breakfast and grab a shower. I'll see you later then. All right. Yeah, I bet those eggs are cold for sure. Oh, for Pete's sake, it's a conspiracy. Hello, Mr. Thompson. Well, what are you doing here? May I come in? I told you not to get in touch with me, Van Haas. Yes, I know you did, but I... I had to talk to you in person. I told you that it was for your own protection. Don't worry. I found out your room number, and I came up the back stairs. Nobody knows I'm here. Well, why are you here? Please let me come in. Uh, all right. As you can see, I'm just about to take a shower, so whatever I have to say, would you make it fast? Yes, I'll make it fast. Uh, I hope you haven't come here to say that you changed your mind, because it's too late for that. The thing is over and done with. It is? You're sure of that? Well, as soon as you gave me your okay, I was in touch with our agents in Johannesburg. They didn't waste any time either. And it, it, it went, uh, all right? Flawlessly, just as I promised. Now, all you have to do is wait. Yes, I see. I, uh, I just had to hear it from you, Mr. Thompson. I, I had to hear it from myself. Well, now you've heard it. Now you go home and you wait for the mailman. Yes. The mailman. What's the matter, Van Hask? You look strange. You feel all right? Oh, yes, I feel fine. Truth is, I... I never felt better in my life. Good. Good. I'm glad to hear it. I feel a lot different than I felt two days ago. I can't tell you what a torture it was for me to make that phone call to you. Absolute torture. But after I hung up, I felt as light as a feather. You did, huh? Yeah. I felt fine. I felt wonderful. Even though I got myself involved, 
in killing a man. It's funny, isn't it? Huh. It was easy, wasn't it? Just like I said it would be. Yes, that's the word. I never knew anything could be that easy. Changed me, Mr. Thompson. I saw how stupid I'd been all my life, how stupid most of us are, to waste the one life we're given. I owe you a lot. Well, if you came to say thanks, you're welcome. Now, if you'll excuse me... I felt me, uh... like a giant. I felt, I felt there was nothing I couldn't do. I, I was a coward before, a weakling. But you showed me a better way. Okay, okay. Uh, would you go home now, Mr. Van Haas? I mean, the less we see of each other, the better. Now, when the money arrives, I'll be in touch with you. About my 50%. Yes, your 50%. That's really what I wanted to discuss, Mr. Thompson. Tell me, does this fireplace work, or is it just for show? I really wouldn't know. But I see that they have all the implements. <laughs> what are you doing with that poker? Van Haas... Are you crazy? Hi, Mr. Thompson, but 100% is so much better. I thought I'd have to bring a hammer or something, but a poker was so much better. Now, into the bathroom, Mr. Thompson. Up, up, into the shower. Yeah. What a shame that you slipped in the tub, Mr. Thompson. What a terrible shame. Now I have to go home to wait for the mailman. There's an old saying. If you're going to dig a grave for a man, make sure you dig two. I'll return shortly. Constructive statement? It goes like this. The wonderful thing about radio is that it can be enjoyed in complete darkness. And isn't darkness the natural medium for mystery? Our cast included Paul Hecht, Ralph Bell, Mason Adams, Evie Juster, and Will Hare. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated. Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense. Welcome to the fear you can hear. But mostly to the world of terrifying imagination. In the next 52 minutes, you'll hear a story about truth. Everyone is in favor of truth, of course. It's a word which produces immediate reverence and respect. But sometimes the truth can be a terrible thing, even a shattering thing. Oh, my God! Mark, you hit a woman! I told you that that's so fast! I didn't see her. I didn't, I didn't see her crossing the road. Is she alive? Oh, Mark, look at the way she's lying there. Lona, oh, she must Lord. be dead. Oh. Lona, you mustn't tell anyone. Please, you mustn't tell anyone. Our mystery drama, The Ring of Truth, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slusser and stars Agnes Moorhead. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Now, 
Now, here's Act One of The Ring of Truth. The place? A charming college town in New England. The people you're about to meet? Young Lorna Kittredge? And the special man in her life, Mark Kramer. His driving speed? A comfortable 30 miles an hour. I'll tell you what I resent most about your father, Lorna. It's the fact that he deliberately keeps forgetting my name. Ah, don't be so silly. Daddy has a genuine problem about names. No, no, I'm sorry, darling. I just can't buy this absent-minded professor stuff. It's too corny. Corny or not, that's exactly what my father is sometimes. Absent-minded. His mind is always up in the stratosphere somewhere. Communing with Socrates or Schopenhauer on the meaning of truth. <laughs> you, you just don't like my father very much. What? I hardly know your father. Look, I want to get along with him, Lorna. After all, he's going to be my father-in-law, isn't he? You're almost home. What can I do to put you in a better mood? That's easy, darling. You can promise to tell him tonight. Oh, Mark. Tonight? Why not? But I told you that the prize are going to be at dinner tonight. How prize Daddy's publisher. So? After they leave, you can tell him. Lorna, we've been engaged for almost three weeks now. Nobody knows about it except you and me. Well, isn't that enough? Not for me, it is. No. I'm the kind of guy who wants to shout it from the housetops. Yes, I do, too. I really do, Mark. I love you so much. All right, darling. Then prove it. Tell him tonight, Lorna. Tell him you're going to marry what's-his-name. Oh, you think I'm hard? You're quite right, Harold. What the book needs is a much sexier title. Well, of course, there isn't a word about sex in it, but what's the difference as long as it sells? Huh? What's the latest <laughs> book about? Why, truth, of course. Daddy's favorite subject. Should be everyone's favorite subject, in my opinion. You know, if you really want a suggestion for a new title, Professor, I think I have one. Do you, Max? Daddy, the name is Mark. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I, I'm sorry, Mark. Well, uh, go on, let's hear your suggestion. Why not call it The Ring of Truth? Well, I think that's a very good name, but, uh, of course, that's up to Professor Kittredge. It's uh, not a bad title, Mark, but, uh, well, it does imply a lack of sincerity, doesn't it? The ring of truth is only the surface appearance of it. What I'm examining in my book is the necessity for stark truth, for truth I'm afraid. Of course, there's a fairly good argument against stark truth sometimes, isn't there? I mean, there's still a necessity for a white lie now and then. Yeah, you mean in the real estate business perhaps? No, no, not just in my business, in everyone's. I mean, there are times when tact and courtesy and general goodwill call for a shading of the truth. Uh, uh, may I make a suggestion, everyone? Why don't we have our coffee in the living room? It's a good idea, darling. You know, George, I want to... Uh, I'll give you a hand with the dishes, honey. Besides, I'd like a little conversation with you in the kitchen. All right, Mark. I know what you're going to say. Daddy was impossible tonight. Now, your father's a great scholar, man of ideals, the Albert Schweitzer of New England. I'm only a poor schnook of a real estate man, oh, no. but I'm perfectly willing to put up with him for your sake. Put up with him? Won't be easy. A crass, materialistic guy like me marrying into all that saintliness? <laughs> what can I do? I'm crazy about his daughter. You idiot. <laughs> oh, Mark, my hands are wet. Will you tell him tonight? Yes, the minute everyone leaves. He's not going to be happy about it, you know that. He won't be happy about losing you. Well, he knew it had to happen someday. All right, then tell him that day has come. Tell him the truth. I always tell Daddy the truth. <laughs> Can I come in? Uh, yes, darling, of course. I didn't want to interrupt your reading. No, I can't really read this book. I don't understand the language. Have you seen it, by the way? Hmm? Still another edition, German, of the Seven Secrets of Shakespeare. Oh, it's lovely. What a beautiful binding. Yes, I'm pleased with it. I suppose an author never loses his affection for the first book he writes. Well, it's more than just that. This book made you famous. <laughs> In very limited circles, yes. And I hope you've enjoyed the evening and that you friend it too. The only thing Mark didn't like was being called Max. Oh, I'm sorry about that, Precious. I hope he wasn't offended. But you have to admit that you do bring home a lot of young men. Daddy, that may have been true once. But Mark Kramer is the only man I've seen for the last six months. Hello? And the reason I've seen him so much is that... 
I'm in love with him. Well, that isn't an entirely new phenomenon either, is it? Daddy, Mark asked me to marry him. I said yes. Marriage? You know that word, don't you? It's English, not German. Yes, I know the word, but... Uh... Well, it's just that I never supposed you'd want to marry now. I mean, before your doctor, before you've done all those things we planned to do together. Marriage wouldn't put an end to our plans. As for your lecture tour, but you don't really need me along. I don't know if I'd want to go without you. I'm getting a little old to gallivant around Europe by myself. It's the first time I've heard you complain about being old. Uh, for some reason, the last ten seconds, I began to feel old. Of course, Mark and I could go with you to Europe as a sort of honeymoon. Uh, no, Lorna, he's not going to want that, I'm sure. In fact, my guess is that your young man is going to want to see as little of me as he possibly can. No, Daddy, that isn't so. He knows that I won't just abandon you. I couldn't be that heartless. That's the last word I'd use about you, precious. I know your heart only too well. I know what a tender, beating little thing it is. I've always been afraid of the man who would trap it someday. I just wish you knew Mark better. He's not a I'm star. not saying anything against Mark. I'd feel this way about any man. I'm like the tired old king of the fairy tale, darling. Forced by the condition of kingdom to give the hand of his princess to a commoner. Oh, Daddy. Daddy. <laughs> Mark, you're just being pig-headed. It won't even be six months. And by that time, I'll have my doctorate and Daddy's lecture tour will be over. Oh, that's great. Yes, just great. Waiter, where's the drink I ordered? Mark, I've never seen you have more than two martinis in my life. Oh, you're wrong, my love. I had one before you got here. The one coming up will be number four. Mark, please, don't be so upset. I'm not breaking our engagement. I'm simply asking for a postponement. How long did he take to talk you into it, Lorna? Well, it was something I decided to do, Mark. All by myself. Because you realize how important it was? To get your PhD? To make sure Daddy was taken care of on his lecture tour? But it is important to me. You know, you're a lucky girl to have a father like that. Now, you take my old man. Good old Charlie Kramer. Real estate. <laughs> I don't think he ever heard of an ethic or an ideal in his life. Probably told a dozen lies a day, old Charlie. I guess that's why he turned out so badly. You're drinking too much. You always do when you're angry. Just another flaw in my character. Hardly noticeable in the general ruin of my personality. Please, Mark, I don't want you to be drunk to drive me home. Oh, don't worry, I won't even have that fourth drink. See what a nice guy I am? I want to make sure you get home to Daddy safe and sound. <laughs> Mark, are you sure you don't want me to drive? No, you just leave the driving to us. It's starting to rain. I think you should turn your wipers on. That isn't rain, precious. Those are tears in front of your eyes. Please, Mark. All right, all right. You have to drive so fast. I know there isn't any traffic, but these roads are so dark. That's what the headlights are for. How far these little candles throw their beams so <sighs> shines a good deed in a naughty world. Hey, you see, your father isn't the only one who can quote you. Ah! What? Look out! That woman! Where? Oh! You hit her! Oh, Lord! I didn't see her. Oh. I didn't see her crossing the road, so help me. Is she dead? Oh, Lord, look at the way she's lying there. She's dead, Lorna. Oh. The woman's dead. Oh, no. Well, horrible. I told you not to drive so fast. <laughs> so awful. And it was my fault. My fault that Mark drank so much. He really doesn't like whiskey very much, but when I told him about what we decided about postponing the wedding... You mean what you decided, uh, darling? It was your decision. He was driving so recklessly. He must have been going 60 miles an hour on that road. The speed limit there was only about 30. You haven't arrested him, have they? No. But the police were called, weren't they? Yes, yes. They know Mark, of course. He's lived here all his life. 
Didn't they give Mark a sobriety test? No. Nobody even suggested it. I mean, Mark didn't seem to be drunk at all. Not after it. And of course, he didn't say he'd been drinking. He didn't mention the speed he was traveling at. Well, they asked him. Mark said he was going 35, and the woman just stepped out in front of him. I see. He had to say it, Daddy. I mean, otherwise it would have been a crime, wouldn't it? I think it's called vehicular homicide. Well, he could go to prison for that, couldn't he? Perhaps. Oh, Daddy. Donna, what did you say? What? What did you tell them when the police talked to you about the accident? Oh, they didn't. They didn't ask me anything. They said there would be an inquest to determine the facts. I suppose I'd have to answer questions then. And what will you say then? Oh, I... I, I don't know. I mean, I, I have to corroborate Mark's story, of course. Is that what you're going to do? Oh, well, if you could have seen his face, Daddy, he was like a child. Like a little boy, afraid to be punished. He said, you stand by me, Lorna, won't you? And so you're going to stand by him. You're going to forget all you ever learned about truth. You're going to lie. But, Daddy, what else can I do? I can't advise you, my darling. All I can do is remind you that you and I have always loved truth as much as we've loved each other. Are you going to change now? And so Lorna finds herself in the corner of a triangle. The man she loves on one side, the father she loves on the other. But the invisible corner of the triangle is that mysterious thing called truth. We'll find out what Lorna Kittredge does when I return shortly with Act Two. shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Will that familiar saying work in the case of Mark Kramer? It may all depend on the outcome of the next conversation you hear in the home of Professor John Kitteridge and his daughter. Lorna, may I come in? Yes, Daddy. Huh. All dressed already? Yes. I know I don't have to leave for the county courthouse for another hour, but I I was too nervous to just lie in bed. Why don't you come downstairs and have some breakfast with no. me? No, I couldn't. I, I feel too sick. My no, poor kitty. <laughs> you know, I haven't called you that since you were a little child. Or don't you remember me calling you that? No, not really. You see, before you were born, I wanted to name you Catherine. But your mother objected because she was certain you'd be nicknamed Kitty. Then you'd be Kitty Kitteridge. And she hated the sound of it. You've told me the story before. I know you're not in the mood for old family anecdotes. All I can think about is that inquest this morning. I'm so frightened. My skin feels like ice. Darling, you won't have to be frightened if you do what I said. It's only lying that makes us afraid. Please, please don't talk about it. I have to lie for Mark. I love him. I'm going to marry him. Do you think the others will lie? The bartender at that restaurant? What was that? What was the name of that again? Bruno's. Yes. He'll defend Mark. I'm sure he will. They don't like trouble. They had some license problem last year. They won't want to admit that they served Mark so many drinks, that he was hardly able to walk, to say nothing of drive. I'm sure. So you're the only one who has to lie. Daddy, the woman is dead. Nothing will bring her back. Lies, truth, nothing. Who does it help if Mark goes to prison? Yes. You're right, precious. There's no profit in truth. None at all. Then you agree with me. No profit, Lorna. Only loss, maybe. But that's something you'll have to judge for yourself. You know my feeling about truth. You know what I've always taught you about it. Yes. Dare to be true. Nothing can need a lie. The fault which needs it most grows too thereby. You used to like that poem. Now you're quoting it with contempt. Oh, Daddy. I can't 
you understand? Why do you have to be so demanding? Let me forget truth just this once. Your mind is your own, Lorna. Well, I want to do what's right. And do what you want to do. You're an adult now, independent of me. Lie if you want to. But don't look for my approval. And above all, don't ask for my blessing. Daddy! Let's have some quiet. The coroner's jury has to hear the testimony if they're going to judge it. Sergeant McKeon, was any investigation made of the skid marks at the scene of the accident with a view to determining the speed of the vehicle? I know, sir, there wasn't. The uh, condition of the road and the rain we had that night, well, it was uh, impossible to tell the difference between the skid marks and the tire treads. Uh, that's why no measurement was made. It's uh, been stated that the driver of the vehicle, Mark Kramer, had left the establishment called Bruno's shortly before the accident. Since Bruno's is in the business of serving hard liquor, among other things, did the uh, police give Mr. Kramer a sobriety test? Uh, no, sir, we didn't. You see, sir, we didn't know at the time where Mr. Kramer had been. All we knew was that Mrs. Moga was dead and Mr. Kramer didn't appear like he'd been drinking. All right, Sergeant, you can step down. Thank you, sir. The uh, coroner's office calls Mr. Kramer to the stand, please. <laughs> Mr. Kramer, this inquest isn't a trial. Our duty here is simply to determine the cause of death. But you must give your testimony under oath. Uh, please raise your hand on the Bible. Yes, sir. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. All right, Mr. Kramer. Just tell us your story of what happened the night of the accident. Well, Miss Kittredge and I left Bruno's about nine that evening, about a half hour before the accident. I had one drink, a vodka martini. You can ask Mr. Bruno about that because he served me. Go on. When I reached Route 24, I decided to take the Ridge Road shortcut to town. I was traveling between 30 and 35 miles an hour, I'd say, and I remember slowing down when the rain started. I had my wipers going when I came over the rise of the hill, so my windshield was clear. But I still didn't see Mrs. Moger when she stepped out into the road directly in front of the car. Were your lights on full beam? Yes, sir, they were. Why do you suppose Mrs. Moger didn't see them? I don't really know. What I think is... She was almost across the road when I came over the rise, and and she panicked when she realized that a car was coming. She started back in the wrong direction, and that was when she stepped in front of a car. Is that your entire testimony? Yes, sir, it is. Very well, Mr. Kramer. You can return to your seat. Will Miss Lorna Kittredge take the chair, please? Yes, I know. Place your hand on the Bible, Miss Kittredge. Yes. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? Yes, I do. Please speak up, Miss Kittredge. I do. Miss Kittredge, you were with Mr. Kramer on the night of the accident. Yes. You went with him to the place called Bruno's. Yes, I did. And did you have a drink that night? Yes, I had a martini. The same as Mr. Kramer? Yes. When Mr. Kramer's car approached Mrs. Moga's driveway, did you see the lady before the automobile struck her? I'm not sure. I, I think I saw her for just a split second. And then the car hit her. It was all terribly unreal. Were you aware of the speed you were traveling at? Miss Kittredge? I'm not sure of the exact speed. Mr. Kramer thinks it was between 30 and 35. Do you agree with that? No. What was that? It couldn't have been that. It was more like 55 or 60. Did you say 60, Miss Kittredge? About that, yes. Lorna, for God's sake. I hope you've considered this reply, Miss Kittredge. Yes, I've considered it. We were traveling at least that. I'd been looking at the speedometer only a few minutes before. I was complaining to Mark about his speed, but he wouldn't listen to me. He 
Wasn't in any mood to listen. He was angry and he was drunk. Please, everybody, quiet now. Mr. Kramer, please take your seat. It's the truth. The truth, I, I can't help myself. He was drinking. He had too many martinis and he was drunk. Are you telling us he had more than one drink? He had four. I know he did. And he drove like a madman. No matter how I tried to stop him, he never thought that woman would be on the road at that time of night. <laughs> he wouldn't listen. <laughs> believe it was really happening. It was like hearing someone else say the words. Please don't cry, Kitty. I, I tried not to look at his face. I tried so hard not to see him, but I, I couldn't stop myself. How can you blame yourself for telling the simple truth? How can you think it's wrong? But don't you realize what will happen to him, Daddy? He's going to be indicted. He may go to prison. I'm sure Mr. Kramer will hire himself a very smart attorney. <sighs> Who's that? I have no idea. <laughs> see anyone now. I just can't. Yes, of course. Uh, you go to your room and I'll answer it. Uh, go on, darling. Go lie down. Yes. Oh. It's you. I want to see Lorna. Mark, please listen to me. I know exactly how you're feeling at the Thanks moment. Thanks for remembering my name, Professor. That must be the very first time. I'm sure you realize that what Lorna did this morning was extremely difficult and painful for her. That it was an agonizing decision. Only who made it? Lorna's lying down right now. I suggest you try telephoning her later. I'm not leaving until I see her. I... I had hoped we wouldn't get violent about all this, Mark. Frankly, I don't think you're in a good position to commit any other rash actions. Daddy, it's all right. Lorna, I, I thought you were in your I'll room. I'll talk to Mark. Very well. But don't ask me to leave because I won't. You don't have to leave, Professor. I'd like you to know this, too. No what? What the town gossips are saying. Lorna, they're saying that we had some kind of fight. A lover's quarrel and that you wanted to get back at me. Oh, you know that's not so. Yes, I know it. But the other explanation makes even less sense. That you just had to tell the truth. Well, it wasn't easy for me. Lies would have been easier. One small lie, Lorna. That was all you had to say. You're so afraid of hell that you wouldn't lie for me? I can't expect you to understand. But I do understand. Better than you do, maybe. It was your father's idea. Oh, just a moment, Kramer. Well... You remember my last name, too. I think I made more of an impression on you than you were willing to admit. There's no need to be nasty. Lorna, you're so stuck on the truth. Tell it now. He told you what to do in that courtroom. Professor Kittredge's little girl always listens to Daddy, and she never lies. Please, Mark. He insisted that you tell the truth, didn't he? He gave you a lot of high-flown ethical reasons for telling the truth. Nothing but the truth. Every reason but the real one. You're wrong. I made up my own mind. Your father knew what would happen. It would split us apart, and that's what he really wanted, Lorna. That's the truth that he didn't mention. I think that's quite enough. If you don't leave right now, I'm calling the police. Don't bother, Professor. You've done a very good job on Lorna and on me. Oh. Oh, Daddy. Daddy. Daddy, don't. It's going to be all right. How can it be? He hates me now. Mark hates me. Things will change. You wait and see. He'll get himself a smart lawyer and... Nothing will happen to him. Mark Kramer, having been found guilty of the crime of manslaughter, it is my duty to sentence you to imprisonment for a period of not less than one year and not more than five. And so the truth has not set Mark Kramer free. It sent him to prison where he'll have plenty of time to ponder the complexities of ethics, justice, and human nature. Or perhaps he'll ponder something else, like revenge. We'll find out when I return shortly with Act Three. It's now one year later. Sad to say, Mark Kramer is still wearing prison gray. As for Professor Kitteridge, he's had problems too. A bad case of the gout caused cancellation of his European lecture tour. 
even more disappointing, his daughter Lorna lost interest in working on her thesis and abandoned the idea of obtaining her doctorate. In fact, Lorna Kitteridge seems to have lost interest in life itself. Lorna? You awake? Yes, Daddy. I'm up. Darling, it's almost noon. It's not like you to be in bed so late. Uh, I just didn't feel like getting up. Did you sleep badly again last night? Last night, the night before. The night before that. Oh, Lorna. If you don't see Dr. Isaacs voluntarily, I may have to drag you to his office. You know there's nothing wrong with me. What's all this paper for? All those little crumpled balls. Can't you guess? Oh, Lorna, no. You haven't been writing Mark again. I keep thinking that I might hit on exactly the right words. The magic formula that would make him answer one letter. Just one letter. You know that's not possible, darling. Face it, the man is filled with bitterness. He blames you for something he did to himself. He probably never reads any of the letters I send him. Probably sees my handwriting and... Tears him up immediately. It would be so much better if you forgot him, Lorna. Do you know that I even thought of sending him a disguise letter? Making it look like some important document that he would have to read? Isn't that ridiculous? What's ridiculous is the way you've tortured yourself over that man for so many months. Who's tortured who, Daddy? Which one of us is really guilty? Oh, kitty, kitty. Stop calling me that name. My name is Lorna. Can't you remember my name? Darling, you're just not yourself. Oh, is that why you can't remember me? Because I'm somebody else? Well, you... You may be right, Daddy. Every morning I look in the mirror and I can't recognize the woman I see. Lonnie, you're just not giving yourself a chance to forget. You'd start getting out into the world, start meeting new people. You'd become a hermit. I thought you liked having me here, Daddy. I thought you couldn't live without my company. I honestly believe you need medical attention. If not from Dr. Isaacs, then from somebody else. You mean a psychiatrist, I suppose. No, darling, no. Just someone who can help you get over this. Distorted guilt that you feel. The only one who can do that is Mark. And he won't see me or write me or anything. Lorna. Oh, please go away. Please. I'm going to try to sleep. It's the only time I'm happy. When I'm asleep. All right. Step right over here, Kramer. Anything you say, guard. Remember, visiting time is limited to 15 minutes. Look, I don't want the 15 minutes. They're being forced on me. Sit down and behave yourself. Yes, sir. Anything you say, sir. Well, no, Mark. Make it fast, Professor. I've got important matters to take care of back in the shop. I'm making a very special license plate. Mark, I know you resent the fact that I've forced this encounter. Took some doing, believe me. Uh Uh-huh. Why did you go to all the trouble? Because it's a matter of health. Lorna's health. She's pining away for me, is that it? Well, tell her to stop, Professor. My nights are filled with sweet dreams, and she is in none of them. You tell her that for me. I want you to see her, Mark. Oh, I wouldn't force that issue, Professor. I don't have anything nice to say to your daughter. You misunderstood, Lorna. Couldn't expect you to applaud what she didn't court. But if you really thought about the ideals that motivated her... Whose ideals? Yours or hers? Do I have to separate them? Yes. But you can't, Professor. Because she's your monster. You've got her all twisted up between her ethics and her instincts. I suppose you're proud of the result, but it's a fake. There's nothing... There's nothing fake about her principles. She doesn't have principles. All she has is you. Her shining example. She wants you to love and admire her, so she does what you expect. That's why Daddy's little girl always tells the truth. She does tell the truth. Always. And her father? I abominate lies. You won't even lie to yourself. Then tell me this. Weren't you happy when Lorna and I broke up? Didn't it save your happy home? I can see that coming here was a mistake. You're a hypocrite, Professor. This whole thing was your doing, and I'll never let you forget it. Goodbye, Mark. Wait a minute. There's something you should know. What's that? 
I'm being paroled next week. Tell that to your daughter. Maybe it'll improve her health. Of course I'm pleased, Harold. It's just that I'd much rather see a new book of mine published than a new edition of an old book. Well, you can't argue with success. People never seem to tire of the seven secrets of Shakespeare. I suppose I shouldn't complain. Does buy the groceries. <laughs> Just cash the royalty checks and be happy. Hmm? Now, uh, tell me how Lorna's doing. Feeling any better? Oh, still a bit run down, I guess. Yeah, well, that's too bad. I, um... I suppose you know that young man, Kramer, that he's out of prison. For about two months now, I gather. He, uh, hasn't been in touch with Lorna? No, and I don't think he will be. Funny thing is, he's been in touch with us. With you? What's that before? Well, actually, it seems he went to Merritt Bob's first. My first publishers? Yes, talked to everyone who would talk to him. Then he approached members of my own staff. He even tried to get an appointment with me. But I put him off. What do you suppose he wants? He's an embittered young man, you know. And I spoke to George Merritt. He didn't know about, uh, or about Lorna and this fellow Kramer. He thought Kramer was an article writer looking for biographical material. George said that he seemed to know an awful lot about you already. Mm, I, uh, I don't much like the idea of someone like that snooping into my life. Why, why do you suppose he's doing it? Hard to say. Ranker, I suppose. Hopes he can find something unpleasant in my past. I'll get it, Lorna. Hello? Professor Kittredge? Yes? Mark Kramer, Professor. Oh. Uh, yes, I, uh, I was just speaking about you the other day with my publisher. I'd like to see you, Professor, this evening, if that's possible. See me? Or Lorna? No, just you. If Lorna wants to be there, that's her business. Something tells me she'd rather stay away. Can you give me some idea of why you want to see me? You might say it's a business matter. Who is it, Daddy? What time would be good for you, Professor? Uh, make it, uh, about nine. I'll make it exactly nine. Daddy, you look so strange. Who was that on the phone? It was Mark Kramer, Lorna. Mark? He's asked me to see him at nine tonight. I have no idea what he wants to say, but whatever it is, I'm sure it won't be anything pleasant. I'd rather not be here. I didn't think you would. Mark blames me for what happened in court, not you. He refuses to admit that it was your own love of truth. My love of truth? <laughs> Daddy, you never understood me yourself. How could you explain me to someone else? I didn't love truth. I loved Mark. You did what you had to do. What your conscience told you to do. My conscience? Is that what I was satisfying? That small little voice inside it me? It can be a loud voice, darling. A very compelling but voice. But I still hear it. It's still talking to me. And you know what it's saying? You fool. You fool, you fool. Lorna. I think I'll go out now, Daddy. Right now. Good evening, Professor. Hello, Mark. Come in. Thank you. Nice of you to see me. I wasn't sure of my reception after the last time. So you're using a cane these days, Professor? Yes, a touch of gout. Mark, I hope you weren't expecting to see Lorna. She's not here. No, I didn't expect to see her. Would, uh, would you care to come to the point of this visit? Yes, Professor. I'll come to the point. I've come to see you about truth. Oh, must we, Mark? Really? I mean, these philosophical discussions are meat and drink to old campus fogies like me, but I'm rather tired of the subject right now, very tired of it. Frankly, I'm a little exhausted by it myself. I've just spent two months in search of it, and I didn't even know what I was looking for. You've been digging up things about me, haven't you? I hope you enjoyed yourself. 
No, I didn't. You see, I made the mistake of talking to your enemies. The publishers you dropped, the friends you no longer see, the scholars you had disputes with. What did you get out of that? Nothing. Your enemies didn't have the truth about you, Professor. Only your friends did. Like Avery Hayes. Avery Hayes? Oh, I'm glad to see you remember the name. Strange how few people do. Even though you dedicated your fourth or, or was it your fifth book to him? George Merritt knew him, of course. Mr. Merritt called you Avery's benefactor. Said that Hayes was an alcoholic that you took care of for many years. He was my friend. Yes, he was a good friend. And you were good to him. That was one chapter of your past that you had every reason to be proud of, wasn't it? Avery's been dead for ten years. What did you want from him? Nothing, Professor. I just thought a man like that deserved a little recognition, if only for his past association with you. So I talked to people who knew him. His old pals, his family... He still has a brother alive, you know, a crotchety old fellow in the terminal ward at the county hospital. His name's Ezra. Perfect name for the old boy. And you know what? He still has the junk Hayes left when he died. That pitiful collection of books and papers. You don't expect me to believe that? About Avery's papers? Avery never kept anything, not a thing. He was a foolish, drunken old... He was also brilliant, wasn't he? Went to the university on a scholarship. You only beat him out for top honors because of his drinking. You're talking about 40 years ago. He was drunk and he was dishonest too, wasn't he, Professor? That was how he sustained that wild life of his, by selling his scholastic services to anybody who could pay for it's them. It's not different today. Yes. That's what Avery said in his letter. The one he wrote to a woman named Jean. I didn't know who Jean was or why Avery never mailed the letter, but there it was. Avery said he was cleaning up a hundred, two hundred dollars a month and would surely be able to pay back all he owed before the end of the semester. And then he mentioned the thesis. The big job he was doing that he expected 300 for that job alone. You know which thesis I mean, Professor? Please go. Get out of here. I've had enough of this lying filth. The Seven Secrets of Shakespeare. Sounds like a mystery story, doesn't it? But it was quite a piece of work. And it became more than just a college thesis. It became a world-famous book. It made your reputation, Professor. You're a liar. A liar. You know nothing about it. You paid Avery for his work and put your name on it. You might have done as well yourself, but you were young and lazy and you had the money to pay for it. Then you discovered how good it really was and it was too late for both of you to change the course of history. Get out of this house now. Get out. I'm going, Professor. I just wanted you to hear this little story about truth. And also to tell you that I have Avery Hayes' letter. What did you say? I have his letter, Professor. It tells the whole story. Good night. Brock! Told me to go, and I'm going. You filthy animal! Oh, get rich! Tell you, monster! I'll fire! Kill you! Kill you, you animal! Kill you! Like a wild, wild beast! Oh my God! What have you done? Oh no! Oh no! Oh, thank heaven you're here! Thank heaven! Look at his head, oh dear Lord! You saw what happened. What the crazy fool did, he, he attacked me. You killed him with your pain. He attacked me, Lorna. You know how much he hated me? I had to defend no, myself. No, I saw what happened. I saw you strike him from behind. No, Kitty, no. He tried to kill me. That's why I oh, hit him. Daddy, I saw everything. You killed Mark. You did it deliberately. And that's the truth. You always taught me to tell the truth. It's the only important thing. The truth. Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. said, All I mean by truth is the road I can't help traveling. Well, Professor Kitteridge traveled his road, and despite his good intentions, it turned out to be the road to hell. I'll be back shortly. If there is a moral to the story you just heard, it's not that truth is so bad. But Samuel Butler said, truth should not be absolutely lost sight of, but it should not be talked about. And we promise... That's our last word on the subject. Our cast included Agnes Moorhead, Mandel Kramer, Santa Sotega, Ian Martin, 
and Dan Ocko. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Mystery Theater was brought to you by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less, and by Suburban Savings, with offices throughout North Jersey. The preceding Mystery Theater program was furnished by the CBS Radio Network.